Chapter 7 I presume you searched the entire area thoroughly, I said, neatly decapitating my boiled egg. But perhaps I ought to have a look round myself. Emerson lowered the piece of toast he had held, poised in mid-air, ever since Ramses began his account of the affair at the Temple of Hathor, as I may term it. Slowly he turned his piercing blue gaze from his son to me. Amelia, he said. More coffee for the Professor Gargery, if you'll be so good. I don't want any damned... He did, however. So he neglected to finish the sentence. Gargery, who had been a fascinated listener, immediately obliged, and Emerson said in the same ominously mild voice, Thank you, Gargery. Ramses, why did you wait until breakfast to tell us about this? We agreed, all of us, that there was no need to wake you. Nefret said, emphasizing the phrase in a manner that made me suspect agreement had not been reached without a certain amount of disagreement. There was nothing you or Mother could have done. We did search as thoroughly as was possible. It wasn't easy, with so many people milling about, and only torches for light, and... and... Uh, I'm sorry, Father. Sorry, Emerson repeated. He rose magisterial as Jove, even without the beard. Is anyone coming with me to the dig, Amelia, or have you made other plans for them? Not for all the world would I venture to interfere with your arrangements. I ask only out of curiosity. Don't you want to discuss the affair, Emerson? No, Amelia, I do not. Fixing me with a horrible scowl, he added, I am motoring to the site. If anyone cares to join me, he or she must come at once. With long measured strides, he left the room. Oh, dear, he's angry, Leah murmured. He'll have got over it by midday, I replied. At least I hoped he would. The fact that he'd addressed me by my given name three times in a row indicated a degree of exasperation beyond his usual norm. However, it might put him in a better humour if some of you went with him this morning. You will not have to risk your lives in the motor car. It seems to have slipped his mind that he and Selim had one of the wheels off last night and did not replace it. Not you, Evelyn, or you, Walter. Do you want me to go with the Professor, Aunt Amelia? David asked. If you don't mind, my dear, just for a few hours. Not at all. He looked at Ramses, who nodded agreement. We meant to have another look round in daylight anyhow. I'm going to, Walter declared squaring his jaw and setting his eyeglasses firmly on the bridge of his nose. I knew the signs. He was suffering from an attack of detective fever. I didn't suppose he would discover anything useful, but he would enjoy himself, puttering around and finding clues the others had already discovered. I got rid of Gargery by asking him to accompany Evelyn and Senia to the castle, and that left me alone, except for Nefret. I'd like to talk to you, Mother, she said. We are, as always, in rapport, my dear. I was about to request a chat with you. We found a secluded spot in the garden between our two houses, where no one could overhear. I was proud of that garden. Though Egypt's climate is salubrious, allowing for the cultivation of both tropical and temperate blooms, it had required a great deal of effort to keep the plants irrigated and fed. Once a barren stretch of ground, it was now shaded by young labach and tamarisk trees. Rose and hibiscus bushes flaunted their colourful blossoms, and beds of nasturtium and other homely flowers were nostalgic reminders of old England. Now, I said, pinching off a dead rose with my nails, tell me everything. Ramsay's narrative was somewhat terse. Of necessity said Nefret, with a faint smile. He knew Father wouldn't let him get more than a few sentences out. From the beginning, I urged, recall, if you please, every sight and sound and your reactions to them. One never knows what seemingly meaningless detail may be seen to be relevant. Her narrative was complete and detailed, though I felt certain she omitted a few things, such as the effect of moonlight and solitude on four young persons. I doubted that any of them had been in a proper state to respond with alacrity to the astonishing events of the evening. Of course, I did not say this, or reproach her for not inviting me to be present. Curse yes, it, I remarked, just when I had everything under control, including Emerson. This new development is unexpected and unwelcome, to say the least, 
Mr. Frett replied wryly. "'But is it really unexpected, Mother? "'You expected something of the sort? "'My dear, I wish you would confide more freely in me. "'I am a firm believer in premonitions. "'They are the workings of the unconscious mind "'which fits together clues. "'Yes, Mother, I agree. "'In this case, though, it was my conscious mind at work. "'Ramsay's escape from the woman in Cairo "'must have disappointed her, "'considering the effort she made to get her hands on him.' Isn't it logical that she would try again? If that was another attempt at abduction, it was very poorly organised, I said critically. She'd have needed a dozen sturdy henchmen to deal with all four of you, not to mention that hysterical boy and his entourage. Lefret's lips parted in a reluctant smile. It was ludicrous, really. Pure melodrama, without a competent stage director. Everyone was rushing round, getting in one another's way. "'tripping over things and shouting. "'Francois and his lot, there were three of them, "'crewmen from the Dehabille, "'tumbled over the wall and joined in the confusion. "'Her smile faded. "'I was too worried about Justin to enjoy the farce, however. "'When I saw him stretched out across that slab, "'white-faced and rigid, his eyes wide open, "'staring up at the moon, I thought he was dead. "'But he wasn't. "'He was alive and fully conscious,' the fret said somewhat sourly. "'Francois wouldn't let me examine him. "'I didn't insist, since the little wretch was as happy as a schoolboy on holiday, "'laughing exultantly and crowing about how the goddess had smiled "'and held out her hands to bless him. "'Did she? Damned if I know. I lost my head,' Nefret admitted. "'I took my bow because... "'Well, because I felt someone ought to be armed with something, just in case. "'You know how Ramses feels about guns.' A firearm would have been excessive. One couldn't have shot the woman in cold blood, Nefret conceded. I'm better with a bow than with a gun, anyhow. And I aimed at her feet, or rather at the ground in front of where I thought her feet must be. Ramsay snatched the bow from me. He had to detach Mariam first. She was hanging on to him and screaming. By the time we reached the temple entrance, she was gone. Ramses and David searched, but she had plenty of time to get away if she knew the plan of the place which she obviously does. I filed this fact away for future consideration. By itself it meant nothing, or rather it might mean a number of different things. Once all the facts were put together, a picture might emerge. I would have to find the time to make one of my little charts, which had proved useful in earlier investigations. I expect we'd better get out to the dig, I said. Emerson's initial reaction to any annoyance is to blame me, but once he cools off, he is the most reasonable of men. Don't worry, my dear. I will get everyone back on track tomorrow, and Ramses will have the chance to work on his texts. You think of everything, Mother? I have let one or two matters slip of late, I admitted handsomely. For one thing, I am concerned about Sethos. I hope he is well enough to travel soon. I want to get Mariam away from that unpredictable boy and his grandmother. But I would rather not beard Mrs. Fitzroy in her lair until Sethos is here. She was most uncooperative when I asked if Mariam could visit us. Perhaps you can catch the old lady in one of her senile moods, Nefret suggested. That would be convenient. Then there is Monsieur Lacour to be dealt with, I continued, as we strolled slowly along the path. The missing jewellery is now a dead issue, in my opinion. It and the thief are probably out of the country, and there is no possibility of recovering it. I will break the news to Lacour myself, when he condescends to turn up, but I see no advantage in inviting him to do so. Nefret nodded in agreement. Her brow was still furrowed, however, so I endeavoured to make her look on the bright side. That leaves only the matter of Mariam to be settled, and we can do nothing until her father comes, which he will in his own good time. I will, of course, turn my analytical talents to bear on the identity of the imitation Hathor. But in my opinion, she is only a red herring, a nuisance, a distraction. What actual harm has she done? Until we know who she is and why she is doing this, we cannot predict what harm she's likely to do. Nefret stopped. Avoiding my eyes, she plucked a bright yellow zinnia and began pulling off its petals. Mother, I can't discuss this with Ramses, but you must have thought of the possibility that she is a past lover? 
Don't be afraid of shocking me, Nefret. I am quite familiar with the word and tolerably familiar with Ramsay's history along those lines. How familiar? She looked up from the poor, mutilated flower. Perhaps suspicious would be more accurate. Naturally, he never admitted anything. All of it took place before you were married. Surely you've no reason to doubt his fidelity. He loves you. Madly? Passionately? Not at all, Nefret murmured, plucking a petal with each word. I don't doubt him, Mother. I only wondered if there was one in particular. But I wouldn't ask you to talk about him behind his back. She tossed the flower away without finishing the little verse. That would not be fair or well-bred, I said. But I will give the matter some thought. She took my arm and we walked on. On the path behind us, the golden petals of the flower shone bright in the sunlight. After Fatima had put the finishing touches on one of her extravagant picnic lunches, Nefret and I rode to Deir el Medina. Upon our arrival, we had to avoid a large group of cooks, tourists, and their morose little donkeys. We did not avoid their attention, however. I heard one of the cursed guides proclaim our identities in a loud voice. Cameras began to click, and one very stout lady shouted, "'Stop for a moment, Mrs. Emerson, so I can get a good picture.' Needless to say, I went on without halting or replying. "'You ought to be used to it by now, Mother,' Nefret said with a chuckle. "'We're among the most popular sites of Luxor.' It was Emerson's fault that we were. As one of our journalistic acquaintances had once observed, he made splendid copy, always shouting and hitting people. He hadn't actually hit anyone lately, but he had made quite a spectacle of himself during our clearance of Cyrus's tomb, waving his fists at tourists and threatening importunate journalists who delightedly wrote down every bad word. I was relieved to observe that none of the tourists had dared come near the area which Emerson had roped off. Within its parameters, the rudiments of a plan had begun to emerge, though only a trained eye like my own could have made sense of the fragmentary walls and occasional column bases. Nefret and I left our horses with the others and approached Emerson, who was standing over Bertie, his hands on his hips, while the boy plotted out the fragments on his drawing paper. "'Coming along nicely, I see.' I observed amiably. This must have been the forecourt of the Seti the First Temple. As a matter of fact, it is the pillared hall of an even older temple, Emerson replied. Where have you been, Peabody? The debris is piling up. I will get to it at once. Well done, Bertie. How neatly you have drawn all those bits and pieces. Thank you, Mum. Bertie pushed his pith helmet back and wiped his perspiring brow. Selim and David have been helping with the measurements, but it's a tricky plan. Where's Ramses? Nefret asked. Over there, Emerson gestured, running a test trench along the north side of the enclosure wall to see if he can find a place that wasn't disturbed by our bloody predecessors digging for artifacts. I don't know which are worse, local thieves or cursed Egyptologists. How can I make sense out of the stratigraphy when they've jumbled everything together? All the more credit to you, my dear, for making sense out of the chaos they have left. Emerson gave me a rather self-conscious look and drew me aside. I apologise, Peabody, he said, squaring his magnificent shoulders. His black hair shone like a raven's wing. This didn't seem the time to ask what he had done with his hat. It is forgotten, Emerson. Oh, really? Are you sure? inquired Emerson, that you haven't filed it away for future reference along with my other sins. My dear, I couldn't possibly keep track of them all. Emerson chuckled, reached for me, glanced at Bertie, and let his arm fall to his side. We gave the place a thorough search, Peabody. The ground had been trampled by bare and shod feet. The only thing we found was a scrap of fabric caught on the enclosure wall on a section where it would be fairly easy to scramble over it. There is debris piled on both sides. He searched his pockets, and after removing pipe, tobacco pouch, scraps of pottery, and a variety of the odd items men carry about with them, produced a strip of white stuff, which he handed to me. Hmm, I said, examining it. Fine linen, with, I do believe, the remains of pleating. 
I will keep this, if I may. Put your pipe away, Emerson, before you drop it. Why do you have a pocket full of nails? I was putting up a sign, Emerson explained, pricking his finger on one of the nails. He sucked it and then went on. A more emphatic sign, warning the cursed tourists off. One of them actually offered me money to pose for a photograph. Kodaking has become another curse of the working archaeologist, I agreed. But I hope you didn't strike him, Emerson. It was a female, said Emerson gloomily. I couldn't even swear at her. Leah had to do it for me, since you weren't here. I decided I had better have a look at the sign. It began, I will kill with my bare hands, and went on in the same vein for several more sentences. While I was inspecting it, Selim, relieved of his surveying duties, joined me. I am to make another one in Arabic, he announced with a grin, with the exact words. We may as well do German and French, too. Find more boards, Selim. Is there any news? About last night. It is a great mystery, said Takim. The other men were as astonished as I. Was it known in Gona that Ramses and the others were to be here? Oh, yes, said. They made no secret of it. Selim delicately scratched his beard and glanced at me from under his lashes. It is also widely known that the White Lady has come before, on the night of the full moon. How many people have actually seen her? Selim thought about it, frowning. It is a good question, Sid. I have not spoken with any who saw her. They heard the stories, as did I, from others. The women do not come here, seeking her favor? The ancients prayed to Hathor for happiness in love and for children. They would be afraid to come after dark, Sid. They fear demons and ghosts. Interesting, I said thoughtfully. Yes, Sid, but what does it mean? Another good question, and one to which I had no answer. Selim had one piece of relatively good news. The boat had been located a few hundred yards downstream, run up against the bank. The men who had found it had immediately reported the discovery to Daoud. Though the damage was extensive, it was not beyond repair, and the boat had already been towed to the landing near Luxor. Until the repairs on the boat are completed, Sabia is without a means of income, I said, after we'd all gathered round the luncheon basket. Tell him to purchase another vessel, Daoud. We will pay for it, of course. It will be a loan, said Daoud firmly. He will repay you. Bah, said Emerson. It's our responsibility. Unless Sabir had a business rival who resented his success. Can you think of any such man? They are all jealous, said Daoud proudly. All the boatmen, because Sabir made more money than they. But none would destroy another man's boot. It would not... it would not be... Honourable, I suggested, as Dawood groped for the right word. A matter of professional ethics. Yes, said Dawood, relieved. He looked inquiringly at the last of the sandwiches, and I said, Take it, Dawood, the rest of us have finished, even if your assessment is not correct, and I feel certain it is. I cannot imagine anyone daring to risk injury to us. The wrath of the father of curses is more dangerous than a sandstorm in the desert, Dowd agreed. Emerson is always in a better state of mind after he's been fed. After Fatima's excellent luncheon, he agreed without demur to the dispersal of his staff. Ramsay said he would stay to finish excavating the trench, and I returned to my rubbish heap with Leah to help. When we returned to the house that afternoon, I fully expected Emerson would retreat to his study with Bertie's plan and his own field notes, but he declared he didn't want to miss his time with the dear children. We don't see enough of them, he complained, returning from the bath chamber and hastily assuming clean garments. You won't let them take breakfast with us, and they go to bed so early. The amount of time we spend with them is entirely up to you, Emerson. If you would give up a few hours each day, we could take them sightseeing and visiting, arrange little games, teach them to ride, and so on. Evie and Dolly haven't been to the castle, or to Selim's house, or even to Luxor. You have an absolute genius at putting the blame onto a fellow, Emerson grumbled. 
I went to the veranda, where Evelyn was chatting with Fatima as she set out the tea things. Walter was sorting through a pile of letters. I hope you don't mind, Amelia, he said. I was looking to see if there's anything for Evelyn or me. Pray continue sorting it, Walter. The post has rather piled up in the last few days. I haven't had time to look at it. After extracting several letters, one of which he handed to Evelyn, he passed the basket with its overflowing contents to me. From Raddy, Evelyn said, and began reading with a happy smile. A brief note from Willie, said Walter, and a letter from Griffith. He wants more Meroitic inscriptions. Why the devil does he suppose we'll find them in Luxor? Emerson demanded. One never knows what the dealers may have, Walter said mildly. I have given up Meroitic, as you know, so anything I find will go to Frank. You and Mr. Griffith have a remarkably cordial relationship, I remarked, handing Emerson a pile of letters. Most Egyptologists are quarrelsome and possessive. If that was meant for me, Peabody, I flatly deny it, said Emerson, hastily looking through his letters and tossing them back into the basket. Wasn't that a letter from Mr. Winlock? I asked. I don't care what the bastard has to say. Shrieks of childish anticipation prevented me from asking what Mr. Winlock had done to incur Emerson's ire. The twins burst in, accompanied by their parents, and I lifted the post-basket high in the air, out of reach of Davy, who loved letters and believed everything that came was directed to him. Emerson took the children on his lap. I handed Ramses and Nefret their messages and began opening my own. Nothing from... Uh, Emerson asked. No, most of these are the usual thing. The usual thing? Evelyn inquired. I read a few aloud for the amusement of the others. My dear Mrs. Emerson, you don't know me, but my brother is the son-in-law of Lady Worthington, and I would like to make your acquaintance. At what time would it be convenient for me to call on you? Who's Lady Worthington? Nefret asked. I've no idea. My dear Mrs. Emerson, it would be a great privilege to be shown round the sights of Luxor by your husband. We'll be at the Winter Palace this week. More letters from impertinent visitors, David asked. He and Leah came in with the two children and Senia. Evie ran to Davy and embraced him fiercely. He hugged her back, twittering melodiously, while Sharla scowled at both of them. We get that sort of thing all the time, said Senia, in a worldly manner. Read some more, Aunt Amelia. They're quite amusing, really. This is a particularly charming example, I said. We are two young American ladies who are anxious to meet your son. Mr. Weigel, whom we met in London last month, assures us he is very knowledgeable and handsome, too. I owe Weigel one for that, Ramses muttered. I doubt he said any such thing, I replied, tossing another half-dozen epistles into the waste-paper basket. He was certainly the social butterfly when he was inspector, Nefret remarked. Always bragging about Prince this and Lady that. We mustn't be uncharitable, my dear. In his official capacity, Mr. Weigel had to be polite to important visitors. So do some of our colleagues who are dependent upon private contributions. We are under no such constraints, and people like that are only a nuisance if one allows them to take advantage. Gargery has been quite useful in that respect. If strangers turn up asking for us, we send him out in full butling mode. When he looks down his nose and intones, the professor and Mrs. Emerson are not at home, even the most importunate Americans beat a retreat. Gargery can't look down his nose at everyone, said Leah with a laugh. He's only five. Oh, Gargery, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. That is quite all right, Miss Leah, said Gargery, putting her in her place by calling her Miss instead of Madam. Gargery can look down his nose at anyone, I said. It is not a matter of height, but of presence. Thank you, madam, said Gargery. Shall I bring the drinks tray, professor? Yes, why not? He sat down on the floor and beckoned the children to gather round. See what I found today. It was a small statue of limestone, approximately six inches high. The workmanship was rather crude, but the face had a smiling, naive charm. This was dedicated to the Queen Ahmosa Nefertari by a fellow named Ikhetaper, Emerson explained, 
tracing the line of hieroglyphs with his finger. You may look, but don't touch. It's not a dolly. I would like to go and dig with you and Mamma and Papa, said Evie. If I find something, can I keep it? Charla shot her an evil look, which Emerson did not miss. He knew better than to accede to that request. I'll tell you what, he said heartily. Supposing I teach you all how to ride a donkey. As I said to your grandmother the other day, it is high time you learned. The offer was received with general acclamation. I am not a petty-minded woman. I did not mention that it had been my idea. On the whole, the riding lesson was a success. That is to say, it was a success with the children. The donkeys were less than pleased, and one of the adult persons present behaved rather badly. I refer, of course, to Emerson, who kept snatching the children off the little beasts whenever they, the latter, moved faster than a walk. Evie fell off twice, and Davy once, to express his solidarity, I believe, on the second occasion. The happiest of all was Dolly, who trotted round and round the courtyard like someone who'd been riding all his life. When Emerson, puffing and dust-covered, declared an end to the lesson, Dolly obediently dismounted. He came to me and took my hand. That was very good, I said. We will keep this particular donkey for you. Thank you, Aunt Amelia. When I am older, I will ride a great white horse, like my great-great-grandfather. Only one great, I said, wondering what the devil Emerson had been telling him. Abdullah had never been an enthusiastic horseman. When will we go and see him again? Soon. Run along now and wash up for supper. Charla did not want to get off the donkey. She stuck like a cockleburr until Ramses detached her and carried her away. Since I had remained a safe distance from the circus, it did not take me long to tidy myself. I treated myself to a brief stroll through the gardens, checking on my plantings. One of the roses appeared to me to be a trifle wilted. I made a mental note to remind Fatima to remind Ali to water it. What a restful place it was, the sweet scent of blossoms, the melodious songs of birds. A bee-eater flashed overhead, iridescent bronze and steel blue and green, and a dove let out its strange cry, almost like a human laugh. The cry ended in a squawk, and I plunged into the shrubbery in time to detach Horus from the dove before he could do much damage. The dove flapped off, and Horus swore at me. Such a peaceful place. I had been guilty of a certain degree of hubris when I implied to Nefret that I had everything under control. I hadn't exactly lied to her. I never lie, unless it is absolutely necessary. I had only applied the reassurance I thought she needed. However, things had happened so fast that it was hard to keep track of them. The infuriating Mr. Smith's visit had added additional complications. It was time to make one of my little lists. As soon as dinner was over, I excused myself, claiming I had work to do, which was the truth. Seating myself at my desk, I began by ruling my paper into neat sections and then headed one column, annoying and mysterious events, the next, theories, and the third, steps to be taken. The veiled Hathor of Cairo was the first event to be considered. Three possible explanations occurred to me. First, that she was someone out of Ramsay's past. Second, that she hoped to be someone in his future. Third, that her motive was something other than personal attraction. I could not think what on earth that motive could be. The only course of action open to me was a thoughtful consideration of the women who had been involved with my son at some time or other. Asking Ramsay's would have been the logical next step, but I knew that wouldn't get me anywhere. I drew another sheet of paper to me and began another list. After I had finished, I studied it in some surprise. I hadn't realized there'd been so many. Nor, I felt sure, was the list complete. However, several of the names merited investigation. A hairpin dropped onto the desk, and a lock of hair fell over my eyes. I brushed it back with a muttered, confound it and shoved several other loose pins back into place. When I am deep in thought, I have a habit of pressing my hands to my head. This has a deleterious effect upon one's coiffure, but it does seem to assist in ratiocination. The affair at the Temple of Hathor came next to mind. Had it been the same woman? It is the duty of a good detective to consider all possibilities, but it seemed hardly likely that there were two resentful females in league. 
At any rate, Mariam could not have been the second Hathor. The incident had at least supplied two physical clues. Nefret had given me the crumpled white garment found at the temple. I took it and the torn scrap of linen from the drawer and spread the robe out across the desk, determined to subject it to a closer analysis than I had been able to give it before. It was of plain white cotton and simple pattern, two rectangles sewed up the sides and across the top, leaving spaces for arms and head. It had been sewn by hand rather clumsily. There were several rents, one of them near the hem, where Nefret's arrow had penetrated the fabric, the others along the seams where the stitches had parted, possibly as a result of a hasty removal of the garment. There was absolutely nothing distinctive about it. I felt certain it hadn't been purchased in the souk, but had been constructed by the wearer. The scrap of cloth snagged on the wall had not come from the robe. The fabric was completely different, finely woven linen, pleated and sheer. It must have been torn from the garment she wore under the robe when she scrambled over the wall, a diaphanous, seductive garment like the one Ramses had seen in Cairo. Agile though she must be, and familiar with the terrain, luck had played a large part in her successful escape. If Justin and his entourage had not thrown her plans into disarray... An unpleasant prickling sensation ran down my spine as a new theory trickled into my mind. She must have known of the children's intention of visiting the temple that night. Yet she had risked capture and exposure, for she had been alone, and there had been four of them, all young and quick and just as familiar with the terrain. Unless she stopped them before they got close enough to seize her, had there been a weapon concealed in the folds of that voluminous garment? A single bullet would have prevented pursuit if it killed or seriously wounded even one of them. She had assured Ramses she meant him no harm, so he could not have been the intended victim. Which of them, then? David? Lear? Nefret? Or was it Ramses after all? He had managed to free himself. Who could tell what her real intentions toward him had been? So deeply engrossed was I in ugly speculation that I let out a little shriek and bounded up out of my chair when the door opened. "'Expecting a murderer, were you?' Emerson inquired. "'I am sorry to disappoint you, Peabody.' "'Oh, Emerson, I've just had a horrible idea.' "'Nothing new about that,' said Emerson. His smile faded, and he caught me in a hard embrace. "'My darling girl, you're all a-tremble. Tell me your horrible idea.' "'Emerson likes me to tremble and cling to him. "'In his opinion, I don't do it often enough. "'So I dutifully clung and trembled, "'while I explained my latest theory. "'I had hoped he would scoff "'and tell me my rampageous imagination had run away with me. "'But when I looked up into his face, "'his brow was furrowed and his lips compressed. "'Slowly he shook his head. "'Damnation, Peabody,' he remarked. "'I hate to admit it. "'but it makes a certain amount of sense. "'I had hoped you would scoff "'and tell me my rampageous imagination had run away with me.' "'The lines in his forehead smoothed out, "'and he smiled a little. "'It has, my darling, it has. "'The plot would do nicely for a sensational novel, "'but it is all based on surmise. "'Here, give me a kiss.' "'What does that have to do with nothing at all?' said Emerson. "'removing the remaining pins from my hair "'with a single sweep of his fingers "'and tilting my head back. "'When he'd finished kissing me, "'he drew a long, satisfied breath. "'That's better. "'Now, then, sit down and tell me "'what other brilliant deductions you've made. "'I presume that is one of your famous charts.' "'Meekly I handed him the paper.' He perused it in a single glance. Admittedly, there wasn't much to see. Hmm. With all due regard for your abilities, my dear, I can't see that this gets us any farther. What's this? He picked up the other list and ran his eye down it. It was self-explanatory, particularly to a man of Emerson's intellect. When he looked at me, his expression was a mixture of admiration and consternation. How the devil did you get this? "'Not from Ramses, surely?' "'Of course not. "'I would not be ill-bred enough to approach him "'about such a sensitive subject. "'I don't suppose you... "'Good God, no!' "'Emerson's handsome countenance "'changed from bronze to copper. "'Well, then, 
Can you think of anyone I've omitted? I would not be ill-bred enough to speculate, said Emerson primly. But his eyes remained fixed on the paper. Mm, yes, I remember the Bellingham girl, dreadful young woman. Who is Clara? A girl he met in Germany. He mentioned her in his letters. How do you know he... Never mind, don't tell me. Violet? Oh, Lord, yes, she was in hot pursuit, wasn't she? But I'm sure he never... Good God, not Mrs. Fraser. Though I did wonder at the time. His voice rose from a mumble to a shout. Layla? She here, Peabody. You cannot possibly be sure they... I am not sure of any of them, I retorted. My composure had returned. It was delightful to engage in detectival speculation with my dear spouse, and even more delightful to see him enjoy the sort of rude gossip he pretends to deplore. She saved his life, at some risk to herself, and I assume she expected something in return. She was a hot-blooded woman. She had her eye on you at one time, I believe. She had her eye on a good many men, Emerson retorted. That was her profession. She couldn't have been the veiled Hathor Peabody. Ramses said she was young. Layla was a mature woman ten years ago. She does have one of the qualifications the latest apparition must have possessed, however. She knows every foot of the West Bank. And all the men who live there, Emerson agreed, with the sort of smile I make it a habit to take no notice of. What's become of her? I don't know. But Selim will. Emerson, there are a number of other perplexing issues facing us, but in light of my latest theory... We must consider the unmasking of Hathor of primary importance. As if drawn by a magnet, Emerson's eyes returned to the list of names. Mrs. Pankhurst? I had been of two minds as to whether to tell the children about my unpleasant new theory. A good night's sleep, a bright morning and particularly the affectionate attentions of my spouse, restored my natural optimism and reminded me that they were not children but responsible adults and that it was my duty to warn them of a potential danger. I waited until Senia had finished breakfast and gone off to gather her books before I told them. The only one who took it seriously was Gargery. Like the romantic he was, he had been vastly intrigued by the veiled lady, the others expressed the same reservations Emerson had hinted at the night before, namely, and to wit, that the whole thing was a figment of my imagination. "'What made you think she might have had a weapon?' Ramses asked, a tilt of his brows expressing his scepticism. "'I feel sure one of us would have noticed, if she had pointed a pistol at us.' "'I am not at all sure you would have,' I retorted. "'With all respect to you, my dear, nobody seems to have noticed very much. "'There was quite a lot going on.' David said. He reached for the marmalade. I'm beginning to feel rather sorry for the poor woman. It must have been disconcerting in the extreme to have her performance interrupted by that screaming mob. And can you picture her scrambling over the wall, tearing her elegant robe? Nevertheless, said Emerson, who had finished eating and was glancing pointedly at his watch, we must take every possibility into account. Peabody's wild unorthodox theories have often uh, sometimes proved true. Keep a sharp eye out, all of you. As soon as we arrived at the site, I found Selim and informed him I wanted to talk to him. He had been a bit shy of me since the arrival of the motor car, but this morning he had a new grievance. When may we give a fantasia of welcome, said Hakim. It should have been done before this. Ramsey said he would talk to you, and we have been waiting for you to say when it will be. I am sorry, Selim, I said, acknowledging the justice of his complaint. Ramses did speak to me, and the matter slipped my mind. You know how difficult it is to get Emerson to agree to attend a social event. This is not a social event, said Selim. Now that he had me on the defensive, he folded his arms and gave me a severe look. It is an obligation and an honoured custom, as well as a pleasure. The father of curses will obey your slightest wish. He ignored my wishes about the motor car. You did not forbid him to get one, Sid. His beard twitched. 
just as his father's had done when he was trying to repress a smile. I could not help laughing. You are in the right, Selim. I have been remiss about entertaining the family. Mrs. Vandergelt wants to give a party for them, too, and several old friends in Luxor have sent invitations. But your Fantasia must come first. Would this coming Friday suit you? Selim no longer repressed his smile. I will tell Daoud and Khadija. Now that that most important matter is settled, I want to go over a few things with you. I unfolded a piece of paper. I had found time to make another list. It was headed, Outstanding Questions. Ah, said Selim, a list? Several of the items were of long standing, and Selim had nothing new to add. The purported madman who had attacked Mariam had not been identified. Nor had the individual responsible for the sinking of Dawood's boat. There had been no sign of the jewellery stolen from Cyrus or of Martinelli. Selim's face grew longer and longer as I read on. He prided himself on his connections and he hated admitting he had drawn a blank. The last question took him by surprise. Leila? Yes, said, of course I remember her. The third wife of Abd al Hamid. Why do you ask about her? I've been trying to think of people who might bear a grudge against us, I explained. Why should she bear a grudge? You treated her more kindly than she deserved. Selim stroked his beard. She is no longer in Luxor, said. I think someone told me she had gone to live with the sisters in Asyut. What? I exclaimed. Leila, a nun? Selim grinned. I do not believe she would dare turn Christian, not even Leila. But she was a woman of extremes, said. That would certainly be going from one extreme to the other. People sometimes do, said Selim, with a worldly wise air. Shall I investigate it? Never mind, it was a far-fetched idea. Thank you for your help, Selim. I have not been able to give enough help, said. Sit. I have a question. He shuffled his feet and looked down like a shy schoolboy. Will you ask Emerson if he will allow me to drive the motor car to the Fantasia? All the way up the hill to your house? It can't be done, Selim. It can sit. He raised shining eyes. Did I not drive the other motor car through the Wadi El Arish and up the hills and across the desert? The Fantasia will be at the house of Daud, which, as you know, is on a lower slope. And there is a track, a good track, not so very steep except in a few places, and a good wide space in front of the house to turn the motor car, where everyone can see. Some of the women and the children have not seen it, nor seen me drive it. I will talk to Emerson, I promised, patting him on the shoulder. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. I watched with a fond smile as he walked away, with a spring in his step. He wanted to show off in front of his wives and kinfolk. Who were we to deny our loyal friend such a harmless pleasure? When I put it that way to Emerson, he was forced to agree. After observing that the infernal machine appeared to be operating properly, I had allowed him to drive it down to the river and back a few times. He enjoyed himself a great deal, and while he was busy playing with the car, I was able to get on with my other duties. I had promised to take tea with Catherine that afternoon and see how the work on the collection was progressing. After assuming proper attire, I went to the room we had designated as Walter's study, where I found him and Ramses sorting through Ostrica. They were so happily absorbed, I had to cough several times before they became aware of my presence. "'Sorry, Mother,' said Ramses, getting to his feet. "'Have you been there long?' "'No, my dear.' I waved him back into his chair. "'An interesting text, is it?' "'Fascinating. Listen to this. "'The house of Amanachte, son of Bukentef, "'his mother being a Tarekhanu, his wife, Tent Pauper, "'daughter of Chaim Hedjet, her mother being Tenchenuemheb, it's the same fellow whose house we cleared earlier this year. I'm sure I saw another fragment of this same text somewhere. He saw my glazed expression and laughed. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's a kind of census, don't you see? And it gives a genealogy for one family. 
several generations, if I can find the rest of it. It warmed my heart to see his sober face light up with laughter. Splendid, I exclaimed heartily. And you, Walter, have you given up on the papyrus? No, not at all, Walter said, adjusting his eyeglasses. I was just helping Ramses look for more fragments of his genealogy. It requires a certain experience to recognize the same handwriting. His long, thin fingers continued to sort through the fragments, moving as rapidly as a woman's might have done while matching patches for a quilt. It was an impressive demonstration of his expertise, for the pieces were of all sizes and shapes, and the writing on them ranged from the neat, scribal, hieratic script to the scribbles of the later, more cursive, demotic, which had always reminded me of a row of hen tracks. "'That is good of you, Walter,' I said. "'How far have you got with the horoscope?' "'Here's my copy, if you'd like to look at it,' Walter indicated the pages. "'My dear Walter, you might as well offer me a manuscript in Chinese. "'Aren't you going to translate it? Eventually.' "'Ah,' he picked up a fragment and examined it. "'No, the handwriting is similar, but this is part of a list of supplies.' "'I didn't mean to disturb you,' I said. "'I'm off to the castle for tea. "'Any messages for Cyrus?' "'Walter only grunted. "'Ramses got up and went with me to the door. "'What's on your mind, mother?' he asked, eyebrows tilting. "'Nothing, my dear. Um, "'You haven't come across any other interesting predictions in the papyrus, I suppose?' "'He took me by the shoulders and gave them an affectionate squeeze. "'Honestly, mother, you don't credit that nonsense, do you?' "'Certainly not,' I said, laughing. "'A bientôt, then.' "'As Walter had explained, "'it would be virtually impossible to match the date on the papyrus "'with a modern calendar. "'However, if one took as a point of departure "'the day on which our accident had occurred "'and counted the days from then on, "'it was only a matter of academic curiosity, "'and one I would not be able to satisfy "'unless I could persuade one of the absorbed scholars "'to translate the text for me.' Emerson was not at all pleased when I informed him I had accepted Catherine's invitation to a reception on the Sunday. He had already begun to work himself into a state of aggravation about the Fantasia. Selim's been so busy making arrangements he isn't worth a piaster, he grumbled, and Dowd's almost as bad. Now you are proposing I waste another day. I won't do it, Peabody, and that's flat. "'Supposing I let you have Ramses and David tomorrow and the next day "'to make up for your lost time?' "'Let me?' Hmm. said Emerson. "'Everyone was agreeable, even Walter, "'who said he wouldn't at all mind a day in the fresh air. "'All of us, including Senia and Gargery, "'were at the dig the following afternoon. "'Horus went everywhere with Senia, "'and the great Cat of Ray had decided to accompany us as well.' He and Horace got on reasonably well, since the former was attached to Ramses and did not challenge Horace's preemptive claim on Senia. The great cat of Ray, who specialised in snakes, flushed an angry cobra out of its hole and was with difficulty prevented from attacking it. Emerson killed the poor snake. It was only behaving as a snake is entitled to behave. But a venomous serpent is a dangerous neighbour. We did not often encounter them for they avoid human beings. I was alone with my rubbish, since the others found the task tedious and had found excuses to be elsewhere. I watched them enviously, for I too had become bored with rubbish. Evelyn was under the shelter, taking a little rest. Her silvery hair glowed even in the shadows. Emerson, bareheaded in the boiling sunlight, was lecturing water about something— as my eyes wandered, I became aware of a strange, insect-like buzzing. As it grew louder, I looked about, trying to find the source. Ramses, whose keen hearing is proverbial in Egypt, popped into sight from behind the ruined wall he was digging out. Like his father, he was without a hat. Shading his eyes with his hand, he looked up. I sprang to my feet, staggering just a little, and hurried to Emerson, the others had seen it too. Frozen in identical postures, heads raised, they stared in astonished silence as the aeroplane circled and headed off across the river. What's everybody gaping at? Emerson demanded, recovering from his initial surprise. Haven't you ever seen an aeroplane before? 
a good number of them had, during the rioting the previous spring. Planes had dropped leaflets all over the country, warning that anyone committing acts of sabotage would be shot, and bombs had been dropped on any gathering that struck the military observers as suspicious. It's not surprising that as this one turned and came back toward us, a great outcry arose, and some of the men flung themselves flat on the ground. I found the confounded things unnerving myself. When they were airborne, they looked unreal, not like a bird or a machine, but like some mythological flying insect, rigid and fragile, gliding on the wind with motionless wings. This time it passed directly overhead, so low that I could see the concentric circles of red, white and blue on the wings, and the heads of two persons protruding from the body of the machine. Their faces were concealed by helmets and goggles. One of them raised an arm and gestured. Damnation! Emerson exclaimed. What does the damn fool think he's doing? He wants to land, Ramsay said in disbelief, on this side of the river. He ran toward the shelter where we had left the horses, vaulted onto Risha's back, and set the stallion at a gallop toward the road that led around the hill of Cornet Murai toward the river. Where is he going? Nefret demanded. She tore her eyes from the plane, which was making another circle, and started after Ramsay's. Emerson moved with long strides toward the horses. To guide them to a suitable landing place, I presume. Why they aren't landing on the east bank, where there are great stretches of empty desert, I cannot imagine. Wait for me, I cried, and ran after him. Nefret and David had already mounted. Our assistance, I felt sure, would be needed. The stretch of low desert between the cultivation and the cliffs was rock-strewn and hilly, with pits and tombs and ruins all over the place. How much space an aeroplane required to land, I did not know, but the main tourist road seemed to offer the best possibility. When we reached it, the aeroplane was circling again, while Ramses tried to get donkeys, carts, camels and people off a relatively level stretch. It was not an easy task, since they were running in all directions, some scampering for cover, the braver and more curious trying to get closer. By dint of shouting, shoving, and in a few cases towing, balky mules and arrogant camels, we managed to empty a part of the road, though it was lined with spectators. That should do it, Ramses panted. Turning, he shouted Arabic curses at a camel driver who was edging closer. Keep back! What's he waiting for? Emerson asked. Something to do with the wind, Ramses replied. He rose in the stirrups and waved. The import of his gestures eluded me, but they must have meant something to the pilot, for on its next approach the machine came in for a landing. The wheels touched the ground. In a series of alarming bounces and at considerable speed it rushed toward us. The remaining spectators scattered, shrieking and braying, and finally the machine jolted to a stop. Nobody hurt, thank God, Emerson growled. I will just have a word with the damned fool and ask him what he means by this. The aeroplane had stopped several hundred feet away. Everyone converged on it except the donkeys, who were unaccustomed to loud noises and were kicking and braying. I followed more slowly. I had just had one of my premonitions. When I arrived on the scene, the pilot had removed his headgear and was shouting cheerfully at the audience. Get away, you fellows! Imshi, clear off or I'll tell the big bird to bite you! The second man, in the observer's seat, waited until I came up before unmasking. Ah, Amelia, there you are. Good afternoon, everyone. You, Emerson croaked. Weren't you expecting me? Not in this fashion, I said. Sethos gave me a provoking smile. Like his brother, whom he closely resembled, he was a handsome man, but his face was discoloured and not so well shaped as usual. It looked to me as if someone had given him a severe beating. I was in a hurry, he explained. Rob was good enough to give me a lift. Flight Lieutenant Wickens, may I present you to Mrs. Emerson, her husband, Professor... Not now, for pity's sake, I exclaimed. Get out of that cursed machine at once! Sethos shifted position, winced theatrically, and reached out to Emerson. Oh, give me a hand, will you, old chap? I'm a trifle stiff. Chapter 8 
Lieutenant Wickens politely declined my invitation to join us for tea. Can't leave the old bus unguarded, Mum. These beggars will strip off everything they can carry. Must start back anyhow. Two for a nasty wigging from my CO as it is. Absent without leave, stealing one of His Majesty's valuable aeroplanes. He chortled like a mischievous child. He wasn't much more than nineteen or twenty, with a fresh complexion and merry brown eyes under brows as sun-bleached as his hair. I do hope you won't get in trouble for this, I said. Couldn't refuse good old Badger, Mom. Wouldn't have missed him for the world. The slower members of the party had caught us up. Leah was carrying the great cat of Ray, and I could hear Horace spitting and swearing in his basket. Walter stared. Badger, he echoed. I gave him a little poke, and the boy went on blithely. I'll need petrol. Can you help me there? He addressed Emerson, who could never be taken for anything but the leader of any group of which he made a part. However, Emerson was glowering at his brother, who leaned pathetically on his arm. So Ramses took it upon himself to reply. Yes, of course. It'll be dark before long, though. Wouldn't you prefer to wait until morning? Piece of cake, was the breezy reply. Just follow the river. Can't miss Cairo. Sooner the better, though. So if you don't mind... Quite, said Ramses. Selim will... Selim? Selim was gaping at the aeroplane in open adoration. He had seen them, not only here but in Palestine, during our little hegira to Gaza. But I believe this was the first time he'd ever seen one on the ground. Not a distant flying thing, but an actual machine with an actual engine. Yes, he said, starting. What did you say, Ramses? Sethos let out a faint groan. I had better get... Uh, "'Good old Badger, back to the house,' I said, giving him a hard look. "'Will you excuse us, Lieutenant? The men will stay, of course, to help you. "'I hope you will come for a proper visit one day. Delighted, ma'am.' "'Frightfully good of you, old chap,' said Sethos, overdoing the accent a bit. "'I'll be along shortly,' said Emerson. "'He heaved his brother unceremoniously onto Selim's stallion,' and went back to staring at the aeroplane with the same expression of vacant adoration as Selim's. A sense of deep foreboding ran through my limbs. When we reached the house, I sent Sethos to our room to freshen up and asked Fatima to make tea. A few tactful hints dispersed most of the others, though Evelyn had to drag Walter away, and I knew Gargery would probably listen at the door. Sethos was back almost at once. His face and hands were cleaner, but the uniform, that of a major in the Egyptian army, was a mass of wrinkles. Passing his hand over his bristly chin, he said, I know I look like the devil, Amelia, but don't lecture me. I haven't been able to shave for a week. I brought a change of clothing with me, but not much else. Cargo space in those machines is limited. What happened to your face? I asked. Sethos settled himself in the most comfortable chair. I encountered several fellows who considered I had no right to be where I was. Doing what? Never mind. He leaned forward, hands clasped. Where is she? Employed as a companion to an elderly lady and her mentally disturbed grandson. They are staying on their dahabiyya in Luxor. His expression did not alter. That doesn't sound like her. What became of the rich husband? "'Imprudent investments stripped him of his fortune. "'He died, leaving her penniless. "'You are uncharacteristically terse, my dear. "'What are you keeping from me?' "'Gargery came out with a tray, which he placed on the table. "'I had to speak to him sharply before he sulked away. "'I think it best if you hear the details from Mariam herself,' I said, "'pouring a cup of tea. "'But not here. "'He drank thirstily, and I refilled his cup.' "'I suppose you have it all worked out,' he said. "'Certainly it would not be advisable for you to go to her. "'There is no need for her employer to meet you or learn of your relationship at present. "'I will go across to Luxor and fetch her back. "'Tomorrow will be soon enough. "'Don't tell me you're getting cold feet. "'The sooner the better, in my opinion. "'We are somewhat crowded here, and you will want privacy. "'So you had better stay on the Amelia.' You'll be quite comfortable. Fatima has kept it ready for guests. Gargery, when the professor comes back, tell him where we've gone. Yes, madam, said a voice from just inside the door.
Yes, madam, said Sethos. It required only a few minutes to explain the arrangements to Fatima, and we were soon on our way to the Dahabiyya. I left Sethos there and got one of the crewmen, two of whom were always on duty, to take me across the river. I wasn't properly dressed for a social call, since I hadn't taken the time to change from my working costume. But I had put on my second best hat, which had a nice wreath of pink roses and chiffon streamers that tied under the chin. Parasol in hand, I marched up the gangplank of the Isis, announced myself to the guard, and was shown into the saloon. Tea had just been brought in, and they were all present, Justin and Mariam, Mrs Fitzroyce and the doctor. The doctor was the only one who appeared pleased to see me. He bounded to his feet, cheeks rounded in a smile. His waistcoat was a rainbow of bright embroidery. Hands resting on the head of her stick, Mrs Fitzroyce looked me up and down, from my dusty boots to my rose-trimmed hat, as her late majesty might have eyed a mongrel dog. "'I apologise for my intrusion,' I said. "'I will not stay. "'I came only to ask if I might borrow Miss Underhill for the evening. "'An old friend has arrived unexpectedly and would like to see her.' "'A faint gasp from Mariam was the only response. "'The doctor's fixed smile did not change. "'Mrs Fitzroyce did not move an inch. "'I am not easily disconcerted, but as the silence lengthened, "'I began to feel slightly uncomfortable.' There was something uncanny about the shadowy room, the motionless figures, and the eyes of Justin gleaming like those of a cat. Finally, the old lady stirred and cleared her throat. I cannot permit Miss Underhill to absent herself. She knew when she accepted the position that I expected her to be on duty all day, every day. You mean she hasn't had a day or an hour to herself since she joined you? My tone was incredulous and critical. It seemed to me, as it must have done to most persons, that the arrangement was cruelly unfair. Mrs Fitzroyce responded with a brusque, That is correct. But surely, I modified my indignation. Since she's been so faithful in her attendance all this time, can you not spare her for a few hours? I would be extremely grateful. We will bring her back immediately after dinner. Unexpectedly and unnervingly, Mrs Fitzroyce's face broke into a broad smile, which added a new and interesting collection of wrinkles. I realised she was having another spell. Very good, she mumbled. Go and get your hat, Miss Underhill. The nice hat Mrs Emerson gave you. Mariam got slowly to her feet. That she knew the identity of the friend, I did not doubt. I could not see her features clearly, but her bent head and bowed shoulders suggested that she had resigned herself to face her father. "'You are inviting Miss Underhill to your house?' Justin's clear treble rang with surprise. "'Then I will come too.' "'I am sorry,' I began. The old lady cut me off with a rusty chuckle. "'No, Justin, you have not been invited.' "'But she is only a servant,' Justin protested. "'Why can't I go? I want to see the pretty Mrs. Emerson and the children and the cats.' The door opened to admit one of the guards, a swarthy fellow in turban and striped robe. He seemed out of breath. "'There is a gentleman.' "'Yes, yes,' said the gentleman, pushing him out of the way. "'My apologies, madam.' I came to fetch my wife. Ill-mannered and unexpected though it was, his appearance dispelled the uncanny atmosphere as a fresh breeze blows away fog. It would never have occurred to him to change into proper clothing, but Emerson never looks to better advantage than when he is attired in the casual garments he wears on the dig. His shirt open at the throat, his muscular arms bared to the elbow. Mrs Fitzroyce inspected him with more interest than she had bestowed on me. Emerson has that effect on females, and in my experience, a lady is never too old to appreciate a fine-looking man. "'Won't you and Mrs. Emerson stay for tea, Professor?' "'No,' said Emerson. I coughed meaningfully, and he amended his reply. "'Thank you, but we haven't the time. Confounded rude of Mrs. Emerson to burst in on you, but the circumstances... uh... 
Mm. Amelia, shall we go? Mm. Where's the girl? That is, I mean, uh, Miss... Um, uh, I poked him with my parasol before he could shove his foot farther into his mouth. Mariam had slipped out of the room. I hoped she had only gone to get her hat, but I wasn't taking any chances on her eluding me, so I rushed through my farewells and removed Emerson from the room. Somewhat to my surprise, Justin did not renew his demand to go with us. He had retreated and stood with his back against the wall, like a cornered animal. He doesn't like me, said Emerson, who had also observed the boy's reaction. You keep catching hold of him. It is just as well he was determined to come along until you turned up. Now where is that girl? We'll wait here at the head of the gangplank so she can't get away. You think she'll be bolt? I don't know, Emerson, but I prefer not to take the chance. That's why I came here at once, before she learned of the arrival of a mysterious stranger in an aeroplane. Whatever possessed you to follow me? I wanted to be sure you'd gone where you said you were going, Peabody. You don't trust me? Not one whit, said Emerson. His curious gaze moved round the deck, taking in the elegant fittings and the crewmen who watched him with equal curiosity. The old lady must be filthy rich. She set herself up in style. I didn't recognize any of the crewmen. A sturdy lot, aren't they? They are Kyrenes, I suppose. She probably hired them with the boat. When Marianne came, she was wearing the flowery hat. She had washed the paint off her face and loosened her hair. She looked very young and frightened. Emerson immediately offered her his arm and told her not to worry. Emerson left us at the Amelia. He dislikes emotional scenes and anticipated that this one would be particularly fraught. I led Mariam to the saloon, where we found young Nasir furiously dusting various articles of furniture. Fatima must have rousted him out of his house in the village and sent him to the boat to resume his former duties as steward. I had known I could leave everything to her. Her standards were a good deal higher than mine. The beds are made, sit, he announced proudly, waving the cloth, so that the dust immediately settled back onto the surfaces he had cleaned. And the tea is made, and the food is here, and Mahmoud is ready to cook, and very good, I said. Where is the gentleman? In his room, sit. There is hot water and towels, and... I told Mariam to sit down and went to fetch Sethos. By accident or design, he had selected the same room he had once occupied when he was ill with malaria. He was standing at the window, looking out across the rose and golden ripples of the river. "'She is here,' I said, though I knew he must have been aware of our arrival. "'I will leave you two alone.' Uh, "'No,' he turned slowly to face me. "'Please stay.' "'Come now, don't be such a card. You aren't afraid of her, are you?' I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing. He passed a hand nervously over his hair. I decided it was not a wig, though the colour was a peculiar shade of rust-streaked brown. Very well, I agreed. Only courtesy had led me to make the offer. I was immensely curious to know what they would say to each other, and it was likely that a mediator, or referee, might be wanted. Nasir had served tea. I told him we would wait on ourselves and sent him away. After a brief interval, during which time Mariam sat with bowed head and Sethos stood staring, for once bereft of speech, I took a chair and said briskly, Mariam, will you pour, please? Milk only for me. Your father takes lemon, no sugar. The social amenities are considered meaningless by some, but in my experience they are useful in helping people over an awkward spot. Mechanically, she followed my instructions. I gave Sethos a little nudge and gesture to him to take the cup from her. Not until then did she look up into his face. "'You've changed,' she whispered. "'For the worse.' He had regained his sang-froid. The practiced charm settled onto him like a garment. "'The same cannot be said of you. You've become a beautiful woman.' "'Like my mother?' He flinched but replied calmly, "'Not at all like your mother. "'I will answer your questions, Mariam, in due time, "'and make all the amends I can for my past mistakes. "'For now, can we not talk a little, "'get to know one another better?' "'His humility gave her increased confidence. "'Her chin lifted, and she smiled faintly. "'What shall we talk about?' "'You.' 
Remembering his manners, he brought me my cup and then seated himself next to her on the divan. Mrs. Emerson has told me of your present situation. It cannot continue. Has she told you the boy is dependent on me and that I have given Mrs. Fitzroy my word to remain as long as she needs me? We'll find someone to take your place. And then what? She responded as any woman of spirit would, with flashing eyes and heightened colour in her cheeks. Will you take me to live with you and your latest mistress? I feared that would arouse the sort of cutting response at which Sethos was so expert. Instead, he replied quietly, The lady to whom you refer is my dear companion, and will be my wife as soon as I can persuade her to accept my proposal of marriage. She has refused you. Why? It might not have been intended as a compliment, but her tone of surprise made it sound like one. She doesn't consider me reliable. I can't imagine why. His rueful smile would have been hard for any woman to resist, and, as I had realized from the start, she did not want to resist. Hardship and suffering had softened her. Only stubborn pride had prevented her from yielding at once. Her lips trembled, and her wide hazel eyes overflowed. She turned to him slowly, almost timidly. He held out his arms and gathered her into his embrace. It was a touching sight. Emerson would have been sniffing and clearing his throat. I put my cup on the table and rose. I will leave you alone now, I said. You have everything you need, I believe. Over the tumbled brown curls that rested against his breast, Sethos looked up at me. Everything, he said. Thank you, Amelia. They were all waiting for me on the veranda. I had to admire six or seven crayon scribbles before the children retired to make more, and I was able to satisfy the curiosity of the adults. I waved aside Evelyn's offer of tea. Emerson immediately handed me a stiff whiskey and soda. All's well, I said. When I left them, she was sobbing in his fatherly embrace. The reactions were somewhat mixed. Evelyn's sweet face glowed. Emerson gave a great sigh, and David and Leah murmured words of approval and congratulation. My son's phlegmatic countenance did not change. I find it difficult to picture Sethos as a doting father, he said. Now what, mother? I've made all the arrangements, I replied, holding out my empty glass to Emerson. I felt entitled to the indulgence, for really it had been a tiring day. They will dine together on the Dehabiyya, where Sethos is staying, and afterward he will escort her back to the Isis. She will give in her notice, and then... Then, I suppose, she'd better come to us until he makes permanent plans for her. I have a number of ideas about that, but I didn't want to mar the warmth of their reunion with practical suggestions. The last of the sunlight vanished as the sun sank below the western mountains. In the dusky twilight, the lights of distant Luxor twinkled like fallen stars. The genial beverage, I refer in this case to whiskey and soda, had its usual soothing effect. I was somewhat slow to realize that silence had followed my statement, instead of the eager questions and commendations I had expected. I trust there was no difficulty getting Lieutenant Wickens and the aeroplane away safely, I inquired. He got off all right, Ramsay said. Well, he makes it to Cairo is another matter. It'll be a near thing. The range of that aircraft is between three and four hundred miles. But he seemed to regard it as a fine lark. He was carrying extra petrol. The French shouldn't the children go to bed. This process ordinarily took quite some time. It began to dawn on me as the young parents hurried their offspring through good-night kisses and embraces that something had happened, something they did not want to discuss in front of the children. My affectionate concern pictured one disaster after another. Selim mangled by the propeller of the aeroplane, Cyrus suffering a heart attack, Bertie pale and dead of poison, a suicide note clutched in his stiffening hand... No, that was too absurd. He had better sense, even if I did suspect him of writing poetry on the sly. Senia was the last to leave. She considered that her right, since she was the eldest. Horus followed her out, and the great cat of Ray emerged from under the settee, his tail waving like a plume of dark smoke. Well, I cried, 
Do not keep me in suspense, Emerson. Something terrible has happened. I know it. Is it Cyrus or... Nothing like that, Peabody. Good God. You must learn to control your ampagious imagination. There's been a body found. The remains of one, rather. Ah, I said, relieved. No one we know, then. That seems to be the question, said Emerson. The police think the fellow was not an Egyptian. They've asked Nefret to come to the Zaptia and examine him. Them. Bones. Where were they found? In the desert east of Luxor. In that case, I said, rising, I will tell Fatima to serve dinner immediately. I had hoped I wouldn't have to ride that horse again today. Can't wait to get at a corpse, can you? Emerson inquired, baring his large white teeth. Dismiss the idea, Peabody. It can wait until tomorrow. He isn't going anywhere. As Ramses explained during dinner, the determination of sex and race had been arrived at because of the scraps of clothing found with the bones. I expressed my surprise at the deductive powers of the police official and at his request for Nefret services. He could have spared himself considerable trouble by disposing of the remains without bothering to mention them to the British authorities. He's a new broom, Ramses replied. The old chief tottered off into retirement a few months ago. Ibrahim Ayad is young, ambitious, energetic, and canny enough to avoid stirring up trouble until he's certain of his conclusions. I had reached certain conclusions of my own, but like the admirable Mr. Ayad, I was canny enough not to commit myself. If the others shared my suspicions, they did not say so. I had intended to pay a quick visit to the Dahabiya before accompanying the fret to Luxor, but it did not prove necessary. Sethos arrived at break of day. Informed of his presence by Gargery, I hastily finished dressing and went to the veranda, where I found that Fatima had brought him coffee. He looked reasonably respectable in flannels and tweed coat, which Nasir must have pressed for him. The bruises had faded to a greenish yellow, and the beard was now well developed. Breakfast will be served shortly, I informed him. So Fatima told me, with apologies for the delay. Sit down, Amelia, and let us watch the sunrise together. You will no doubt appreciate the symbolism. Pale clouds of rose and amber washed the cerulean blue of the heavens. It was the same sight I had watched so often with Abdullah. From a greater height, the symbolism did not elude me. You've made your peace with Mariam, then? We had quite an emotional few hours, said Sethos, at his ease. She's a moist young woman, isn't she? I don't recall her weeping so much. She has had cause for tears. The tone rather than the words themselves conveyed the reprimand I intended. His eyes avoided mine. My remark was in poor taste. You have reason to believe me a poor parent. But I did spend time with the child whenever I could. I don't... The truth is... Confounded, Amelia. I felt as if I were speaking with a stranger. A pretty, mannerly young woman so unlike the rebellious child I once knew, that I found it difficult to believe she was the same person. The change is for the better, isn't it? He nodded without speaking, his face still averted. Children change a great deal as they become adults, I said. One might say they do become different people. Just look at Ramses. He looked up, his strangely coloured eyes brightening from pale hazel to paler grey as the light caught them. A most encouraging example, it is true. Oh, we got on quite well, avoiding, by mutual consent, such delicate subjects as a mother's career as a murderess. You will have to face that subject sooner or later. I spoke rather sharply. Cynicism was his defence against emotion, but it was high time, in my opinion, he dropped those defences against his daughter. Get it out into the open and set her straight. I doubt she's heard the true story. She did seem chastened. She spoke gratefully of you. All the more reason to clear the air. I will do it if you shirk the task. Better you than I. You're very good at setting people straight. I will find a suitable opportunity, I promised. So you took her back to the ISIS last night? Yes, the old lady had retired, so I did not present myself. I am to fetch Mariam and her belongings, such as they are, later today. 
and bring her back to the Dahabia. It would not be proper for her to stay there with you. For God's sake, Amelia, she's my daughter. Do you want everyone in Luxor to know that? Sethos scratched his chin. The scruffy beard and the healing cuts itched, I supposed. I am becoming weary of inventing new identities and preposterous plots, Amelia. So far as her employer is concerned, I am an old friend of her father. Mariam says the old lady's a trifle vague, so she won't ask awkward questions. The busy gossips of Luxor certainly will, however. I've decided to be Major Hamilton again. Retired, of course. There's an outside chance that someone may remember Mariam as Molly, and that's the easiest way of explaining my interest in her. Hamilton was red-haired, I said, with a critical look at his streaked hair. I'm going grey. Sad, isn't it? How the years take their toll. <clears throat> said Emerson, appearing in the doorway. Um, everything all right with the girl? Yes, quite, I said, for I knew he did not want explanations, only assurance that he wouldn't have to do anything. Is breakfast ready? Yes. I assume, said Emerson morosely, that it would be a waste of breath to ask you not to come to the Zaptia. You are correct. It would be advisable for Sethos to join us, since he was well acquainted with the corpse. Sethos's only response to the news of Martinelli's death consisted of raised eyebrows and a silent whistle. I did not elaborate on the bare facts, nor was the subject discussed during breakfast. Evelyn asked after Mariam. Walter made several unsubtle attempts to find out Sethos's real name, and Ramses, in an effort to divert us, described Selim's fascination with the aeroplane. He stroked the dirty canvas like a lover and asked the lieutenant how hard it was to drive. Most foreigners had nothing to do with the native police. They were not subject to the laws that governed Egyptians and preferred to deal with occasional cases of theft and extortion through their dragomen or tour agencies. In Cairo, the police, like everything else in Egypt, was headed by a British advisor. But for the most part, the provincial police were under the jurisdiction of the local mudir. I had visited the Zabtiya, or police station, in the past, and I was pleasantly surprised at its changed appearance. The broken stairs and windows had been repaired. Two constables in smart white uniforms and red tarbouches stood at attention at the door, instead of sleeping on the steps as they had been accustomed to do. It was a sign of the changing times, of the new wind that was blowing through Egypt, and the young man who rose to his feet when we were shown into his office was another symbol of those times. Taller than most Egyptians, his sable beard and moustache trimmed close, he had the smooth, dark skin of a Sudanese and the manners of a Frenchman, though when he respectfully kissed the hand I offered, I detected a glint of irony in his keen black eyes. This is an honour I had not expected, Sitakim, he said. Taking this as the subtle rebuke that was intended, I replied in my best Arabic, I could not resist the opportunity of meeting one whose praises I have heard sung. With you be peace and God's mercy and blessing, Emerson added. The formalities having been concluded, as far as he was concerned, he went on, You've met my son. This is my daughter-in-law, a genuine Sitakim, and um, a friend, said Sethos, bowing. Sabah el Khair Effendi. Ayad's eyes rested on him for a moment, and then returned to Nefret. I thank you for coming. I have ordered the objects to be brought here. The mortuary is not pleasant for a lady. Nefret might have reminded him that her acquaintance with unpleasant cadavers was almost certainly greater than his. But she recognized the courtesy and acknowledged it with a smile. The room was fairly large and crowded with shabby furniture. A red plush settee, several chairs of European style, the cushions worn and faded, a large desk and two battered wooden cabinets. Under the windows on the east wall was a long table covered with cotton sheeting. Without ceremony, Ayad whisked it off. In Egypt, one inevitably thinks of mummies. However, a body left unburied has little chance to dry out before predators get to it, vultures, wild dogs, jackals, and after them, a varied collection of insects. 
There was nothing left of this one but pale bones, splintered and gnawed and disarticulated. As Nefret bent over the unsavoury ensemble, her face absorbed, Ayad said, They were widely scattered, and some we did not find, though we searched far. She heard the defensive note in his voice and gave him the compliment he wanted. You've laid them out in the right order, she said, without looking up. I'm impressed that you found so many. The small bones of hands and feet are missing. That's not unusual in such cases. Some of the ribs... As she spoke, she took a tape measure from the pocket of her skirt. Without the feet, I can only estimate his height. How estimate? Ayad asked, edging closer. There are tables of proportions. I can show you some day, if you like. You say his... How do you know that? But you knew that. She gave him a comradely smile, as one professional to another. From the clothing, scraps of European-style trousers and coat and waistcoat, we were told. Yes, they are in that box. But there are other ways? From the bones themselves? She gave him a little lecture, to which he listened attentively, his head close to hers. The skull also indicates a male, she finished. You see these ridges of bone over the eye sockets? In most women, they are not so prominent, and the angle of the jaw is more rounded. Age? I unwrapped. Not a boy, not an old man. That's just an educated guess. Based primarily on the teeth, the four back molars have erupted and show signs of moderate wear. I can't tell you much more. The damned jackals haven't left me enough to work on. She had spoken English, and he had replied in the same language, so absorbed that he spoke to her as directly as he would have addressed a man. I sympathize with the desire of any person to improve his understanding, but time was getting on, and Emerson was beginning to fidget. Enough to determine his identity, I said, forestalling another question from Ayad. It is Martinelli. Look at his teeth. Stained brown and yellowish-green, the chipped lower incisors bared by the fleshless lips, they grinned up at us. The scraps of the clothing confirmed my identification. The faded shepherd's plaid was the same pattern as that of the trousers Martinelli had worn the night he disappeared. The only other objects in the box were a few buttons and metal fasteners from various articles of dress. His ostentatious stickpin and his pocket watch and chain were not there. Needless to say, neither were the gold bracelets and the pectoral. Sethos stepped in to relieve us of the problem of what to do with the bones. Declaring himself to be an acquaintance of the dead man, he manfully struggled to conceal his shock and distress at the bad news. How often have I warned him of the dangers of those long, solitary walks of his? He murmured, passing a clean white handkerchief over his eyes. His heart was weak. He must have collapsed and died, out there in the waste, under the cold, uncaring moon. And it would not be long before... He shuddered. He is at peace now. I was tempted to give him a hard poke with my parasol, but he prudently stayed at a distance. After promising to collect the bones and notify the proper authorities, we left the office. Zaptia Square was an ecumenical area, with a mosque and a Roman Catholic church and two modern hotels as well as the police station. Pretty gardens filled the centre. The colour and scent of the blossoms were especially refreshing after the sight we'd seen. This certainly puts a new complexion on things, I remarked. Martinelli never left Luxor. He must have been killed the same night he disappeared. You don't know that it was murder, Emerson muttered. He knew my conclusion was correct. He just didn't want to admit it. A man of his sort was not in the habit of taking long, solitary walks, I retorted. Some individual took him out there, by force or by guile, and left him dead. In my opinion, that is a strong presumption of murder. As for his weak heart, you invented that, didn't you? My brother-in-law met my gaze with a shrug and a smile. There was no need to confuse the issue. So far as the authorities are concerned, it was a sad accident. How did he die, Nefret? She started slightly when he addressed her, and turned troubled blue eyes toward him. You don't miss much. You have a very unguarded, expressive face, my dear. Something about the neck bones, wasn't it? There was some damage. I couldn't swear to it under oath. But he might have been strangled. Or, she added sourly, 
He might have had his head bashed in. Impossible to tell whether the breaks were post or pre-mortem, or been fed poison or stabbed or shot. I took her hand and patted it. Shall we stop at the Savoy for a nice cup of tea? Good God, no! Emerson increased his pace. I've work to do. Cyrus will have to be informed. I'll leave that to you, Peabody. If theft was the motive for his murder, I began. What other motive could there be? Emerson demanded. The fellaheen who found the remains would have taken anything of value, but it is much more likely that he was robbed by someone to whom he had been fool enough to display the jewellery while he was swanking round in the cafes and bars. The value of the prize was fabulous enough to move even a cautious Luxor thief to murder. The portmanteau he carried is probably at the bottom of the river, filled with stones. That's how I would have disposed of it, Emerson concluded. He took me firmly by the arm and hurried me on past the shops that lined the esplanade. His obvious disinclination to continue the discussion did not prevent me from speculating. His theory, ours, I should say, was probably correct. But then what had become of the princess's jewels? Were they still in the house of the thief, in a secret hidey-hole, like the one old Abid el Hamid had excavated under the floor of his house? Had they been sold to one of the Luxor dealers? The latter seemed to me unlikely. The jewellery was distinctive, its ownership and origin well known. Were it to be offered to a buyer, we would hear of it sooner or later, and Emerson would come down on the unlucky dealer like a thunderbolt. Perhaps our original theory had been the right one. The treasure had been taken to Cairo, though obviously not by Martinelli. Later that afternoon, I sat alone on the veranda, awaiting the arrival of Sethos and his daughter. I was grateful for an interlude of reflection. Shortly, the entire family, a quel famille, would be upon me. And although I seldom have any difficulty keeping track of a plethora of problems, I found myself unable to concentrate. My thoughts fluttered as randomly as a butterfly, from one thought to the next, some important, some utterly inconsequential. What to wear to the Fantasia certainly fell into the second category, and so did the dinner menu, which I had already settled with Fatima, and the ostracon I had found that afternoon, another part of the one that had caused Ramsay such embarrassment. The disposition of the lower limbs in this bit was really quite astonishing, but Ramsay's had refused to discuss the matter with me. With an effort, I forced myself to fix my thoughts on more important matters. I hadn't had the opportunity to tell Cyrus about Martinelli. I was in no hurry to see the Vandergelts, since we had yet to decide what to tell Cyrus about Sethos. All three of them knew of his relationship to Emerson. Selim was the only other person in Luxor who knew, but Selim was unaware that the drab companion was Sethos's daughter. Nor was he. My head was aching. It was Emerson's fault for dragging me back to the dig before I could pin my elusive brother-in-law down. We had left him in Luxor, where, as he explained, he hoped to acquire a few basic necessities before collecting his daughter. They were to come directly to us, and I had expected them before this. Matters might not be so easily settled as Sethos had assumed. Mrs. Fitzroyce might reasonably make a fuss, and Justin was almost certain to do so. Emerson was the first to join me. "'Where is everybody?' he demanded. "'They'll be here soon, I expect. All of them.' "'They were. All of them except Sethos and Mariam. "'The children began clamouring for tea, so I told Fatima to serve. "'Shouldn't we wait for our guests?' inquired Senia. "'My poor head gave a great throb. "'I'd forgotten about Senia, bright as a new penny and as quisitive as the elephant's child.' How much had I told her? How much should I tell her? She had met Mariam when Mariam was Molly. She had encountered Sethos, not as Major Hamilton, but as Cousin Ismael. I gave it up. How do you know we're expecting guests? I inquired feebly. Senia was a trifle vain and always insisted on dressing in her best for tea. She smoothed her ruffled skirt and rolled her eyes. Fatima told me. Who are they? Is one of them Mr. Badger from the aeroplane? It is a surprise, I said, since I hadn't the least idea what Sethos would look like or what he would call himself. Surely she wouldn't remember or recognize Cousin Ismail. Knowing Sethos's penchant for dramatic epiphanies, the aeroplane was certainly the most impressive to date. 
I might have expected he would wait until he had a large audience before he presented himself. We saw the carriage coming some distance away. It was the best of those for hire at the landing. It drew up with a flourish in front of the house, and Sethos got out. Then he swooped like a hawk on Davy, who was scuttling as fast as his fat legs could carry him toward the motor car. The child was absolutely uncanny. I had just that moment opened the door. Sethos held the little boy up so that their eyes were on a level. And who is this adventurous young man? he inquired. Davy giggled. The little rascal had got us over the first awkwardness. Sethos handed Davy over to Ramses and helped Mariam out of the carriage. While the rest of us fended off the other children, they immediately gathered round Sethos. Davy was captivated by his new acquaintance, and the little girls responded as all females did to his calculated charm. What happened to your face? inquired Evie, leaning against his knee. Did someone hit you? Three someones, said Sethos, without missing a beat. Three large, cruel men. They were about to hurt a poor cat. I made them stop. The twins chirped approvingly, and Evie batted her lashes at him. Where is the kitty? At my house. I am calling her Florence. She has black stripes and a white front. That was very noble of you, sir, said Dolly. Sethos's face softened a trifle as he looked at the little boy. You must be young Abdullah. I knew your great-grandfather well. He would have done the same. Uh, why don't you all draw a picture of Florence? I suggested, glaring at my inventive brother-in-law. Abdullah had hated cats. The pack dispersed, except for Senia. Was that a true story? she asked, fixing Sethos with a questioning stare. Not a word of it, said Sethos promptly. Senia chortled. You are funny. Who are you, really? Are you her father? I remember her. She was here a long time ago. She gestured at Mariam, who was sitting next to Evelyn. The girl was wearing the hat I had given her and a new frock. The best Luxor had to offer, one must assume, of pink mousseline de soie. Papa had taken her shopping. Why don't you go and introduce yourself, I suggested. General conversation was impossible with so large a group. It did not take Sethos long to manoeuvre himself into a tete-a-tete -tete with me, while Mariam responded shyly to Evelyn's kindly questions, and the children set to work on innumerable drawings of presumed felines. The tete-a-tete -tete was immediately expanded by Emerson, who squeezed himself onto the settee next to me and fixed stern sapphirine orbs upon Sethos. You're awaiting my report, I suppose, the latter said. I'm awaiting elucidation of precisely who everyone in Luxor believes you to be, I replied. What did you tell Mrs. Fitzroy? I didn't meet her. Sethos leaned back and crossed one leg over the other. Two husky lads intercepted me at the head of the gangplank. When I handed over my card, I was informed that the sit was resting, but that the other lady was expecting me. I wasn't allowed onto the boat. Mariam appeared with her pathetic little bundles, and we left. Then you did not meet Justin. I caught a glimpse of him, peering out from the doorway to the cabins. At least I assume it was he. He appeared as wary as a timid animal, so I pretended I hadn't seen him. What car did you leave? I asked. That of Major Hamilton, of course. I always carry a selection. Ha! said Emerson. The Vandergelts know your real identity. I suppose there is no way of avoiding them, Sethos said with a martyred sigh. I don't see how you can be ready to leave Luxor for a few more days, I said. The Vandergelts are giving a soiree on Sunday, and Selim will expect you to turn up for his fantasia tomorrow. Sethos groaned theatrically. Must I? You sound like Emerson, I said, wondering if he was doing it on purpose to annoy. It would be advisable to give the impression that this is an ordinary visit from an old acquaintance. Your habit of popping in and out in various bizarre costumes, like the demon king in a pantomime, makes things very difficult. But much more interesting, Amelia dear. 
We lingered over Fatima's excellent dinner, for everyone was on his or her best behaviour, and Sethos exerted himself to be agreeable. I was about to suggest we withdraw to the parlour when a visitor was announced. I'd been half expecting him, for nothing is a secret in Luxor. Show Mr. Vandergelt into the parlour, I said to Gargery, and make sure there is plenty of whisky. Cyrus was too much of a gentleman to forget apologies and greetings, but even these held an element of reproach. I figured the fella in the aeroplane was you, he said, shaking Sethos's hand. I'd have called earlier if anybody'd bothered to tell me you were here. What are you going to do next? Ride in on an elephant? Whiskey, Cyrus, I inquired. I reckon. Thank you. He tugged fretfully at his goatee and turned reproachful eyes on me. How come I have to hear all the news secondhand? Don't you folks trust me any more? Um, <clears throat> said Emerson, busy with the decanters. Um, the fact is, um, there hasn't been time. Nefret said. She perched on a hassock beside Cyrus and put a caressing hand over his. You've heard about the identification of the bones? Don't be angry, Cyrus, dear. We would have notified you at once if we'd found the princess's jewels. You think I'm pretty selfish, I guess, Cyrus muttered. That poor devil, out there all this time, and me thinking the worst of him. This discovery alters neither the circumstances nor your assessment of Martinelli, Cyrus, I said. He took the jewellery, there can be little question of that, and although we may never know his motive for doing so, he had no right to remove it without your permission. You sure it was him? Where was he found? If you're thinking of conducting a search of the area, I beg you will abandon the idea, Ramsay said. Like myself, he had seen the stubborn glow of archaeological greed in Cyrus's eyes. Believe me, Cyrus, I'd have done so myself if I believed there was the least likelihood of finding the jewellery. It was Martinelli, all right, but if he wasn't murdered and robbed, the men who found the body would have taken anything of value. Cyrus knew he was right, but he was not the man to abandon hope so easily. He kept asking questions and proposing theories. His final appeal was to Sethos. Can't you do anything? The corners of Sethos's mouth twitched slightly. Not much use having a master thief as a friend of the family if he can't help out, eh? I didn't mean, uh, Cyrus began. Of course you did. Quite right, too. I will make further inquiries, but don't get your hopes up. Sure appreciate it, Cyrus said, his hopes obviously rising. Well, I'd better get on home. Sorry for busting in on you like this. He had avoided looking directly at Mariam. Now he went to her and held out his hand. Good to have you back in the family, young lady. We'll see you at our soiree on Sunday, I hope. His tact and kindness brought a becoming flush to her cheeks. Thank you, sir. I don't know. She glanced at her father, who said easily, We accept with pleasure. Please convey my thanks and regards to Mrs. Vandergelt. I look forward to seeing her and her son again. Oh, say, that reminds me. Hat in hand, Cyrus turned to me. Catherine told me to ask whether some of you folks might want to stay with us at the castle. We got plenty of room, and you must be getting a mite crowded here. Such was certainly the case. I had had to move Senia out of her pleasant little suite of rooms and give them to David and Leah and their children. She was in David's old room, with the one next to it serving as a schoolroom. Evelyn and Walter occupied the guest rooms at the other house. What with additional offices and storage rooms, both houses were full up, and I'd been forced to ask Senia to share her schoolroom with Mariam an arrangement that did not please Senia. I would have consigned the Luxor gossips to the devil and sent Mariam to stay with her father on the Amelia, but she needed a little more time to be comfortable with him. Besides, I wanted her with me, where I could keep an eye on her. The girl had been attacked once already, and that incident had yet to be explained. I was tempted to send Senia to the castle, along with Basima and Gargery, whose constant surveillance was beginning to get on my nerves. However, Horus would have had to accompany them, and he had no manners, particularly with regard to the Vandergelt's cat, Sekhmet. I was about to tell Cyrus I would think it over and let him know when Evelyn spoke up. That is very good of Catherine, Cyrus. If you are sure, Walter and I will take advantage of your kind offer. I'll speak to Catherine about it tomorrow. 
Evelyn was the mildest and most accommodating of women. But when she spoke in that decisive tone, I never attempted to differ with her. I waited until after Cyrus had left us, before venturing to ask what had prompted her decision. Having house guests for a protracted period becomes inconvenient, was her smiling reply. Ramses and Fred would never say so, but I'm sure we're putting them out. Catherine and I enjoy each other's company. She has been feeling a bit neglected, I think. Ramses leaned over the back of the sofa and put his arm round her shoulders. You needn't be so tactful, Aunt Evelyn. Being in the same house with my children is enough to drive anyone into a nervous collapse. He was laughing, and she laughed too, as she looked up at him. He was standing between her and Mariam. The girl shifted position slightly. Very well, I said. It will be a nice rest for you, Evelyn, being away from the little darlings for a while. The accommodations at the castle are quite luxurious, and you will be waited upon like a queen. Somewhat belatedly, it occurred to me to ask Walter what he thought about the scheme. The little darlings had not bothered him, since he was deaf and blind to all distractions while he was working. Nudged by his wife, he said absently, "'Certainly, my dear, whatever you say, I will take the papyrus with me. "'It is proving to be most interesting.' "'I'm afraid it is my fault that you're all being put to so much trouble,' Mariam murmured. "'Not at all,' I said. "'This will work out nicely for everyone. "'You can move into the other house tomorrow. "'I expect you're tired. "'Come along, and I'll show you where you are to sleep tonight.' The schoolroom, no longer to be referred to as the day nursery, was not directly connected to Senia's bedroom, not to be referred to as the night nursery. The doors of both rooms opened onto the courtyard behind the house. A cot had been moved in, and Fatima had made certain all was neat and tidy. But I hadn't realised how shabby the room looked. The calico curtains, moving gently in the night breeze, were threadbare, and the tiled floor bore certain indelible stains ink and paint, and the evidence of feline visitation. "'I'm afraid it isn't very elegant,' I said, apologetically, "'but it is only for one night.' She said something under her breath, something about no better than I deserve. "'Since I believe in striking when the iron is hot, "'I decided to take the bull by the horns.' I motioned her to sit down. "'I've been wanting to talk to you about your mother, Mariam. She was an unfortunate woman who behaved very badly and who died violently, but not at our hands or at those of your father. She gasped as sharply as if I'd struck her and looked up into my face. You don't believe in beating about the bush, do you? There is no sense in that. I don't know what you've heard about her, but I intend to set the record straight and remind you that you are in no way accountable for any of her actions. My father wasn't present when she... when she died? No. Shall I tell you what really happened that day? She nodded, her eyes wide. Her... association with your father followed other associations of a similar nature... I said. I am giving you the bare facts, Mariam, without attempting to explain or excuse them, though you must bear in mind that she had no chance at a better life. That is tragically true of many women, but Bertha was not the sort to submit meekly. She formed a criminal organization of women and was, in a somewhat unorthodox way, a supporter of women's rights. She came to dislike me because she believed um, that my father was in love with you. "'In essence, that is correct,' I said, with a little cough. "'Such is no longer the case, if it ever was, "'but jealousy drove her on several occasions to try to kill me. "'The final attempt occurred on the day of which I am speaking. "'She had taken me prisoner the previous afternoon. "'Thanks to your father, I was able to escape, "'but when I came out of the house of my friend Abdullah, "'where I had found refuge the night before,' She was lying in wait for me. I was saved by Abdullah, who threw himself in front of me and took in his own body the bullets meant for me. Several of the men who were present, friends of ours and of Abdullah, had to wrestle her to the ground in order to get the gun away from her. 
I do not know, I doubt anyone knows, who actually struck the fatal blow. My full attention was on Abdallah, who lay dying in my arms. They did not set out to kill her, Mariam. They were mad with anger and grief, and she would have gone on shooting if they hadn't prevented her. Abdallah, she repeated, little Dolly's great-grandfather, Selim's father, and the grandfather of David. You all loved him very much, didn't you? Her composure worried me. It was unnatural. Yes, we did. They were present, Selim and David. Why, yes, so were... Uh, See here, Mariam, if you suspect Selim or David of striking the fatal blow, that's not what I meant. Good gad! I exclaimed in horror as her meaning dawned on me. Are you suggesting that one of them, one of us, blames you for your mother's actions and wants revenge? That one of them, one of us, hired an assassin to attack you? Nonsense, child. Aside from the fact that none of us would perpetrate such an act, your true identity was unknown to us until after the event. Get it out of your head this instant. The curtains flapped violently. Mariam let out a little scream, and I let out a muffled swear word as a portly form climbed laboriously through the window. Once, Horus had been able to leap through it. Age and weight had taken their toll. Now he had to scale the wall. Poised awkwardly on the sill, he looked round the room, spat, and vanished into the night. He was looking for Senia, I explained. I hope you're not frightened of cats. I like them very much. I never had one. Don't waste your time trying to make friends with Horus. He detests all of us except Senia and Nefret. He won't bother you again tonight. Can you sleep now? Yes. Impulsively, she put her hand on mine. Thank you. You have cleansed my mind of some very ugly thoughts. It was a pretty gesture and a pretty little speech. You do believe me, then? I asked. It is a sad story, but we must not judge others or feel guilt for their actions. Each of us has enough on our consciences without taking on the guilt of others. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson's hopes of resuming his full work schedule were doomed from the start. Only he, as his wife acerbically remarked, would have trotted blithely off to Deir el Medina when so many duties, domestic and investigative, took precedence. Immediately after breakfast, she intended to help Evelyn and Walter pack for their removal to the castle and arrange for Mariam to move into their rooms. Leah was ordered, it was couched as a request, but no one doubted it was an order, to go through her wardrobe to see if she could find something for Mariam to wear. A long monologue to which Ramses listened with only half an ear explained her reasons, something about relative sizes and the absence of practical garments in the girl's wardrobe. At the last minute, Nefret received an urgent summons to the clinic. The word of its opening had spread, and her services were increasingly in demand. Emerson listened open-mouthed to this ruthless depletion of his workforce. "'Curse it!' he exclaimed. "'The fill is piling up, Peabody. How long is it going to take you to pack a few clothes? "'You know nothing about it, Emerson, so kindly refrain from putting your oar in.' Obviously pleased with this bit of slang, she added, in a more amiable voice, "'I'll be along later, perhaps. You can have Ramses and David, if you like.' "'Good of you,' muttered Emerson. Let's go, boys. Half the morning is gone. It was just after 7 a.m. Despite Emerson's complaints, they had managed to make some progress in deciphering the plans of the various shrines north of the village and the Ptolemaic Temple. Some were better preserved than others, but all had been damaged by time and amateur diggers, and it required skill and experience to untangle the original plan. Bertie, the best draftsman of the group, had been faithful in his attendance. He arrived soon after they did, apologising for his tardiness, and produced the latest of the plans he'd been working on for over a week. Ha! Ah, said Emerson, studying it. Yes, that seems to be acceptable, so far as it goes. I want to identify the deity to whom this structure was dedicated. He took out his pipe and stabbed at the incomplete outline of what appeared to be a smallish chapel.
It was, in Ramsay's opinion, a futile task. The little private shrines had not been constructed of stone, but of mud brick, plastered and painted. By now, the plaster had flaked off and disintegrated. They hadn't found a flake larger than a thumbnail. He took the liberty of pointing this out to his father. A votive stealer, said Emerson dogmatically. That's all we need. Even an ostracon inscribed with a prayer. Something may yet turn up in the area we haven't finished clearing. Anyhow, the plan isn't complete. Where's the back wall? Selim! Selim hadn't been listening. His head thrown back, he was staring at the brightening blue of the sky with a bemused expression. Looking for another aeroplane, Ramses thought, with inner amusement. Emerson had to call him twice before he responded. Emerson's luck was proverbial. They found his votive stealer, or part of it, dedicated by the workman Nachtmen to the deified king Amenhotep I and his mother Armosa Nefertari. Emerson carried it off in triumph to the shelter while Selim's crew went on clearing the sanctuary. "'Where the devil is your mother?' Emerson demanded, delicately brushing encrusted sand from the brief inscription. "'The rubble is piling up!' She arrived a little before midday, bringing the hamper of food Emerson had forgotten and accompanied by Leah and Sethos. Emerson hurried to meet them. "'The rubble!' he began. "'Yes, Emerson, I know. You may as well stop for luncheon now. "'As you see, we have a guest.' "'Ha!' said Emerson, studying his brother's elegant tailoring and spotless pith helmet. "'He can help you with—' "'Not today,' said Sethos amiably. "'I only came along to keep the ladies company and have a look around. "'There's not much here to interest an enthusiast,' he added with the disparaging survey of the monotonous greyish-brown foundations and scattering of stones. We have just found evidence that Amenhotep I and his mother were worshipped here, Emerson exclaimed, a stealer fragment. How exciting, Sethos drawled. If it had been a statue, you'd try to steal it, said Emerson, glowering. Your finds are safe from me, Sethos said, emphasising the pronoun. Emerson wisely decided not to pursue this. Where is everyone? he demanded. His wife began unpacking the hamper. Where I told you they would be, Emerson. Evelyn and Walter are settling in at the castle. The fret is tending to a patient, and the children are running wild as usual. I was under the impression that you meant to spend more time with them. The blow was expertly calculated. Emerson closed his mouth, rubbed his chin, and looked self-conscious. Never mind, never mind. He raised his voice to a shout that made everyone jump. Shalim! Rest period! Quarter of an hour! They were still eating when another rider approached. It was Cyrus Vandergelt, urging his reluctant mare to a trot and waving a large envelope. He dismounted with more haste than grace and ran toward them. Just got this from the call, he panted. It has to be a list of the objects he wants. Look at the thickness of the envelope! I came here for moral support. Didn't have the nerve to open it. Get a grip on yourself, man, said Emerson, taking the envelope from him and ripping it open. The sheaf of papers inside was indeed depressingly thick. Emerson scanned the pages. He wants the coffins and the mummies. Well, we expected that. Robe Martinelli restored, the storage chests with the rest of the clothing, the canopic jars. All of them? Cyrus cried in anguish. Hmm, said Emerson in acknowledgement. Concluding that it would take less time to read out the objects Lacour did not want, he proceeded to do so. Half the Ushebtis, his choice naturally, three small uninscribed cosmetic jars, an ivory headrest. Everyone waited with bated breath until he finished. Two beaded bracelets and two rings. Cyrus groaned and dropped onto a stone column base. Rotten luck, Cyrus, Ramsay said sympathetically, while his mother patted the afflicted American's bowed shoulder. He says he's being excessively generous, Emerson reported, after reading the enclosed letter. By rights, the museum ought to keep everything, except for Teddy Sherry. This is the only royal burial that has been found, and the museum has few pieces from this period. It's a reburial, though, Bertie said. Doesn't that change the terms? Lacour defines the terms. 
He requests that we begin packing the objects. He is sending a government steamer for them. Why not ship them by train? Bertie asked. Too rough a ride, Ramses replied. They'll be jostled less than the hold of a boat. When will the steamer arrive? He doesn't say. Let him send his damned steamer, said Emerson through his teeth. He can sit here twiddling his thumbs until we've finished the job, which we will do at our leisure. No, Cyrus rose slowly to his feet. What's the use? May as well get it over with. The sooner the better. I can count on your help, I know, Amelia. I commend your fortitude, Cyrus, she said. We will all help, of course. Emerson's black brows drew together. Now she here, Peabody. No one expects you to assist in such menial tasks, she informed him. It is woman's work as usual. At least this will be one thing off our minds. I believe we still have the packing materials we used when we transported the objects to the castle. I will begin tomorrow morning with Leah and Evelyn and Nefret, unless she has a patient. You've got it all worked out, David said with a smile, while Emerson mumbled discontentedly. What about me, Aunt Amelia? I'm fairly good at this sort of woman's work. Yes, my dear, you are. Very well. Ten here, too. Under supervision, she can handle the less fragile objects. And Mariam, if she's willing. Come back to the castle with me now, Amelia, Cyrus begged. We can make a start, anyhow. I have another appointment this afternoon, Cyrus. There is the little matter of the bones of Martinelli. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 9 We have to do something with him, I pointed out, after Emerson had run out of expletives. It would be indecent to leave him lying round the police station. I asked Father Benedict to make the arrangements and to meet us at the cemetery this afternoon. Since Martinelli was Italian, I assume he was of the Roman Catholic faith. I doubt he believed in anything beyond his own gratification, Sethos murmured. He may have repented at the end... I said firmly. We must give him the benefit of the doubt. The rest of you need not attend, but I feel obliged to be present. I don't know how you do it, Aunt Amelia, Leah said, shaking her curly head. I admire your energy and goodwill, but I think I'll beg off. I suppose I ought to be there, Cyrus said. Should have made the arrangements myself. The only other volunteer was Sethos. At the last minute, Cyrus, guided by a few gentle hints from me, decided he was not obliged to pay his last respects to the man who had robbed him so callously. He had only offered because he did not want me to go alone. You keep an eye on her, he said to Sethos, and don't let her dash off on some private expedition. She does that. Why else would I go? Sethos inquired, rhetorically. The small Christian cemetery on the road to Karnak was somewhat more seemly than it had been when I attended my last funeral there. Distressed by the neglected graves and the feral animals who made it their home, I had formed a committee. My friend Marjorie, who headed it, had done her best to improve matters. The graves were clear of weeds and the headstones were straight. Not much could be done about the animals. If driven off, they returned as soon as the guards departed. One had to watch out for droppings and gnawed bones. It was a dismal place, despite, or because of, the wilting flowers on the graves of those who had friends or kin in Luxor. Flowers did not last long in the heat. The shade of my parasol was welcome. It was black, not for mourning, but for practicality. The parasol was one of the heavier ones. The good father awaited us, his bald head bared to the bitter sunlight. He did his best, but he could not do much except repeat the formal prayers. Afterward, Sethos, who hadn't spoken except to acknowledge a distant acquaintance with the dead man, took out a handful of money. "'I beg you will add to your kindness by saying a few masses for his soul,' he said. Not until we had turned away, followed by the dismal drumbeat of soil landing on the simple coffin— did he add, if anyone is in need of them, it's Martinelli. 
I did not respond. I was thinking of certain other graves in that cemetery. Reminders of several of our earlier encounters with crime. Poor young Alan Armadale and Lucinda Bellingham. I had been unable to save them, but I had avenged them. With a certain amount of assistance, in the latter case, from Ramses, there was another such burial, and when Sethos would have headed for the entrance, I took his arm and led him back to the far end of the cemetery. A feral dog sprawled across the untended grave, rose as we approached, and backed off snarling. It was a female, heavy with young. Fitting, said Sethos. Why did you bring me here, Amelia? You've never visited her grave? The arm I held was rigid. Once. I'd wanted to convince myself she was really dead. I suppose it was you who erected the headstone. Only her name? Couldn't you think of a fitting epitaph? There is one. I knelt and pushed the dusty weeds away from the base of the stone. Under her name were the carved words, May she rest in peace. Oh, God. He pulled me roughly to my feet and put his arms round me. You are unbelievable, Amelia. She tried to kill you and murdered one of your dearest friends. How can you forgive that? It was a brother's embrace, not that of a lover, but I detached myself as gently and quickly as I could. Bertha would not have made the distinction, and although I do not share the ancient Egyptian belief that the soul lingers near the mortal remains, I preferred not to take the chance. Our Christian duty requires us to forgive those who have injured us, I said. It is easier to do that, I admit, when the individual in question is deceased. He let out a choked laugh and passed his hand over his mouth. Does Mariam know her mother lies here? I've no idea. Will you tell her? No. no I don't know. Damnation, Amelia, don't you ever weary of prodding people's consciences? I can forgive Bertha for what she did to me. I assure you, you don't know the half of it. But not for what she did to you and to Mariam. May, may we go now, or have you more to say? Not to you. I took his arm, and we turned our backs on the desolate grave. I believe I will have a few words with Mariam. He kicked at a clump of weeds. Do you believe she is responsible for the accidents that have plagued you? The possibility had, of course, occurred to me after the affair of the veiled Hathor, I said, fudging the truth just a little. Mariam hadn't been on my original list. She was one of a number of females who might have believed herself badly treated by Ramses. Good Lord. Sethos came to an abrupt halt. You never told me. Must I call Ramses out for seducing my daughter? You can hardly suppose Ramses would take advantage of a fourteen-year-old girl, I exclaimed indignantly. She made the advances to him. I shouldn't have to tell you that he behaved impeccably. No, he's a gentleman. Sethos agreed, with a cynical twist of the lips. Well, that is most interesting. But it isn't as strong a motive as seeking revenge for her mother's death. I've already discussed that with her, and I believe I am safe in asserting that she has reached, or is on the way to reaching, a proper understanding. Moreover, it would have been impossible for a girl that age to carry out such a complex scheme— she certainly could not have been Hathor, since the most recent appearance of that lady occurred when Mariam was with Ramses, and Mrs. Fitzroyce told me she was here in Luxor when Hathor made her first appearance. The carriage we had hired was waiting for us on the road. I accepted the hand he offered to help me in. In my opinion, it is not a betrayal of one's feminist principles to accept such gestures graciously. We will discuss this later, I went on, as the carriage rattled into motion, with everyone present. It is time for a council of war. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson sent the men home earlier than usual that afternoon. His wife hadn't returned, nor had Nefret turned up. Ramses went at once to the clinic. There were two people in the waiting room, a very pregnant girl of about fourteen, and a child racked with an incessant dry cough. 
Nizreen was with them, looking very professional in a tightly wound white headcloth and a man's galabilla that had been shortened at the hem and the sleeves. Nurmisur is very busy, but I will let you go in, she announced. Kind of you, Ramsay said, and went through into the surgery. To his surprise, the patient was Dawood. He gave Ramses a sheepish smile, and Khadija, standing over him with folded arms, said, Marhaba, Ramses, tell this stubborn man to show Nurmisur his hand. I had to make him come to her. Finding himself outnumbered, Dawood obeyed. It needs to be stitched, Nefret said, inspecting the ugly gashes that ran across his large palm and the insides of his fingers. How on earth did you do this? Dawood mumbled something. Khadija said, Someone left a hegab, a charm, lying in front of the house, and Dawood, fool that he is, picked it up. It was a fine hegab, Dawood protested, large and silver with red stones. I would have asked who had lost it, but when I closed my hand over it, it cut me. What did you do with it? Nefret asked. I buried it, Khadija said. It was a holy thing, but broken, sharp as a razor along two sides. Nefret selected an instrument and bent closer. It's a good thing you did. There's something metallic deep in the wound. Hang on, Dowd. She exchanged the probe for tweezers, and before long she had it out. A needle-like bit of metal, half an inch long. Good heavens, Dowd, this must have hurt badly. Why didn't you come to me straight away? I put the ointment on it, Dowd said defensively. That was obvious. His palm was green. That probably prevented an infection, the fret said with a nod at Khadija. Well, now we know why the owner discarded it. Let me make sure there are no other broken pieces embedded. Dawood sat like a large brown statue while she cleaned the cuts and put several neat stitches into them before bandaging his hand. Change the dressing every day, she said to Khadija, giving her a box of bandages. I don't have to tell you what to watch out for. No, no, Monsieur, thank you. How does it feel to be back in harness? Ramses asked, as Nefret cleaned her instruments and put them away. Wonderful. I should have done this ages ago. Nizreen, show in the next patient, please. Have you been at this all day? he asked. Can I help? No, thank you. If you want to do something useful, go and play with the children. That puts me in my place, Ramses thought. Baby tender. The children were gathered in the courtyard. His advent was greeted with cries of relief from the adults who were present, and cries of welcome from his daughter, who ran to him holding out her arms. He picked her up. She jabbered impetitively at him, her black eyes bright and demanding. Mama has been busy with a poor sick man, he said, assuming that was what she wanted to know. Apparently that was only part of it. She tugged at his shirt and dug her knees into his midriff. He had learned to interpret that gesture. He helped her climb up onto his shoulders. High time you got here, said Leah. As usual, you men left us to do the hard work. Not me, David protested. He was on his hands and knees, giving Evie a ride. Everybody but you, Leah said. The women looked as if they had had a hard time. Leah's hair was in wild disorder, and Evelyn was leaning against the back of the sofa, her eyes half-closed. Senia was conspicuous by her absence. He couldn't blame her. It wasn't fair to expect her to play nursemaid. Mariam had been pressed into service, though. She seemed to have suffered less than the others, perhaps because she had concentrated her attention on Dolly. He sat close beside her, her arm round him. She looked up from the storybook from which she'd been reading and smiled at Ramses. Where is everyone? he asked. Catherine was here for lunch, his aunt replied in a faint voice. She helped entertain them for a while, but she finally gave out. Walter's playing with his papyrus. Your mother is attending a funeral, and so is Sethos. I presume your father is still at his cursed dig. An undeserved denunciation, said Emerson, coming out of the house. I'm shocked to hear you use such language, my dear Evelyn. He made sure the door was firmly shut before he turned to meet the assault of the children. Charla was among them. She repelled herself to the ground as soon as her grandfather appeared. "'Have you had a good time?' he inquired. Evelyn said carefully, "'The children have been very active. Very.' "'They do seem a trifle restless,' 
Emerson conceded, gazing benevolently at the twins, who were clutching at his legs while Evie tried to pull Charlotte away. You've kept them cooped up too long. Young children need to run about and be kept busy. Emerson never needed as much rest as a normal person. His blue eyes were unshadowed and his smile broad and cheerful. He seemed to be unaware of the fact that several hostile looks were focused on him. Thank you for pointing that out to us, Emerson, said his sister-in-law, snapping the words out. No doubt you have a suggestion. Hmm, what do you say to a nice donkey ride? The shouts of approval of the children were not echoed by the adults. This activity would demand as much effort as their earlier exhausting supervision. However, Emerson swept all before him, and the affair was underway when his wife and Sethos returned. "'High time you lent a hand,' said Emerson, addressing both of them. "'What took you so long?' "'I stopped by the clinic to see if Nefret needed my assistance,' his wife replied. Sethos's gaze had gone to his daughter, who was trotting along beside Evie, holding on to the child. Evie did not want to be held on to, and said so, at length. Mariam laughed. Don't go so fast, then. I'll not hold you if you let the poor donkey slow down to a walk. She seemed to be having as much fun as the children, and Sethos's hard mouth curved slightly as he watched. The donkeys were the first ones to show signs of disaffection. Enough! Emerson declared, lifting Davy off his steed. It had come to a complete standstill and refused to move. Run along and have a little rest before tea, eh? They won't, but I intend to, Leah declared. David? I promised Maria a riding lesson, David said. She's been wonderful with Dolly. He's a dear little boy, Mariam said, blushing prettily at his praise. Reading to him is such a pleasure. He listens so intently and asks intelligent questions. I don't deserve to be rewarded, and you must be tired and... Her smooth cheeks turned pinker. To be honest, I'm... A little afraid of horses. All the more reason to become accustomed to them, said her father. Don't you agree, Amelia? By all means, was the brisk reply. Our horses are perfectly gentle and well-trained. I'll give her a lesson if you'd rather, David, Ramses said. You've been with the little dears longer than I. David grinned and ran his fingers through his dishevelled curls. Evie had used his hair as reins. I won't refuse. You're a better rider than I am, anyhow. She can take us for. I haven't the right clothes, Mariam demurred. Don't let them bully you into riding if you'd rather not, Leah said pleasantly. But you are welcome to borrow one of my outfits. I don't know what to do about boots. Your feet are so tiny. Perhaps Senia's would fit you. Ramses stopped by the kitchen and then went to the stable, where he found his father and Sethos inspecting the horses. They are superb creatures said the latter. Would you consider selling one? To you? Emerson asked suspiciously. What for? So I can ride it, his brother explained. Before Emerson could think of a sufficiently withering response, the girls joined them. From pith helmet to boots, Senia's, Ramses presumed, Mariam was properly attired and looking very pretty. However, she was not pleased with us for "'It's so big,' she said, stepping back, as David's mare turned mild eyes toward her. "'Isn't there a littler one?' Emerson, who had gone with them to the stable, made soothing noises and looked as if he wanted to pat her on the head. Even Sethos's smile lacked its usual touch of cynicism. "'Arabians are smaller than most breeds,' Ramses explained, "'and us four wouldn't bolt if you lit a fire under her. "'What about this one?' Mariam asked, moving down the line of stalls. It's very pretty. The filly, a granddaughter of the original pair, poked an inquiring nose over the bars. She was pure white, like the fabled unicorn, and like all the other Arabians, as friendly as a domestic cat. I don't know, Emerson said doubtfully. She's young and still a bit frisky. What about moonlight? Can't I have this one? Mariam let out a little giggle as the filly nuzzled her shirt front. She likes me. She's looking for a treat, Ramses said, handing her one of the sugar lumps he had got from the kitchen. 
It's all right, Father. I trained Melusine myself. She can use Nefret saddle. The stableman, who had watched with amused condescension, helped them saddle and bridle Risha, the filly, and Emerson's gelding for Sethos, who had decided to join the party. It was he who gave the girl a hand up and a few casual reminders. Loosen up on the reins and relax. She's accustomed to a light hand. Isn't that right, Ramses? They walked the horses up and down a few times and then took the road to Gournay. There were quite a few people about at that time of day, some on foot, some on donkeys or driving carts. Mariam let out a cry of alarm as a camel lumbered toward them, its long face set in the ineffable camel sneer. Keep the reins loose, Ramses instructed. She knows about camels. She'll go round it. You're doing fine. The camel having been successfully circumnavigated, Mariam relaxed. This is fun. Can we go faster? Not in this mob, Ramses said. The closer they got to Gurna, the more people they met. They obligingly moved aside, waving and calling out. Sethos had dropped behind. Suddenly, Mariam cried, Look, that man! She pointed. Before Ramses could identify the man she meant, the filly bolted. It took Ramses several seconds to gather his wits and go after them. Melusine had left the path, striking off to the left, across the open desert. She was in full gallop, but Risha had no difficulty in catching her up and keeping pace with her. A quick glance told Ramses Mariam had dropped the reins and was clinging to the pommel. He leaned sideways and caught her round the waist. "'Get your feet out of the stirrups!' he yelled. She had already lost them. He lifted her up and onto his saddle. Responding instantly to his touch, Risha slowed and stopped. The gelding thundered past. Having seen that his daughter was safe, Sethos went on in pursuit of the filly. "'You're hurting me,' said a faint voice. Ramses let out a long breath and loosened his tight grip. "'Sorry, I had to.' "'I know.' She leaned back against his shoulder and raised a face rosy with heat and smeared with dust. Her eyes were red-rimmed, but there were no tears. Thank you. Is the horse all right? Your father has her. Mariam, I'm terribly sorry. I can't imagine why she bolted. She never has before. I must tell you something. I never have a chance to talk with you alone. Feeling him stiffen, she went on in a rush of words. No, no, it's not what you think. I wanted to ask your forgiveness for the day I came to your room and tried to... A darker flush of colour ran up from her throat to her hairline. I embarrassed you and made a fool of myself. But I was only fourteen, and I n know now that... He tried to help her out. That I wasn't worth all that fuss. Oh, no, you're a wonderful man. Any woman would be proud... You're teasing me, aren't you? A little. It's forgotten, Mariam. Now that I've seen you and Fred together, I know you were meant for each other. The long lashes fell, half veiling those extraordinary hazel eyes. I'd like us to be friends. Cousins. Can we? We are. Sethos came up, leading the filly. All right, are you, Mariam? Yes, sir, thanks to Ramses. Yes, it was quite a spectacular performance, said Sethos. The smile was the one that always made Ramses want to hit him. She seems calm enough now, Ramses said, inspecting the filly. I can't imagine what spooked her. Sethos directed their attention to a trail of blood on Melusine's right flank. That's what, a sharp object piercing her side. Mariam's hand went to her mouth. The man... I saw him just before she ran away with me, the man who attacked me before. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Another incident to add to the list, I said. Our council of war had convened. I had insisted that everyone attend in case one of them could contribute information others had missed. Fatima sat uneasily on the edge of her chair. She would much rather have been trotting round offering food. The only one not present was Khadija. She would not have spoken up in company anyhow. 
So now we have an aborigine with a blowgun. Ramses was pacing irritably up and down, his hands clasped behind him. A projectile propelled by any one of a number of means, Sethos corrected. The object was sharp as a tack and it penetrated less than an inch. So what do we have? I took a refreshing sip of my whiskey and read the list aloud. One, the theft of the jewellery and the murder of Martinelli. Two, the veiled Hathor of Cairo. Three, the sinking of the boat. Four, the initial attack on Mariam. Five, the second appearance of Hathor. Six, the second attack on Mariam. It's not complete, Emerson said, chewing on his pipe. We agreed, did we not, to include every unusual incident, even if it seemed to have a logical explanation. Well done, Emerson, I said, with an approving nod. That is why I wanted everyone here, to make sure we had neglected no possibility. Give vent to your imaginations. Do not be deterred from the wildest sort of speculation. Anything at all, no matter how far-fetched it may seem. Once I had gotten them on track, the suggestions came thick and fast. The shot that had just missed Selim, Daud's wounding by the Hegab, the scorpions in his house, even the cobra at Deir el Medina. Goodness gracious, I remarked, examining the revised list. Either our imaginations have run away with us, or we've been singularly obtuse. I confess, however, that I fail to see a consistent pattern. Do you? David had taken out his pipe. Supposing we are correct in assuming that all these incidents are related, one thing stands out. The only ones who have been physically attacked are Daud, Selim, and Mariam. How extraordinary, I exclaimed. As a rule, such attacks are directed at us. Of course, we are affected by danger to any of those we love. A reader, are you familiar with the sensation of trying to capture an elusive thought? An idea that hovers just on the edge of awareness? I feel certain you are. I was attempting to pin the thing down when Emerson spoke. It's a blow, isn't it, Peabody? Your favourite method of catching criminals is to provoke them into attacking you. They've all got off scot-free in this affair. Even the veiled Hathor only wanted, um, that is to say... Um, but what can be the connection between Mariam Daud and Selim? Ramses, glancing self-consciously at his wife, was quick to change the subject. I confess I cannot find a common denominator, I admitted. The vagrant thought had escaped back into the murky depths of the subconscious. I did not attempt to pursue it. Let's try another method. What do we know about the enemy? He has access to a rifle, and he's a good shot, Ramses said. That suggests a man, but the veiled Hathor was obviously a woman. I fear it's another dead end, Mother. There may be a number of people involved. A gang, I murmured. How annoying. I much prefer dealing with individual criminals. How can you all speak so coolly? Mariam's eyes moved from one of us to the other. She was sitting quite close to her father, in a posture that would have prompted most men to put a comforting arm round her shoulders. Sethos had not done so, but he seemed more at ease with her. She had acquitted herself well that afternoon, remounting Melusine, who had behaved like a lamb all the way home, and making light of her aches and pains, being thumped down onto a hard saddle with an arm like a steel vice gripping one round the ribs leaves bruises in sensitive areas. That's just Mother's little way, the fret explained lightly. She expects all of us to demonstrate a stiff upper lip. Mariam, are you certain you can't think of anyone who means you harm? I don't want to pry into your private affairs, but the answer is no, Mariam said. Her eyes locked with those of Nefret. If you would like me to relate my experiences of the past two years in detail. No, Sethos said harshly. No, I agreed. We are looking for a common denominator, a motive that would also explain the vindictiveness against Daoud and Selim. Mariam has not even been in Egypt for the past. There it was again, darting like a shadow into my head and out of it again. The others took advantage of my silence to go on with the discussion. It didn't get very far even with David making suggestions as to how to rearrange the facts we had, or thought we had. 
One such pattern eliminated possible accidents, but we were still left with a series of apparently unconnected occurrences which could not be dismissed so easily. The veiled Hathor, the theft of the jewellery, the murder of Martinelli, and the deliberate damage to the boat, which, as Emerson optimistically pointed out, might have been aimed at someone other than Daoud. Another pattern eliminated the theft and murder as an unrelated, coincidental criminal act. Still another would remove Hathor from the equation, supposing her to have been motivated by what David delicately referred to as personal feelings. Ramses did not like this pattern. He had taken to pacing again. We can't eliminate her or Martinelli, he declared vehemently. Neither of those theories makes more sense than any other. There has to be a connection. We haven't found it yet, that's all. Well, I sure don't see it, Cyrus declared. All right with you, Amelia, if we call it quits for now. Yes, run along. If you think of anything we've overlooked, make a note of it. We've got everything in that list except the finger I cut on a piece of paper, Cyrus said. He was mistaken, as was I. We had overlooked one peculiar incident, which would prove to be the key to the entire mystery. If my more astute readers have spotted it, allow me to deflate their self-esteem by pointing out that they are sitting at ease reading this journal, not trying to deal with four active children, an unpredictable brother-in-law, an archaeological dig, and a thousand household chores. Not to mention Emerson. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. As they walked along the shadowy path to their house, the leaves of the poinsettias and mimosa stirred, rustling as if they were conversing in some unknown language, rather like the twins, Ramses thought. The great cat of Ray marched ahead of them, taking the lead as cats will without regard to their convenience. Every now and then he would stop without warning and stare into the shadows. Sometimes the stare was followed by a sudden leap and a frantic rustle of activity in the shrubbery. Sometimes he just sat there until they stumbled over him. "'We need more lights here,' Lefred said, catching hold of his arm. "'Or a better-trained cat. Damn it, he's got something. I hope it isn't a snake. "'They're all tucked up in their little holes for the night,' Lefred said. "'Don't bother yelling at him, Ramses. He'll ignore you with magnificent disdain. Stop for a minute. Why?' He showed her why. Drawing her into his arms and holding her while his mouth drifted across her face until it reached her lips. They parted, welcoming and warm, and her hand slid into his hair. After a long moment, she whispered, Don't start something unless you're prepared to finish it. I can finish any time, but let's sit here for a while. It's a beautiful night, and Lord knows we don't have many chances to be alone. He picked her up and sat down on a nearby bench, holding her on his lap, the breeze lifted a strand of her hair. It brushed his cheek like a caress. Between kisses he told her all the things he felt, but seldom said, and she responded with the murmured endearments only he had heard. The cry that broke the spell was sharp and high and human. Ramsay sprang to his feet and lowered Nefret to hers, pushing her behind him as he turned to face the thrashing in the shrubbery. "'Who's there?' he demanded reaching for his knife and realising he didn't have it. D "'Don't hurt me, I'm sorry.' She came out from behind a rose bush, an unidentifiable shadow in the darkness, but he had recognised her voice. At his shoulder, Nefret said, "'Helen, damnation!' "'I'm not going to hurt you,' Ramsay said, in a strangled voice. He would almost have preferred armed attack to the embarrassment that flooded hotly through him. How long had the wretched girl been hiding and listening?' It was the cat, Mariam said apologetically. I was just taking a walk. It's such a beautiful night. And he jumped at me, and, and I was startled, and uh, I'm so sorry. The great cat of Ray had followed her, his tail waving triumphantly. He had flushed an impressively large prey this time. No harm done, Ramsay said. But you shouldn't wander around alone at night. I'm sorry, I won't. I only wanted... Good night, Nefret said. Good night. She fled, stumbling, her hands covering her face.
The great cat of Ray brushed against Nefret's foot, inviting admiration and praise. Oh, yes, well done, she said. How much did she hear, do you suppose? She'd have heard more if the cat hadn't taken her hand, Ramses muttered, and seen more. I feel like a blithering idiot. You didn't sound like a blithering idiot, darling, Nefret said. But we may as well go in now. Yes, damn cat, he added unfairly. He is a gorgeous creature, though. The great cat of Ray preceded them into the house, taking his time so that they had to wait, holding the door for him, and then headed toward the kitchen. Yes, he's beautiful, and the most useless cat we've ever owned. Do you want a nightcap or a glass of milk? A yawn was his answer. He laughed and encircled her waist with his arm. Come to bed, then. I'm ready to finish what I began, despite the interruption. Unless you're tired. I almost wish you hadn't opened the clinic. You've been working too hard. I love it, you know that. But dear old Uncle Sethos wears me out. I thought you liked him. He closed the door of their room. The frat sat down at the dressing table and began taking pins out of her hair. I do. But when he's around, I feel like a cat in a Cairo alley, trying to look in all directions at once. What was that saying of El Garbi's? He walks among naked daggers and they follow him wherever he goes. The same could be said of us. He's walked into our nest of daggers this time. She didn't answer. The quick, hard stroke of her hairbrush and the way the long golden locks clung to her fingers told him she was in no mood for reassurance or reason. When this is settled, he began. A small, silent voice in his head jeered, Oh, no trouble at all. Solve the murder of Martinelli, locate the missing jewellery, identify the bastard who sank Dowd's boat, and the crazy woman who thinks she's Hathor. When all this is settled, he went on, after a slight pause, why don't we get away for a few days, just the two of us, and leave the children? Nefret opened a drawer and took out a nightdress. They've got a dozen people looking after them. At that inopportune moment, a hair-raising shriek split the silence. Nefret started violently and dropped the nightgown. Ramses snatched up the shirt he had removed and slipped into it. I'll go, he said. Charla was having one of her nightmares. The cries twanged directly into her parents' nervous system. The children's nursemaid, Elia, slept in the same room. She was a competent young woman, and the children both adored her. But she couldn't get through to Charla when the child was in this state. She was at the door when Ramses got there, wringing her hands in distress. Ramses caught the screaming child up off her cot and held her tightly against him. She clung to him with hands like small claws, and the screams turned into sobs. Shh, he whispered. It's all right, sweetheart. I'm here. He had left the door open. Hearing hurried footsteps, he turned, expecting to see Nefret. It was Mariam, her face drawn with concern. She hadn't paused to put on a dressing gown. The clinging silken nightgown must be one of Nefret's. It wasn't the sort of thing one would find in the wardrobe of a lady's companion. What's wrong? she asked. I heard her. The poor little thing. What can I do? Nothing, said Nefret, pushing past her. Go back to bed, Mariam, or put on some clothes. Her voice was, it seemed to Ramses, unnecessarily harsh. He smiled at Mariam. It was kind of you to rush to the rescue. As you see, she's all right now. Nefret went to Davy, who was sitting up in bed, his fair hair ruffled and his hands over his ears. He was a heavier sleeper than his sister, and he resented being awakened by loud noises. When he saw his mother, he took one hand from his ear and pointed at the window. Something she saw? Ramses asked. Something looking in the window? He knew he wouldn't get an intelligible answer from either of them, but he kept hoping. It was only at times like this that the twins' slowness to speak really bothered him. Dream or not, the terrifying thing she had seen was real to her, and he could have dealt with it more effectively if only she could tell him what it was. Davy was twittering helpfully, and Charla, sobs reduced to snuffles, began to wiggle. She was over the worst of it now. The tight grasp and crooning reassurances were what she wanted. He laid her back on the cot. Elia, smiling in relief, handed him a handkerchief. He wiped Charlotte's eyes and nose 
and brushed the tangled curls off her face. Tell Papa what it was, he coaxed. She told him, at length and with gestures. Something to do with the window. Her cot was under it, but surely she must have been dreaming. The aperture was barred and curtained. Ramses drew the curtain aside and looked out. The window was unglazed, covered only by a loose netting to keep out insects. Moonlight bathed the distant cliffs and whitened the sandy waste that faced that side of the house. Nothing moved. All gone, he said, bending over his daughter. I made it go away, and it won't come back, ever. Nothing can hurt you. Go to sleep now. He got a damp kiss. She was still leaking at eyes and nose, and a squeeze round the neck from Davy, who was now wide awake and ready to be sociable. He hugged his mother and held out his arms to Mariam. May I? she asked timidly. Yes, of course, Ramses said. I'm sorry you were disturbed. I shouldn't have intruded, she murmured, but her crying was so pitiful. I responded without thinking. Good night, darlings. All she got from Charlo was a sleepy grunt. Davy was in a mood for conversation, but he submitted to having his mouth and eyes buttoned shut with the chuckles this game always induced. The nightmares had begun only recently. According to Ramsay's mother, the ultimate authority, a number of children suffered from them at this age and got over them eventually, which was all very well, but Ramsay's realised there wasn't much chance of a romantic holiday while the nightmares lasted. He didn't flatter himself that he was the only one who could comfort Charla. It just happened that he had been first on the scene every time, and Aaliyah, for all her admirable qualities, didn't understand that a tight grasp and a firm, reassuring voice was what the little girl wanted. His father, or David, or his mother, could probably act as effectively. However, it wouldn't be fair to ask any of them to sleep in a neighbouring room while he and Nefret were absent. It took a while to get Nefret back into the mood that had been interrupted, not once, but twice. She was upset about something. He had learned to know the signs. But he couldn't think what. The Fantasia was not due to begin until evening, but even Emerson glumly conceded that there was no use going to Deir el-Medina that morning. Selim and Daoud and the others were determined to put on the most extravagant performance ever given in Guna. The whole village had been buzzing, and no one had the least intention of working that day. The motor car stood in front of the house, shining like jet. Selim had spent all evening scrubbing and polishing it. After breakfast, his mother rallied her troops and took them off to the castle to begin packing the artefacts. She declined Emerson's half-hearted offer to join them. You'll only stand round grumbling and lecturing, and Sethos said he had business in Luxor. Cyrus was ready for them. The packing materials they had used before had been taken out of storage and brought to the display room, and a local carpenter was nailing the wooden cases back together. Ramses understood why Cyrus wanted to get the job done. It was pure torment to see the magnificent assemblage and know it was lost to him. In theory, Ramses agreed, as did his father, with the idea that Egypt's treasures belonged in Egypt. But Cyrus's hangdog look made him wish Lacou had been a little more generous. They started with the smaller and less fragile objects, the stone and metal vessels. Even these were wrapped in cotton wool or waste fabric, with layers of straw under, between, and over them. When a packing case was full, Bertie and David nailed it shut. Cyrus trusted no one except themselves in that room. Ramses was assigned to the task of making lists of the contents of each case, with Leah to help. In some ways, the job was easier this time, since they had done it before, but additional precautions were necessary for a more prolonged trip, and, Ramses feared, more careless handling. Cases containing the more breakable objects of faience and pottery would be fastened with screws instead of nails. Mariam hadn't seen the display before. Awestruck and breathless, she moved from one table to another, her hands tightly clasped behind her back, like a child who was afraid she would be tempted to touch. As it would any woman, the jewellery held her longest. "'How can you bear to let it go?' she asked naively, gazing up at Cyrus. "'I haven't got any choice in the matter, my dear.' 
Take your time. You'll never see anything like this again. I think it is very unkind of him not to leave you more. I think so, too, Bertie said with a rueful grin. He straightened up and stretched. Which piece of jewellery do you like best? Oh, goodness. Unconsciously, she moistened her lips with a pink tongue. She put out her hand, glanced guiltily at Bertie, and pulled it back. He laughed indulgently. You can touch them. They won't break. What about these earrings? They're beautiful, but so big. Timidly, one finger indicated a ring. This is pretty. It was one of the least impressive of the lot, a gold band with a flattened bezel on which the figure of a seated crowned woman had been somewhat clumsily inscribed. Try it on, Bertie said. He took her hand. Oh, no, I couldn't. You have tiny hands and slim fingers. You won't hurt it. Ramses noticed that his mother was watching the pair with an enigmatic smile. She had been critical of Bertie's moping over Jumana, not because she disapproved of the relationship, one-sided as it was, but because she disapproved of moping. Catherine had made no secret of her hope that Bertie's interest in the Egyptian girl was only a temporary infatuation. Ramses wondered if she would be less prejudiced against the illegitimate child of a master thief and a murderess. Not that he blamed Bertie for indulging in some harmless flirting. Mariam was a pretty little thing, and she was obviously enjoying the young man's attentions. She held up her hand, admiring the ring. "'It's not as pretty as some of the others,' remarked Senia, who had also had the two under close observation. "'I like this one, with the carnelian cat, but I would never try it on.' "'Why not?' Cyrus exclaimed suddenly. "'Why the dickens not?' "'Try them all on!' Amelia, Leah, all of you ladies. I'll be stuck away in dusty museum cases from now on. Never again gracing a pretty hand or neck. Give him a last treat. Cyrus, you are a sport, Ramsay said. And a poet, Bertie declared. Senia, here's your cat. Mother, what's your choice? Ramsay supposed that for Cyrus it was an act of defiance, a final gesture of possession, the women converged on the table, behaving as if they had been suddenly and simultaneously infected with the same benign fever, one that brought colour to their cheeks and a glitter to their eyes. Even his mother, who claimed that baubles did not interest her, bent her head and allowed Cyrus to hang a magnificent pendant round her neck. It was a three-dimensional lapis ram, crowned with gold and reclining on a golden plinth, He'd noticed that jewels had a strange effect on women. Noticed and forgotten. How long had it been since he gave Nefret a piece of jewellery? She had her own money and could buy whatever she wanted, gems more expensive than anything he could afford. But from time to time, she still wore the cheap gold bangle he had given her when they were children, and there had been her little joke for the other night about the bracelets. If it was a joke... In vino veritas? She seemed particularly interested in several of the remaining bracelets, and he went to help her fasten a massive hinged cuff around her wrist. David was laughing as he bedecked his wife with pectorals and bracelets. Then he insisted she and the others pose for photographs. We'll never dare show them to anyone outside the family, though. Never mind, Leah said. We will gloat over them from time to time and remember a wonderful experience. Thank you, Cyrus. The fever had passed. Slowly and with obvious reluctance, the women began to divest themselves of the jewellery. Though the pieces had been skillfully restored and mended, they required to be handled gently. Ramses went to help his mother remove the heavy pendant, which depended from a necklace of gold-barreled beads. Suitable for a god's wife. The ram is Armand Ray, of course. But I wonder if she ever wore it in life, she remarked, rubbing the back of her neck. I wouldn't care to do so. Well, we have enjoyed a jolly time, but we'd better get to work. We must stop early today in order to prepare for the Fantasia. They had discussed whether or not to take the children. The very idea of the three younger Hellions running around in the dark among open tomb shafts and blazing torches and half-savage dogs 
made Ramsay's hair stand on end. And he was relieved when his mother put an end to the discussion with the decided, out of the question, Dolly will accompany us, but not the others. Isn't that a little unfair? Nefret asked, while Leah looked apprehensive, no doubt picturing Evie's response. It would be unfair to Dolly to do otherwise. He should not be punished because the younger children cannot be controlled. It is not their fault. They are just like little animals at this age. This appraisal did not go over well with either Leah or Nefret. His mother had invited the Vandergelts to come by the house beforehand. No alcoholic beverages would be served at the Fantasia, and Cyrus enjoyed a preprandial nip of whiskey. They drove up in style behind the matched greys that drew Cyrus's carriage. Cyrus and Bertie and Walter were on horseback, dressed in their best to do Selim honour. That left room in the carriage with Catherine for several of the ladies, as Cyrus pointed out, adding a delicately phrased compliment about their small size and slimness. We could take them, Emerson began. No, Emerson, we cannot, his wife said sharply. You promised Selim he could drive it. She ran an appraising eye over the group and settled the matter in her usual brisk fashion. Evelyn and Senia and I will go in the carriage. As I have already demonstrated, I'm not a good horsewoman, Mariam said, eyes downcast. I hope I'm not inconveniencing anyone. Perhaps I should stay with the children. No, no, my dear, you'll enjoy it, Emerson said, responding with his customary chivalry. She looked up at him, her long lashes fluttering, and smiled. Her father paid no attention. He was talking to Cyrus. His luggage must have arrived by train. He was wearing well-cut tweeds and riding boots, and his hair was now greyish-brown. It would, Ramsay suspected, continue to grey at an unnatural but measured speed. They waited until the sun set and the calls of the muezzins had faded into silence before preparing to leave. Senia, who had taken to wearing a somewhat unorthodox version of Egyptian dress, preened herself in a robe Nefret had helped her design. She looked unnervingly like a miniature Hathor, sans ears and crown, draped in white and bedecked with glass beads. Dolly, very spruce in his best coat and trousers, was to ride with his father. Where is Selim? Emerson demanded. Has he changed his mind about driving the motor car? We could take... No, Emerson, he has it all worked out. He wants to make a grand entrance. Their own entrance was not without eclat. Their hosts had sent torchbearers to meet them midway, and a gaggle of children accompanied them up the hill. Selim and Daoud were at the door to greet them and escort them into the house, where an elaborate meal was ready. Selim's wives, Rabia and Tagreed, must have been cooking all day. Dolly sat cross-legged next to his father, watching his every move. He had been instructed in the proper etiquette and was determined to make no mistakes. The Vandergelts had attended other such affairs, and even Catherine used her fingers neatly and with smiling good humour. Walter's glasses kept steaming up. When they'd eaten more than was good for them, they went outside. Torches and bonfires lit the scene as the darkness deepened. Dowd's house which had once been Abdullah's, faced onto one of the few open spaces in the village. As honoured guests, they were shown to a row of chairs in front of the house, and the show began. Dancers and singers, musicians and magicians performed in turn. Selim caught Ramsay's eye, winked and withdrew. The most famous storyteller in Luxor launched into a tale. A hand plucked at Ramsay's sleeve. Mariam was sitting behind him. What's he saying? she whispered. The flames gave her face a rosy glow and danced in her eyes. She looked as if she were enjoying herself. He didn't have the heart to hush her, although talking during the performance was frowned upon. It's just a little fairy tale about a princess and a magician. I'll translate it for you later, all right? Thank you. A shy, charming smile. Then her hand went to her mouth. Oh, what's happening? The storyteller must have exceeded his time limit. Daoud hurried into the centre of the space, gesturing and calling out orders. The audience moved back. Some of them were in on the secret, grinning and jumping with excitement. They helped Daoud clear the area, thrusting children into the arms of their mothers and hauling goats and donkeys out of the way. One of the drummers sounded a beat, 
and the others joined in, accompanying the rising roar of the engine as Selim sent it racing up the path. Ramses thought, he's going too fast, but he never knew whether it came just before or just after the awful screech of tortured metal. Premonition or recognition, he was on his feet and running when the crash came. The motor car was upside down, halfway down the slope, jammed against a ridge. One of the lamps was broken, but the other had miraculously survived. Its light shed a sickly glow over the scene. Selim lay on his back, flattened, unmoving. His robe was torn and stained. Ramses was the first to reach him. He searched for a pulse in the limp wrist. It was slippery with blood, and his hands were shaking. He couldn't find one. Nefret shoved him out of the way. Don't anybody touch him. Stay back. Get out of the light, damn it. Ramses, make them back off. Keep Rabia and Tigreed away. They mustn't see him like this. He could hear Selim's wives keening and begging to go to him. His Aunt Evelyn was reassuring them, her voice calm and authoritative. His mother, of course, was already on the scene, shining a torch onto the broken body. She was the only one who'd had the sense to think of it. Ramses could almost have wished she hadn't. In its direct beam, the bloodstain sprang to life, wet and red and glistening. "'What do you need?' Ramses asked. Nefret didn't look up. "'Your coat. Yours too, David. Splints. Bandages for starters.' "'Thank God,' Ramses whispered. He'd been afraid to ask. "'He's alive? So far?' Naturally enough, Selim's two young wives wanted him brought to their house. Nefret overruled them curtly and coldly, the burden was on her now, and Ramses, aching with sympathy for her, knew she was desperately afraid. She'd always agonised over losing a patient. Losing this one would devastate her. Carrying the litter on which Selim lay wrapped as rigid as a mummy, Emerson and Daoud started along the road home. Cyrus had offered the carriage. Nefret had refused in that same chilly voice. The patient must not be jolted, and the two strongest men could move him more gently than any other means of transportation. Subdued and anxious, the Vandergelts left, taking their guests and Senia and Dolly with them. Nefret didn't wait for the rest of them. She mounted moonlight and headed her down the hill. Do you want me to stay? Ramses asked. Selim was lying face down on the table in her examining room. It had been scrubbed and covered with a white sheet. The lights glared down on his naked body, still clotted with blood, but it wasn't dark with bruises. Yes, Nefret said. Scrub and put on a gown. You too, mother. Everybody else, out. His mother nodded and began rolling up her sleeves. Selim will have a fit when he finds out we undressed him, she said calmly. It was precisely the right note, her unquenchable optimism and her little joke. Nefret's tight lips relaxed a trifle. He's got several cracked ribs, plus cuts and bruises. Not too bad, but... She ran a gentle hand over Selim's black head. Mother, put your fingers here. His mother complied. Fractured skull, she said evenly. Depressed fracture, probably bleeding in the brain. You will operate then. Mother, I can't. I've only performed the procedure once... And that was years ago. There is no surgeon of your competence closer than Cairo, his mother said remorselessly. Would he survive the journey? Would not his condition worsen with delay? The answer was engraved on Nefret's white face. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 10 the sun rose behind me as I climbed, and my long, pale shadow leaped ahead, racing me to the summit. Abdallah was waiting for me in the usual place, at the top of the rocky slope behind Deir el-Bahri. Instead of offering a hand to help me, he stood with folded arms, his bearded face grim. "'Will he live?' I gasped, collapsing onto a boulder." Thanks to the goodness of God and the skill of Nurmisur, you could have prevented this, Sitakim. The cruelty of the charge brought me to my feet, shaking with anger. No, but you could have. Why didn't you warn me? There are many futures. The final shape is not known, 
until it takes place. His thin lips curled. I never thought to see you behave like a woman, Sid. I'm not sure I want to know what you mean by that. Tending babies, ordering food to be prepared, beds to be made ready, while a web of evil is woven around you. Behind him, the path, white in the dawn, went on across the tumbled rocks of the plateau toward the Valley of the Kings. It was a well-travelled path, but in these dreams there was never a human form but ours. A scorpion rattled over a stone, its envenomed tail raised. A long, brown shape, thin as a rat's tail, left a twisted trail through the sandy dust. As usual, I said bitterly, you talk of danger, but not how to prevent it. Abdallah let out a little sound of exasperation. I am not allowed. I have told you before. In attempting to prevent one danger, you may run headlong into another. You must work out the pattern for yourself. There is a pattern, Sid. You will see it if you try. Come, he went on, in a kinder voice. Let us look across the valley. I let him draw me to the spot where the path plunged down. The sun is born again from the womb of night, he said. See how the light spreads, remaking the world. The shapes of mountain and sown land, ruined temples and homely houses, seemed to spring into existence out of the nothingness of the night. He was trying to tell me something, but I was cursed if I knew what. My black mood lifted a little, though. His hand was as firm and warm as that of a living man. So, you've become a poet as well as a saint, Abdullah? Ah, that. Abdullah looked pleased, but he shook his head. It is part of the pattern to sit. Go now. Be careful on the path. Not only this one, but the one you must follow. He had never descended with me. Not even a few steps. Always his path led toward the west. Even Emerson was in no fit state of mind for work the next day. None of us had got much sleep. It had been impossible for anyone to seek repose until I brought the news that Selim had survived the operation. Further comfort than that I could not honestly offer at the time. But Nefret, who had stayed with him all night turned up for breakfast to report that he was holding his own and indeed seemed a little better. I must get back, she went on, looking with distaste at the heaped plate Fatima promptly set before her. Khadija's with him now, but eat something and then go to bed, I said firmly. You cannot risk falling ill. Khadija and I will look after him. He will be all right, won't he? Senia raised tragic black eyes. Yes, I said. He wouldn't dare die with your Aunt Amelia and a fret looking after him. The speaker was Sethos, who had just entered after snatching a few hours' sleep on the Dahabiya. He patted the child's curly black head and glanced at his daughter, but contented himself with a nod and a smile. I put my serviette on the table and rose. I'm going to sell him now. Get some rest, Nefret. I will notify you at once if there's any change. You can trust me to do that, I presume? Yes, mother. The rest of you carry on. Keep busy. Yes, mother, said Ramses. And you, Emerson, I began. Yes, Peabody, said Emerson, with only the slightest note of irony. Are you certain you can trust me to carry out an investigation without your assistance? In this case, I conceded, you are probably better qualified than I. Good God, said Emerson. Probably. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. They had been too worried and distressed the night before to discuss what had caused the accident. Anyhow, it would have been unproductive to speculate before they had all the facts, and the wreckage could be better examined in daylight. In the end, six of them rode to Gurna. Walter would not be left behind, although to the best of Ramsay's knowledge, he knew very little about the workings of motor cars, and Bertie turned up as they were leaving to offer what assistance he could. 
They spent a little time with Selim's wives, who went about the conventional gestures of hospitality, with better spirits than Ramses had expected. They knew Selim had got through the operation. The Sitha Kim sent Tao to tell us, one of them explained. Of course, Ramses realized. She would think of that. He hadn't. Guiltily, praying he was not holding out false hope, he added additional reassurance. He is better this morning. She says he will live. They had never doubted it. Not with the Sitter Kim's magic working for him. Nomi Saw was loved and trusted, but a little magic never hurt. Half the village followed them to the scene of the crash. Nothing had been touched. Emerson had left orders. In bright sunlight, the wrecked motor car looked even worse than it had the night before. It had gone off the path to the left, fallen onto its side, and slid down before it turned over, leaving a wide swath of disturbed soil, littered with broken glass and bits of metal, before crashing into the ridge. If that outcrop hadn't been there, it would have rolled on down to the bottom of the path. And if Selim hadn't been thrown out before it fell, he would almost certainly have been crushed in the wreckage. Almost all the structural damage was on the left side of the vehicle. The door ripped off its hinges, the windscreen bent and shattered. One wheel was missing. The wooden spokes of the other were splintered and the tyre was flat. The radiator had burst and the petrol tank had been ruptured. By now the petrol had evaporated, though the smell lingered. Here's the wheel, David called from farther up the hill. They scrambled to join him. Emerson swept the area with an eagle eye, measuring distance and trajectory. If it came off as a result of the impact, it would be under the car or lower down, he muttered. The lug nuts are missing, Ramses said. All six of them. Even though he had expected this, he felt slightly sick. They must have been deliberately loosened. The car toppled over when the wheel came off. It wasn't an accident, Bertie looked as sick as Ramses felt. Not a chance of it. Emerson replied grimly. Selim is a first-rate mechanic, and he kept the cursed thing in top condition. A murmur rose from the watching audience. Some of them understood English. They were passing the news on to the rest. A slender, black-robed woman picked up the child playing at her feet and hushed it. One of the squatting men lit a cigarette. Otherwise, no one stirred. Intent, dark eyes followed their every movement as they went over the vehicle, inch by inch. Emerson insisted that it would have taken a man's strength to loosen the bolts. Ramses wasn't so sure of that. A long-handled wrench might have done the job if it were in the hands of a determined woman who knew something about motor cars. When was it done? he asked. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. You put the wheel back on the day before yesterday. It was the wheel on the front right, not this one. The job must have been done that night. If I'd put the damned car in the stable yard as your mother kept telling me to do. The lines round his mouth deepened. It wouldn't have made any difference, Ramsay said. The stable yard is easily accessible, and Ali sleeps like the dead. Loosening the lug nuts would take only a few minutes. He, whoever he was, counted on the wheel coming off when Selim hit a steep stretch, Sethos said musingly. The car was bound to turn over once it lost a wheel, Ramses argued. Wherever that happened, he had to keep up a fair speed. That's the only way to drive over rough terrain. Agreed. But the damage to set him in the vehicle would have been considerably less if it had happened on a level stretch. It was a gamble, supposing that murder was the intent. Just like all the other cases, Ramses muttered. Emerson looked round. Dowd, I want the motor car brought back to the house. Collect every scrap. It's a total wreck, sir, Bertie exclaimed. You'll never repair it. Do you suppose I'd give a curse about that? Emerson demanded. Dowd flexed big brown hands and nodded vigorously. It shall be as you say, father of curses. Shedim can repair the motor car. You will see. Emerson's features twisted into a painful grimace. His voice was hoarser than usual when he replied, You're right, Dowd. He can and he will. And, said Dowd placidly, you will find the man who did this and give him to me. Inshallah, said Sethos under his breath. Dowd repeated the word and, after a moment, so did Emerson. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. 
I had sent word to Catherine and Cyrus that morning, for I knew they would want the latest bulletin. Shortly thereafter, they came in person. We won't stay unless we can be of use, Amelia, Catherine assured me, seating herself next to me and taking my hands. What can we do to help? Is he really better? I had just left the sick room, where Khadija sat like a large ebony idol, her very presence reassuring. He is still unconscious, but his breathing is easier. It must have been horrible for Nefret, Catherine murmured, with a little shiver. The knowledge that the life of someone she knows and loves was in her hands. She's always come through when she had to, I said, cool and steady as a machine. She will break down eventually, but not before she is certain he is out of danger. You will stay for luncheon, won't you? Fatima, who had been trying to force me to eat again, let out a murmur of pleasure and hurried into the house. Cyrus stopped pacing. He'd been up and down the length of the veranda a dozen times and put his hand on my shoulder. Sure we won't be in the way? Not at all, I assured him. We could use some help with the children. I am very grateful to you for getting Dolly and Senia away so quickly. But they all know something is wrong, and they are, of course, behaving like fiends. How well I remember, Catherine Rose. Where are they? Leah and Evelyn have corralled them in Senia's courtyard. At least I hope they have. She hurried off. I motioned to Cyrus, who was still pacing. Sit down, Cyrus. The men will be back soon. They went to Gurna to inspect the motor car. Will you wait for them here? I promised Nefret I would sit with Selim while she got a little rest. She was in his sick room when I hastened in, bending over the bed. Guiltily, I began. I am sorry, Nefret. I was only away. She looked up. Her eyes were luminous. He's conscious. Khadija came for me. I dropped to my knees beside the bed. Selim's eyes were open. He saw me. He recognized me. His lips parted. Don't speak, I said gently. Don't move. You had an accident and were badly hurt, but Nefret has taken care of your injuries. You are in her clinic and you're going to be fine. I thought that answering the most obvious questions would keep him quiet, but he had something else on his mind. Did my father tell you? He told me you would live. Ah. Uh, it was a soft, relieved sigh. I have long been convinced that the mind affects the body in ways we cannot define. With that assurance, Selim had gained additional strength and will to live. Who could deny the wisdom of a saint? Nefret's fingers were pressed to his wrist. You have a number of broken bones and your head was hurt she said. You mustn't move it. I'll give you something for the pain now. Selim's eyes opened wide, the whites showing all round the pupils. A needle? No, I do not want... All right, no needle, Nefret said quickly. Don't get excited. Selim grunted. Then his expressive orbs rolled in my direction. Who took my clothes off? Nefret began to laugh. It was the sort of laughter that is often followed by tears, so I was relieved when the door opened and Ramses looked in. What? he began. He asked, Who undressed him? Nefret gasped. She turned blindly into Ramses' arms, her face streaked with tears. I did sell him, said Ramses, over her bowed head. His voice was steady, but his black eyes shone suspiciously as he gazed at his friend. With you be peace and God's mercy and blessing, my friend. No needle, Selim whispered. Not if you behave yourself, Ramsay said. Sleep now. Selim's lids snapped shut. I looked at Khadija. She smiled her beautiful, kindly smile and nodded. I noticed that under the bandages... Selim's shaven head was green. We had a genuine celebration, for even a fret admitted to cautious optimism about her patient. She looked exhausted but radiant, the violet smudges under her eyes intensifying their blue. There is always a danger of a relapse, but his recuperative powers are astonishing. 
If I believed in miracles... Miracles be damned, said Emerson predictably. It was your skill that saved him. Well done, my dear girl. Well done indeed, Catherine agreed. I sent messages this morning, postponing our soiree. Right. How could we hold a soiree without selling to waltz with the ladies? Cyrus demanded. We'll have a real party when she's fully recovered, and the villain who tried to kill him is dead or in prison. Are you sure Selim was the intended victim? Sethos asked. Naturally, the same question had occurred to me. A number of people knew that Selim meant to drive the motor car to the Fantasia, I replied. However, the miscreant could not be certain. Emerson would not take it into his head to operate the thing before Selim did. Just as the miscreant who sank the boat couldn't be certain who would be harmed, Ramsay said thoughtfully. There's a nonchalance about all this that is extremely strange. If the fellow is trying to commit murder, he's not very good at it. Fatima came in with another platter of her famous spiced lamb and rice. Sethos leaned back and folded his hands over his flat stomach. Thank you, Fatima, but I've already eaten more than I ought. I will be getting stout if I stay much longer. How long will that be? I asked. Mariam, who had eaten in silence, head bent, looked up. However long it takes to find your antagonist, was the reply. You lot are exhibiting less than your usual efficiency. What's the difficulty? I'd have expected Amelia to come up with a suspect or two long before this. The difficulty is that we don't know which incidents are relevant and which are accident or coincidence, I replied indignantly. It is like finding the original pattern in a jumble of loose beads, David added, some of which belong to another piece of jewellery altogether. Sethos's curiously coloured eyes studied him. An interesting analogy. You're something of an expert on restoration, David. How would you go about separating the disparate elements? Lay them all out on the table, examine them, and try them in different arrangements, was the prompt reply. After long experience, one acquires an instinct for such things. Like Amelia's instinct for crime, said Walter eagerly, and uh, that of um, uh, mine. Sethos's brows rose. You forget, Walter, that I have investigated fewer crimes than I have committed. However, I have no intention of leaving you without my protection. Emerson growled. Selim continued to improve. He was able to sit up for short periods, and his appetite was good, though no one, not even Dawood, could have consumed all the food Fatima tried to force on him. He ought to have been a pathetic sight, encased in sticking plaster, with a miniature turban of bandages covering his shaven head. However, his cherished beard had been left intact, and that seemed to cheer him a great deal. At first his speech was a trifle slurred, but that did not prevent him from asking innumerable questions, most of them about the motor car. "'It was not your fault,' said Emerson, who had been allowed to visit Selim for a few minutes. "'Someone deliberately loosened the bolts on the front wheel. As soon as you are fit, we will repair it. By that time we will have found the man responsible.' "'Dowd is looking after your family,' I added." And so are we all. You are not to worry about anything except getting well. The excavations, Selim said. You must not allow... Don't worry about that either, Emerson said. We will carry on as best we can until you are back on the job. Knowing how trying it would be for a man of Selim's energy to remain quiet, I arranged a schedule of entertainment. In my opinion, Emerson was not a soothing companion for a sick man... But Ramses and Bertie came by every day to report on the excavations, and Senia and Evelyn read to him. I knew he was on the road to recovery when he gravely asked Evelyn to read from a manual on the maintenance and repair of motor cars. Never suppose, reader, that my attentions to our friend had kept me from other duties. Unfortunately and infuriatingly, the most imperative of those duties took very little of my time. Emerson brooded morbidly over the wreckage of the motor car, which had been transported to the stable yard. Even he admitted there was nothing more to be learned from it. 
Daoud instigated another, more intensive search for Mariam's first attacker and dragged several quaking strangers to the house to confront Mariam and Ramses. Neither was able to make an identification. To say that we were watchful and wary is to understate the case. Fatima went through both houses several times a day, brandishing a broom, on the lookout for venomous creatures. Khadija and two of her daughters took up permanent residence, sitting with Selim and keeping the children under close surveillance. I refused to allow Emerson to go alone to the dig, which provoked him into furious protests, though he insisted I follow the same precaution. The inevitable result was that everyone became twitchy and irritable, especially the children. We got on with packing the artefacts. As Emerson continued to point out with increasing acrimony and inventive swear words, Lacou would damn well have to sit and wait until we finished the job. But I had reasons of my own for wanting it completed before he got there. One of them, I feel no shame in admitting it, was that I had no intention of mentioning the stolen jewellery or of allowing the others to do so. Lacou was unlikely to demand that the carefully packed cases be opened. He would have lists and his inventory, and would doubtless go over them painstakingly when he unpacked the cases in the museum. If at that time he realized several pieces were missing, sufficient under the day is the evil thereof, as scripture so wisely reminds us, we would confess if we had to, but not until we had to, and there was still a chance, however unlikely, that we might yet find the thief and murderer. In fact, as Emerson would have expressed it, we had bloody well better find him before he decided to strike again. At least the packing process kept us occupied. Everyone pitched in with a will, including Mariam. She had a delicate touch and demonstrated a genuine interest in the precious things. You can help me with this if you will, I said, indicating a painted chest. I really do not know what we are going to do about packing materials. I've used up all the fabric and most of the cotton wool, and even so I fear the garments in this chest will shatter when it is moved. What does the writing say? It is a list of the contents, gloves, sandals, two robes, and a few other articles. Ramses has already copied and translated it. He reads hieratic as easily as he does English. I'd like to learn more, so that I can help with your work. Perhaps he would give me a lesson? If you are truly interested, we can arrange for you to study the subject. I added with a laugh. Though it will take more than a few lessons. You have already been very useful, Mariam. I've been meaning to thank you for your help with the children. I want to be useful, and I love being with the children. The next words were so soft I had to strain to hear them. I am very happy here. I will be sorry to go. That won't be for a while. We must have you here for Christmas, at least. And afterward? I know it is a great deal to ask, but could I stay with you for a while? You've all been so good to me. And I think I could be useful with the children, even on the dig, if you will teach me. It was not only that she was happy with us. She was still uncomfortable with him. I had wondered what on earth he meant to do with her. He travelled a great deal, and so did Margaret. They had no permanent establishment where she could receive the attention she needed. And how in heaven's name would Margaret respond to the role of stepmother? Not well, if I knew Margaret. I will discuss it with your father, I promised, though I felt like an overburdened donkey who has just had another sack of grain added to his load. Perhaps something can be worked out. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses was sitting with Selim reading from the motor car manual, his Aunt Evelyn having admitted defeat, when the door opened and Sethos put his head in. Our visitors allowed. It was the first time he'd seen Selim since the accident. Selim's black eyes brightened, and his hand went to his beard. It was certainly more impressive than that of Sethos, though the latter's was coming along nicely. His face was almost back to normal, except for a few faded bruises. Yes, come, Selim said eagerly. You are still here. Leaning against the doorframe, a picture of a sartorial elegance in well-cut tweeds. 
Sethos gave him a friendly grin. You didn't suppose I'd abandon the family at a time like this? With you out of commission, they'll need all the help they can get. That is true, said Selim, starting to nod, and then remembering he wasn't supposed to. Thank you both for your confidence, said Ramses. You are too honourable, Selim explained. He is not. Sethos threw his head back and shouted with laughter. Right on the mark, Selim. Is there anything I can do for you? Tell me about the aeroplane, Selim said eagerly. Another time. Fatima said I wasn't to stay. She's bringing your dinner. Selim groaned. She brings me food. Rabia and Tagrid bring me food. Gadija brings me food. Soon I will be fat. So, what are you after, really? Ramses asked, as they strolled along the path toward the main house. Visiting the sick isn't your style. How cynical. I like Selim. Sethos paused to sniff at a pink rose. You're right, though. It was you I was after. Would you care to join me in a visit to the gay and glamorous nightlife of Luxor? Lovely spot, this, he added, gazing sentimentally at a vine covered with blue flowers. Perhaps when I retire, I'll settle down in Luxor, the whole family together, eh? Ramses refused the bait. Why? To pass my declining years in the company of my nearest and dearest. Oh, you mean my Luxor? I think I may be onto something. He refused to elaborate, claiming that he wanted an independent judgment. His announcement of their intentions was met with raised eyebrows, but without comment, at least not at dinner. When Ramses went to change, Nefret went with him. What is this about? she asked. He says he's onto something. She watched curiously as he selected the suit he intended to wear. Black tie? Where are you going? He wouldn't say. Some place respectable, at least, Nefret said. That's a relief. Are you going to take your knife? It doesn't go with evening kit. She did not return his smile. It goes with Uncle Sethos. Please. The so-called nightlife of Luxor ranged from the repellent to the respectable. The cafes and drinking establishments that catered to tourists were located along the Corniche, a few were relatively harmless, but evening clothes would have been glaringly out of place in any of them. The hotels, especially those of the top category, were the centres of social activity for upper-class visitors and residents. The tourist steamers and dahabiyas drawn up along the bank formed a narrow floating residential street. Lights shone from the decks and saloons. Their first stop was the Winter Palace, where Sethos was obviously known and welcome. He was choosy about which table to select, and when the waiter hurried up to take their order, he said, "'Nothing tonight, Habib, but there will be bakshish for you if you tell the brother of demons what you told me.' "'About the Italian gentleman and the lady?' Habib asked, with a nod of greeting for Ramses. He extended a thin brown hand. They visited two other hotels, the Savoy and the Tufikia, on the road to Karnak, and got the same story, though not the same description of the lady. At the latter establishment, which claimed the optimistic designation of Grand Hotel, Sethos ordered whiskey and invited Ramsay's comments. One titian haired, one dark, one fair, Ramsay said. A breeze rustled the leaves of the arbor over their heads. Martinelli was quite a lady's man. Come now, said Sethos with a grin. The same woman? He acquired female acquaintances in other places. I've already eliminated them, and a damn tedious chore it was. This one was different. A lady. Well-dressed, quiet, and very retiring. Except for the hair, the descriptions were the same. Approximately five feet three inches. Shapely figure. Young. None of the waiters recognized her. They all claim they had never set eyes on her before. But I think you have. Her for? Ramses thought it over. The description fits, such as it is. It must be the same woman. This is the connection between two seemingly unrelated parts of the pattern. And it explains how Martinelli was lured to his death. 
He'd follow a woman anywhere. Ramses ran his fingers through his hair. It was late and he was tired, but several other pieces of the pattern were falling into place. So he borrowed the jewellery in order to impress her. Offered it to her, perhaps, in exchange for favours she had withheld. He had no intention of paying her so high a price, though. It would have meant the end of his lucrative job with Cyrus and the police on his trail. What a dirty little swine he was. Sethos lifted his glass and set it down again, making a pattern of interlocking rings on the table. A moralist would say he got what he deserved. She agreed to sell her favours, with no more intention of carrying out her share of the bargain than he. And he went panting after her, too blinded by lust to wonder why she was leading him into a remote part of Luxor. And in a dark, verminous alley, his doom awaited him, as Amelia might put it. He was probably dead before he knew what had happened. They bundled him up and tossed him over a donkey and carried him out into the desert. Ramses continued the story. They took the jewellery and everything else that might have identified him and left him for the jackals. It was as easy as taking candy from a child, Sethos said, bland and unmoved. He sounded almost admiring. Brilliantly planned, really. One had only to look at the poor bastard to know he had had no success with the sort of woman he wanted. No woman of taste would have touched him with a barge pole. He was ripe for the plucking, and she plucked him like a goose. Why? If it's the princess's treasure she's after. He wondered why he hadn't thought of it before. Could that be it? Why ask me? I'm a reformed character, said his uncle virtuously. If I were after it, and don't give me that fishy stare, I'm not. I wouldn't go about it in such a disorganized fashion. I certainly wouldn't arrange a series of haphazard attacks. They've only succeeded in putting you on the qui vive. No, what I'd do is bide my time, lull you into a sense of false security, and then strike. I could break into that locked room in sixty seconds, and with a dozen well-trained villains helping me, clear out everything that's portable and be away from Luxor before morning. I'll bet you could at that, Ramses muttered. It would be an attractive challenge. Sethos mused. He leaned back and lit a cigarette. His face took on a dreamy expression. Transport arranged in advance. Ready admission to the castle for a trusted friend. Servants asleep in their wing of the house. Cyrus gently escorted back to his room and locked in with his wife. He sighed regretfully and blew out a wobbly smoke ring. It must be quite a temptation. Ramses said, with unwilling amusement. His uncle's expression was that of a man remembering a particularly successful romantic interlude. How you must miss the good old days, before Mother reformed you. Or has she? Hmm. Sethos put out his cigarette and leaned forward, elbows on the table, no longer smiling. Believe this, if you can. I swore to her I would never interfere with their work again. That goes for Cyrus, too. I don't steal from my friends. Does that mean we'd better go? Your wife will be sending out search parties. His evasive response roused certain dire suspicions. It wasn't the first time they had entered Ramsay's mind. What had Sethos been doing in Jerusalem when he was supposed to be in Constantinople? Since the war, the former battlegrounds had been in turmoil, and the preservation of antiquities was undoubtedly low on the list of occupying powers. It was a perfect opportunity for a picker-up of unconsidered trifles, and Sethos was an expert picker-upper. There's nothing I can do about it, Ramses told himself, even if it's true, and I can't prove it is. The coloured lanterns began to go out as they left the hotel and started back along the road above the embankment. Ramses loosened his tie. So, if it isn't the treasure, it's something else she wants. Was Martin at his death part of the plan? He had made a few enemies, Sethos said noncommittally. While he was working for you? Then, and when he was working for other people, given his weakness for women, it isn't impossible that he offended one of them. Tracking him down would be easy. Everyone in Luxor knew he was working for Cyrus. 
His uncle was a shadow beside him. They passed the Savoy and the Hotel de Carnac, now dark except for a few lamps next to the entrances. Bats flapped and swooped between the trees. A long, piercing whistle began and grew louder. The night train from Cairo, several hours late, as usual. It was drowned out by a roar of sound. The black sky to the east reddened and quivered. My God, Ramses gasped. What was that? Sethos's head was raised like that of a pointer, sniffing the air. It's near the railroad station. Come on. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 11 None of us heard the explosion, which was a good thing, since certain of us might have been worried enough to investigate. When a loud noise is juxtaposed to the absence of Ramses, one naturally assumes he had something to do with it. As Nefret told me later, he did not return until almost three in the morning. His attempt to undress without waking her did not succeed, and when she lit a lamp, the sight of him almost made her drop it. His best evening suit was a complete ruin, torn, smeared with blood and ashes and other unmentionable substances, and his hands were, to quote Nefret, a bloody mess. The rest of us did not learn of the matter until breakfast. I wasn't hurt, and neither was Sethos, Ramses insisted, trying to get a firm grip on his fork. We were a half mile away when the blast went off. I cut myself up a bit, digging people out of the rubble. Damn it, Nefret, I don't need all these bandages. You always... What happened? My voice was perhaps a trifle loud. Ramses picked up a sausage in his fingers. They tried to blow up the train station, just as the express from Cairo was coming in. Mercifully, they didn't make a good job of it. The tracks weren't damaged, and only part of the station went up. One man was killed, and half a dozen others were injured, all of them Egyptians. The European waiting room and the platform were unscathed. They, Emerson said, who was responsible? Ramses had bit off a chunk of sausage. He shrugged. The peasants are revolting, said David. His lips twisted. The damn fools. Ramses swallowed. That is the assumption. The rioting last spring included similar acts of sabotage. Damnation. Emerson took out his pipe. Don't sprinkle tobacco on your eggs, Emerson, I ordered. I've finished, said Emerson, sprinkling tobacco on the remains of his breakfast and the surrounding area. I suppose we can expect a contingent of troops from Cairo. What a bloody nuisance. David, perhaps it would be advisable for you to lie low for a while. David's finely cut lips straightened. I won't run away, sir. I had nothing to do with this, and they can't prove I did. The military doesn't need proof, Emerson muttered. Yes, by God they do, Ramsay said vehemently. David is a British citizen, and some of the biggest guns in the government will vouch for him. Including me, said Sethos, posing in the open doorway. Am I too late for breakfast, Fatima? Can't you ever enter a room without making a theatrical production of it? I inquired. It's a habit, Sethos explained. Let me see your hands. He held them out. Clean enough. You were digging too, I said, observing the broken nails and scraped knuckles and scorched palms. Come to the clinic and I'll... Well, of course I was digging. Did you expect me to stand idly by while Ramses was being heroic? Ramses let out a sound like a softer version of his father's growl. We were both extremely heroic, Sethos said soothingly. Don't fuss, Emilia. I applied half a bottle of whiskey and even a little soap and water. He took a chair next to Mariam and Fatima hurried to set a place for him. Are you all right, sir? Mariam turned a pretty, anxious face toward him. Quite. Why are you all getting worked up? This was an isolated incident, and at present the cause is unknown. I telegraphed Cairo to that effect first thing this morning. Unless something else occurs, I believe they will be content to leave the investigation in my hands and those of the police. I hope so. Candidly, I declared, at this moment I don't give a curse about riots and insurrections, and the explosion cannot have any bearing on our other problems. Problem, Sethos corrected. 
There is a common cause. And last night, Ramses and I... Oh, thank you, Fatima. That looks delicious. Last night, we discovered one of the links. Have you told them, Ramses? I haven't had a chance, Ramses said curtly. Your discovery, anyhow. I will confess in the pages of this private journal that my first reaction to Sethos' account was chagrin. I ought to have thought of it myself. Is not cherche la femme a favourite axiom? Not with me, however. And in a case of presumed strangulation, a female does not immediately leap to mind. Well done, I conceded. Though, if I may say so, certain of your conclusions are based on unsubstantiated extrapolation. I do not... I beg your pardon, Emerson. Did I hear a reference to pots and kettles? I would never express such a trite aphorism, Peabody. Hmm. As I was about to say, I do not see that this gets us much further. We had postulated a gang, had we not? But now we know... Catching my eye, Ramses amended the statement. We may reasonably assume that the appearances of Hathor are not extraneous to the pattern we have been trying to establish. There is a woman involved. A young, beautiful woman, Nefret murmured. Quite, said Ramses. He snapped off another bit of sausage. But what was the purpose of those ridiculous appearances? I cried in exasperation. And who the devil is she? A permanent resident of Luxor, or a tourist who arrived in Luxor over a month ago, said Sethos. A month? I asked. I've made a timetable, Sethos explained, with a superior smile at me. He knew I hadn't, or I'd have said so. Martinelli disappeared over three weeks ago. Give her a week or so before that to become acquainted with him. If it is the same woman, she made a quick trip to Cairo when you did and then came back in time to arrange to sink Dawood's boat and stage her second appearance. There is every reason to believe she is still here. That limits the number of suspects, surely, David said thoughtfully. Most tourists stay for only a few days, and there aren't that many permanent residents who are female. And young and beautiful, and uh, no better than she should be, I agreed. It can't be one of that group. I know them all, and I assure you, one of my acquaintances would have informed me if a newcomer had settled here. She's right about that, said Emerson to the group at large. Those females are always quick to relay the latest gossip. Still, there is no harm in inquiring, Sethos said. He had taken advantage of the lull to empty his plate, which Fatima immediately refilled. No, Amelia, not you. A direct question to one of your friends would arouse curiosity, and we must avoid that at all costs. I will make my availability for social functions of all sorts known to the good ladies of Luxor society. A new face is always welcome, and there is no man more welcome than an eligible bachelor. You'd better do something to your face if you intend to attract the ladies, I retorted. That beard, I've been waiting for it to grow out. Sethos explained, stroking his chin. Just wait, Amelia. Once I've had it trimmed and touched up a bit and made a few other changes, the mere sight of me will cause you to swoon with admiration. Bah, said Emerson. All you will learn is that there are several women in Luxor. I name no names, Peabody, who would stop at nothing to marry off their spinster daughters. The woman you're after won't come anywhere near you. I think she might, Sethos said, his smile fading. I am known to be a friend of Mr. Cyrus Vandergelt, am I not? In short, said Ramses, after a moment of silence, you intend to set yourself up as bait. Mariam let out a little cry, and her father turned to her with a reassuring smile. It's perfectly safe, Mariam. I doubt very much she would try the same trick a second time. If she does, I promise I won't follow her into a dark alley. He looked round the circle of sober faces and shrugged. It's our best lead, and it ought to be pursued. It would be nice if we could clear the matter up soon, I said. The Christmas season is approaching. I have never allowed a criminal to interfere with my holiday celebrations, and I don't intend to begin now. 
Christmas, Emerson exclaimed, eyes bulging. Now see here, Peabody, I have never objected to the unnecessary effort you spend on what is essentially a pagan holiday with accretions from an equally nonsensical superstition. We certainly can't disappoint the children, Leah said. I must confess I hadn't given it much thought. I have, I said, but we still have a few weeks. There is another matter, said David, glancing at his father-in-law. The Milner Commission is due in Egypt shortly, and the British attitude is already known. The protectorate will continue. Zaglul Pasha has sent word that the commission is to be boycotted entirely. There will be strikes and demonstrations all over the country. How do you know that? Leah asked. I read the newspapers. David said somewhat impatiently. I hope Sethos is right, but I have a feeling that Cairo is going to take the explosion at the railway station more seriously than he anticipates. It has nothing to do with us, Ramsay said, watching his friend with a furrowed brow. Stay out of it, David. You promised you would. We will keep him out of it, I said firmly. Good heavens, haven't we enough to worry about without that? Fatima came in. There is a patient for you, Nol Misur. Will you go? Of course, Nefret rose. And the rest of us must return to our labours, I declared. Who is going to the castle with me? Not I, Emerson growled. No one expects you to, my dear. Cheer up. We will have finished the job in a day or two, and then we can get on with our investigation. What investigation? Emerson demanded. He pushed his plate away with such violence that it knocked over a glass. Water spilled across the cloth. Curse it, Emerson shouted. I'm sorry, Fatima. It was your fault, Peabody. Your bland optimism drives me wild. There is nothing to investigate. We've come to a dead end. You know perfectly well we can't do a bloody thing except sit round, waiting for another bloody attack. That is not quite correct, Ratcliffe, said Walter, adjusting his eyeglasses. Uh, Sethos's scheme... It's posturing without purpose, Emerson snarled. His hard blue stare moved from one of his brothers to the other. Sethos grinned appreciatively, and Walter, who had known Emerson even longer, calmly buttered another piece of bread. When I arrived at the castle, I found Cyrus pacing up and down the display room, tugging at his goatee. Catherine trotted alongside, patting him and emitting breathless phrases like, now, Cyrus, and Cyrus, dear. He was going at a great pace, and my dear Catherine was a trifle stout. She let out a gasp of relief when my appearance brought Cyrus to a halt. Now what? I demanded. Catherine, sit down, my dear, and catch your breath. Cyrus turned remorsefully to his wife. Sorry, Cat. I was so head up I wasn't paying attention. He was holding a crumpled paper, a telegram by its colour. Is that what got you het up? I inquired. Let me guess. Another message from Monsieur Lacour? What does he want now? Everything? Not so bad as that. Cyrus smoothed out the telegram and tried to fan his wife with it. I don't know why it got me so mad. The tone of it, I guess. He left Cairo yesterday, took over 24 hours for the telegram to be delivered, as usual. He expects to arrive on... Thursday, and he wants to load up in one day. Can you believe it? Only he didn't say, expect and want, and will you please? Do this, do that was more like it. Telegrams are not the medium for polite circumlocutions, I replied. What got him so het up? He did say something about that, Cyrus read the words. Rumors, unrest, alarming. Stop. Safe arrival, Cairo artifacts, paramount, stop. Wait till he hears about the explosion, David murmured. He'll be all the more determined to leave Luxor in a hurry. He's got his gall darn gall suggesting the artifacts aren't safe here, Cyrus snapped. They're safer than they would be in that dud blasted museum. Oh, shucks, you don't think he found out about the stolen jewelry, do you? I cannot imagine how he could have, I replied. He is just being officious and overly fearful. This really doesn't change anything, Cyrus. We'll have his precious artifacts ready for him, and he can load up and go to the devil, as Emerson might say. If we make arrangements in advance for bearers, he may actually be able to accomplish it in a single day. 
By midday, we'd run out of straw and cotton wool. We had dealt with most of the smaller objects. There remained only the coffins, the mummies, and the beaded robe. I am sure I do not know how we are to pack that, I declared. I would be afraid to roll it or fold it again, and if we insert pins to keep it from shifting round as it is moved, the pins may do even more damage. David, have you any suggestions? There isn't much we can do, David said regretfully. He brushed straw off his shirt. Except covered it closely with a clean sheet and wrap bandages round the whole ensemble, with additional layers of padding above. If it is gently handled, it won't be. I said with a sigh. Ah, well, what cannot be mended must be endured. We've done our best. I believe we can finish tomorrow if we can find more packing material. I'll go over to Luxor, David said. There must be some cellar fabric we haven't cleaned out. Shall I come with you? I asked. That isn't necessary. I'll try to locate more clean straw, too, while I'm about it. He picked up his coat and went out before I could reply. His haste and his refusal to meet my eyes made me wonder if he was up to something. David hardly ever did anything underhanded, unless he was egged on by Ramses. But in his own quiet way, he was as stubborn as my son. His disclaimers to the contrary, I suspected he hadn't entirely severed his connection with the nationalist movement, and this latest outbreak obviously worried him. I ran after him, calling his name. He pretended he didn't hear, but I caught him up while he was saddling us for. You are going to the railway station, I panted, aren't you? David had never been able to lie to me. Moral force established at an early age is irresistible. It had never been completely successful with Ramses, but he was an exceptional case. David looked down at me with an attempt at sternness and then caved in as I had known he would. Confound it, Aunt Amelia. How do you do it? It is well known in Luxor that I am a magician of great power, I replied with a smile. David did not return it. I only want to see the damage for myself. To what purpose? David, please don't go alone. Get Ramses or Emerson to go with you. Take the father of curses away from his excavations to play bodyguard. What can possibly happen that I can't handle? This is Luxor, not Gallipoli. I let out a sigh of exasperation. Masculine ego is a frightful nuisance. I am in no mood for argument or explanation, David. Just do as I say. Ramses is at the house working on his ostraca. That isn't far out of your way. And don't swear at me, I added, for I saw the word forming on his lips. They drew back into a shape that was at least partially caused by amusement. All right, Aunt Amelia, you win, as always. You are finished here for the time being, I expect. Shall I give you a lift back to the house? He mounted and offered me a hand. I backed away. No, thank you, dear boy. I have enjoyed that romantic but uncomfortable experience too often. Tell Fatima we will be lunching here and eat something before. He gave me a grin and a mock military salute and rode off. Thoughtfully, I returned to the workroom. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Once, Ramses would have been happy to be left to work on the inscribed material, but he was unable to concentrate. He knew why his father hadn't insisted on his presence that morning. They hadn't discussed it. There was no need. Selim was still helpless, and the children were vulnerable. And if an adversary wanted to get into the sprawling, unguarded house, there was no one to stop him, except the women and Gargery. The dear old idiot would die to defend any one of them. But that was about all he could do, if he didn't shoot himself first. After the others had gone to the castle, Ramses wandered rather aimlessly round the perimeter of the grounds, ending up at the clinic. The waiting room was full. Nefret's reputation had spread, but the need was so great, the lack of decent medical care so extensive, that any halfway competent physician would have more than she could handle. Ramses felt the same helpless rage Nefret must feel every day, every hour, when he saw the suppurating wounds and runny eyes, the sickly babies and the swollen bellies of girls in their early teens, 
Obstetrics was and would be a large part of Nofret's practice. Nizreen came out of the surgery. Blood spattered the front of her white gown, but she greeted him with an unperturbed smile. Do you wish to see Nur Misur? She is sewing up this patient now. No, I can see she's busy, unless there's something I can do to help. She waved him away with the patronizing air of a trained nurse dismissing male incompetence, and he went to see how Selim was getting on. Senia was with him, devouring honey cakes and discussing the second intermediate period. She was doing most of the talking. Glancing at Ramsay's, she said indistinctly, We're up to the Hyksos. So I hear, Ramsay said. A paw, claws fully extended, shot out from under her chair. Ramsay skipped aside. Horace's filthy temper hadn't mellowed, but he was slowing down physically. Are you sure Selim wants to hear about the Hyksos? Senia swallowed. He is very interested in Egyptian history. Aren't you, Selim? Selim rolled his eyes and grinned. The little bird is a good teacher. I'm good at taking care of sick people, too, Senia said complacently. And uh, the food here is excellent, Ramsay said, as she reached for another honey cake. You seem to be getting on nicely. Don't tire him, little bird. I am tired of lying here. Selim said, I feel well. Tell Nurmi Sur she must let me get up. The subject of his telling Nefret what to do was one he preferred not to pursue. He left. His next stop was in the courtyard, where the children were playing. After a quarter of an hour, Fatima made him go away, saying it was time for their luncheon and he was getting them too excited. The shrieks of protest that followed him did sound more vehement than usual. According to his mother, children were sensitive to atmosphere. The uneasiness of the adults was probably affecting them. Having exhausted all means of entertainment, he went back to the study and had just begun working when Gargery came in. There you are, sir, he said accusingly. We've been looking all over for you. Mr. David... You needn't announce me, Gargery, David said. Are you lunching, sir? We did not expect you. "'May I ask?' "'No,' Ramsay said. "'Run along, Gargery, and tell Fatima.' "'Tell her not to fuss,' David said. "'A sandwich will do.' Gargery ran along, sniffing. Ramsay leaned back in his chair. "'May I ask? I'm off to Luxor. "'We ran out of cotton wool and cloth. "'Aunt Amelia made me promise to take you along, "'but if you're busy, you aren't going to get out of it that easily.' Ramses pushed the papers aside. I've been translating that horoscope text for Mother. Couldn't concentrate on anything more difficult. What made her suppose you needed me to come along? I'm going to the railway station. And? And nothing, I hope. You think there'll be trouble? David smiled slightly. I have a foreboding. It was more than an idle premonition. It was the knowledge of how easily a group of idlers could turn into an angry mob. A crowd would certainly gather, inspired by curiosity and the hope of scavenging. Ramses blamed himself for failing to follow the current news, as David had. The situation was already volatile. The slightest provocation, real or fancied, could start a riot. And David would try to stop it. Damn it, Ramses thought. We don't need this. I'm with you, he said. Whenever you're ready. By the time they reached the station, it was early afternoon and the temperature was in the 90s. They heard the uproar some distance away. An irregular line of police held the crowd back from the tracks and the station, where several men in khaki were standing guard over the wreckage, ignoring the curses and waving fists with admirable British aplomb. How the soldiers had got there so quickly, Ramses didn't know. Allenby must have taken the precaution of dispatching mobile columns into potential hotspots. The police officers in their shabby uniforms didn't look happy. Many of them were in sympathy with the protesters. Someone was waving a banner with a rude and incorrectly spelled description of the Inglisi. The sun beat down like a furnace and dust fogged the air, kicked up by the shuffling feet. Stop a minute, Ramses said, catching hold of David before he could plunge into the thick of it. They're just letting off steam. What's going on? The man he addressed wore a ragged galabilla and a dirty rag wrapped round his head. He turned with a snarl on Ramses, recognised him, and turned the snarl into a propitiatory smile. We only wanted to take away the broken wood and the nails and bricks, brother of demons. 
What harm is there in that? But the accursed... The British stopped us. They want to find out what caused the explosion, David said. You will be allowed to remove the wreckage when they have finished. Tell your friends to go home. I? What sort of fool do you take me for? They are angry. And enjoying themselves, Ramsay said to David in English. Nothing like a jolly riot on a hot day to alleviate boredom. Someone is haranguing them, David said, trying to see over the field of bobbing turbans with an occasional red fez for contrast. The fellow was no orator, but he was loud and indignant. Words like oppression and injustice and the name of the exiled patriot, Zaglul, started an angry muttering. David swore and began to force his way through the closed-packed bodies. Ramses followed, shoving even harder and making suggestions. Go home, you fools. Get away from here. Think of your wives and children. Do you want to be shot? They made way for him, and a few took his advice to heart. But the orator was still screaming, and the front ranks of the mob surged forward. The police weren't armed, but the soldiers were. Hoping none of them would mistake him and David for rioters, Ramses dodged the hands of a hot-eyed protester, who was reaching for his throat and kicked the fellow's feet out from under him. The men in the front rank were the bravest, or, to look at it another way, the ones with the least sense— David flattened a few of them, fighting with the cool efficiency Ramses remembered so well. The ones nearest the victims began to have second thoughts. They backed off, leaving Ramses and David in the empty space before the beleaguered policeman. Where is the bastard? David panted, referring, Ramses assumed, to the orator. Faded into obscurity, it would appear. See if you can yell louder than he. David raised both arms and yelled louder. After a few sentences, the audience settled down to listen. Egyptians were peaceable souls, on the whole, and they enjoyed a good speech. Nods and sheepish looks acknowledged David's impassioned appeal. That it came from the heart, Ramses did not doubt. Violence will only bring harm to you and your families, my brothers. Does not God forbid killing except in self-defense? Be patient, freedom will come. I know this is true. I have fought for it, and I will go on fighting. He was the hero of the moment. Fickle as all mobs are, they surged towards him, the men who had resisted him before now trying to embrace him. Ramses, who admitted to being more evil-minded than his friend, had been scanning the jostling bodies and excited faces with a cynical eye. He saw the raised arm draw back and shoot forward, saw the stone hurtle through the air and threw himself at David. He was a half-second too late. Thus ends this excerpt. From Manuscript H. After considering the matter, I concluded we might as well stop for the day. There was no hurry. Most of the more valuable objects had been packed. I hadn't decided what to do about the beaded robe and the rolls of the Book of the Dead. The former had suffered since Martinelli treated and unfolded it. The colour had darkened perceptibly, and the fabric looked as if it would shatter at a touch. With a regretful sigh, I acknowledged what I had suspected from the first. We were bound to lose it, no matter what we did. So why not let Monsieur Lacour bear the ultimate responsibility? If he demanded we prepared it for transport, we would. And then he could amuse himself in Cairo, picking out loose beads and scraps of linen. As for the Book of the Dead, I was in hopes of persuading Monsieur Lacour to leave it with us for the time being. Softening and unrolling the brittle papyrus was a task at which Walter was particularly skilled. I doubted there was anyone in Cairo who could do it as well, and of course he was one of the world's leading authorities on the ancient texts. After I had reached this conclusion and explained it to the others, we enjoyed one of Catherine's excellent luncheons and dispersed. Evelyn to take a little rest. Walter to his papyrus, and Leah back to the house. "'Where are you off to?' Cyrus asked, watching me draw on my gloves and adjust my hat. I decided I might as well tell him the truth. "'I thought I'd pay a little visit to Abdullah's tomb before I go home.' "'Not alone,' Cyrus declared, beckoning the stableman to saddle Queenie. "'I don't know why you assume I'm in need of an escort, Cyrus. You let Leah go off alone.' "'I trust her, and I don't trust you.' said Cyrus, tugging at his goatee. Is that all you're going to do? Call on Abdullah and maybe ask for some advice? We are in need of advice, don't you think? I assure you I've no other aim in mind. I'm coming anyhow, said Cyrus. 
The climate of Egypt is very dry, but a temperature in the 90s is hot, whatever the humidity. The shade of the little monument was welcome after our ride across the baking desert. Cyrus paid the assiduous Abdul Rasa his dues and sat down, fanning himself with his hat and courteously looking elsewhere, while I entered the tomb. I did not kneel or pray aloud. Leaning against the wall, I closed my eyes and thought of Abdullah. I don't know what I expected. He had never come to me when I was in a waking state, and I had no reason to suppose he would respond to my silent appeal now. To be honest, it was not so much an appeal as an irritable demand. What was the use of having an informant on the other side if he couldn't or wouldn't inform me? The blackness behind my closed lids swam with little specks of colour, spirals and whirls of light. Sounds intensified, the shuffle of Abdul Rasa's sandals, the swish of the broom, the flap of birds' wings under the cupola, distant voices. A hand touched my shoulder. I opened my eyes and saw Cyrus's face close to mine. You were wobbling like a top when it starts to slow down, he said. What were you trying to do, put yourself in a trance? Entering a trance-like state when one is perpendicular is not very sensible, I said. Nor do I consider myself psychic in the usual sense of the word. You believe in your dreams, though? He gave me his arm. Abdul Rasa propped his broom against the wall and sat down in a pointed manner beside his bigging bowl. I added a few coins and answered Cyrus's implied question. Believe is not precisely the right word. I accept them. I suppose you are a skeptic. I don't know. Cyrus helped me to mount. I've seen a lot of strange things in my time, and I'd sure like to set eyes on good old Abdullah again. Do you have any luck? I didn't see him, if that's what you mean. I thought I may have been mistaken, but I thought I heard his voice. You were at the starting point, Sid. Now go on and watch where you step. What does that mean? Cyrus asked. Just if I know, Cyrus. Our attempt to behave normally at tea time, for the sake of the children, was not entirely successful. The patch of sticking plaster on David's brow could not be ignored. The other children accepted his assurances that it was the result of an unlucky accident, but David John kept pressing wet kisses on his nose and brow and ears, until I finally lured all of them into their barricaded corner with handfuls of biscuits. Desperate times justify desperate measures. We were just beginning to settle down when Sethos appeared at the door, demanding entrance. He must have been lunching in Luxor, for he was rather foppishly attired in a greenish tweed suit with a regimental tie to which I felt sure he was not entitled. Beard and hair were now iron grey, and his well-cut features had assumed their normal proportions. The only discordant note was a scowl, as formidable as one of Emerson's. "'Good afternoon,' I said, admitting him. "'Instead of replying, he fixed the scowl on David. "'What the devil do you think you're doing?' he demanded. "'You heard?' David inquired mildly. "'Of course I heard. It's all over Luxor, "'and by tomorrow at the latest it'll be all over Cairo "'that you fermented a riot today. "'You bloody young fool! "'Please!' I exclaimed. "'The children!' "'He didn't ferment a riot, he prevented one,' Ramsay said, "'returning the glare with interest.' There were British soldiers present. They heard. They heard a native talking Arabic. Sethos threw up his hands. They didn't understand a word. Nobody's going to believe what the Egyptians tell them. He was already under suspicion. He was trying to save lives, Leah said. She was sitting up very straight, and her cheeks were bright pink. I don't give a damn what he was trying to do. I've done my best to lull official suspicions. But if he persists in putting his nose in... Several persons burst into indignant rebuttal. Emerson's voice was the loudest and the most incoherent. I smiled to myself and remained silent. I had seldom seen Sethos so angry. It was a touching demonstration of concern. In the lull after the verbal storm, a soft voice made itself heard. I beg your pardon, uh, Sethos. You agree with me, Walter? Somewhat surprised, but expecting support, Sethos turned to him. Tell your impetuous son-in-law to back off. Uh, no, I will not do that, Walter said. Having silenced us all by this surprising statement, he went on in the same gentle, hesitant voice. 
A man must follow his own conscience. I was wrong when I demanded that David do otherwise. His is a powerful voice for restraint and for peaceful means of protest. I uh, believe in his cause, and I will support him to the extent of my ability. <laughs> Emerson exclaimed. Well said, Walter. Thank you, sir, David murmured. His eyes shone with tears. And so did those of Evelyn. Oh, father! Leah went to him and embraced him. Oh, blast! Sethos sat down and loosened his tie. I didn't intend to start a huge emotional orgy. If anyone cries, I shall walk out. No one is going to cry, I said, with a stern look at Mariam, who looked as if she was about to. I am well aware that your anger was caused by your affection for David, but it is somewhat alarming to those who are unaccustomed to the outbursts of temper that characterize the men of the family. Quite, said Ramses, still resentful of Sethos's criticism of his friend. It would be more helpful if you tried to ascertain what started the trouble. You claim to have connections in the highest levels of intelligence. Don't they have informants in the radical movement? Unfortunately, we lost our best agents when you and David retired, Sethos said. Are you suggesting that this disturbance was instigated by outside agitators? The compliment was wasted on Ramses. He was not proud of his expertise in deception. I am telling you that it was. I saw several strangers in the crowd. I thought I recognized one of them. Uh, the man who threw the stone, David? I didn't get a good look at him. David admitted, but I suppose it might have been... You mean that fellow Francois, the boy's bodyguard? But he... He's a Parisian apache, Ramses interrupted. At least he fights like one. What do you know about him, Marianne? She shrank back, her hands fluttering at the throat of her dress. Nothing. Honestly, he was with the party when I joined them. No one ever told me where he came from. I, I'm afraid of him... I've always been. Did he ever bother you? Emerson asked fiercely. Oh, no, nothing like that. His chivalrous indignation on her behalf produced a smile. I can't believe he would be involved in any cause. He's not that sort of man. Justin is his cause, if you like. He is fanatically protective, but he does hold grudges. Are you sure? She hesitated. Are you sure he was aiming at David when he threw the stone? Her suggestion made a certain amount of sense, which the image of Francois as a revolutionary did not. If he had been drawn to the scene by curiosity, he might well have taken advantage of the opportunity to get back at someone who had injured him, and, even more infuriating to a person of his temperament, defeated him. Ramses admitted he had simply assumed the missile was aimed at David. This is unacceptable, I declared. I would rather have nothing to do with any of them, but if that vicious French person is going around throwing things at people he dislikes, he must be stopped. Good heavens, Emerson, you may be next. That would suit me admirably, said Emerson, his sapphirine orbs brightening. I will just pay a little call on the old lady, and if I should happen to run into Francois, you will do nothing of the sort, Emerson, but Peabody... I will talk to her, if you like, Mariam said, diffidently. I've been thinking I ought to call on her and see how Justin is getting on. It is the least I can do after leaving them without notice. An admirable sentiment, drawled Sethos. I'll go with you. Perhaps the old lady will allow me to pay my compliments. I doubt she will, Mariam said. She went to get her hat, and I took Sethos aside. Why must you jeer at the girl? She's doing her best, and you're not trying at all to be... Fatherly, Sethos supplied, his lips twisting. I am trying, Amelia, believe it or not. You're afraid to allow yourself to care for her. Sethos caught himself on the verge of a shout. He glanced over his shoulder at the others and said through tight lips, Don't do that, Amelia. I am sufficiently aware of my motives and feelings. I don't need you to explain them to me. It was probably not a good time to mention the principles of psychology. I contented myself with a forgiving smile, and after a moment he said irritably, Very well. I'll take her to dinner in Luxor. How's that? I had intended to dine with your friend Mrs. Fisher, who knows every lady in the area. 
but uh, I'll send regrets. That would be very nice, I said. Immediately after dinner, Emerson went to his study, ostensibly to set the rest of you a good example by bringing his excavation diary up to date. The others also retired, though probably not with any intention of emulating Emerson. David's courageous act and Walter's unexpected commendation had brought a renewed awareness of that affection which is too often taken for granted. As Walter led his wife to the waiting carriage, she clung to his arm, and there was the old firmness in his stride. When I returned to the sitting room after seeing them off, Leah and David had already gone, and Ramses was on his feet. We'll say good night too, Mother, he said. Are you sure you wouldn't like another cup of coffee? I suggested. Or a little chat? He needs to rest, Mefret said, taking the hand Ramses offered and rising. He's had a rather long day. Good, indeed he has. I feel obliged to remark, Ramses, that in giving David his well-deserved praise, we slighted you. You saved David from serious injury and risked yourself, as you have always done, for the sake of friendship and the cause of... Don't make a speech, mother. He was laughing, though, and he bent his head to give me an affectionate kiss on the cheek. You'd have done the same, and probably more effectively. One glimpse of that parasol and the mob would have fled screaming. Oh, I almost forgot. I translated a few pages of that papyrus for you. They're on your desk. Thank you, dear boy. Nefret, how is Selim getting? I'll look in on him before we go to bed, said Nefret fondly, but firmly. Good night, mother. I did not feel it necessary to wait up for Mariam. It just so happened that I was sitting on the veranda, enjoying the peace of the quiet night, when they returned. Good evening, Amelia, Sethos said, helping his daughter out of the carriage. Since you've waited up, like a conscientious chaperone, I will not stay. Good night, Mariam. Mariam would have gone on her way through the garden had I not opened the door in a pointed manner. Sit down for a moment, I said pleasantly. Did you enjoy your dinner with your father? Yes, it was very nice. My expectant silence evoked additional comment. I didn't realize he was so popular. A number of people stopped to talk to him. A friend of yours, Mrs. Fisher, I believe, sent her best wishes. After extracting an introduction to you, I expect, newcomers to Luxor are always of interest. Did she remember having met you some years ago, when you were here with your husband? Did I meet her? I don't recall. It was a long time ago, and I have changed a great deal since then. The door to the house opened, and Emerson peered out. What are you doing out here? It's time for... Oh, hello, Mariam. Did you have a nice evening? Yes, sir, thank you. What about that scoundrel Francois? Emerson inquired. Did you see him? Yes, sir, I did. Mrs. Fitzroy called him to the saloon after I told her about the stone throwing. He... I... Don't stutter, child, Emerson said kindly. He denied it, I suppose. No, sir, he didn't. She raised her eyes to his face. He said terrible things about Ramses and you. He hates you. Not to worry said Emerson cheerfully. If he shows his face round here, I will deal with him. He won't. She spoke to him very sternly, threatened him with dismissal if he did anything like that again. That is the worst punishment he could receive, to be separated from Justin. Nevertheless, we will watch out for him, I declared. It won't be for long, Mariam said. They're leaving for Cairo in a few days. Justin has been unwell. Emerson had hoped to find an excuse to fight with Francois, but the next two days passed without a sign of him, or of any other trouble. The treasure was packed and ready to go, except for the items I had decided to leave, so I soothed Emerson by returning his staff to him and allowing him to get on with his excavations. The discovery of several nice votive statues and steely, which had been overlooked by earlier diggers, enabled him to ascribe one group of broken-down foundations to an 18th dynasty shrine, and Bertie finished his plan of the Amenhotep I temple. While digging out the cellar of a house in the village, Ramses came across another collection of ostraca. He translated one of the most interesting for us over luncheon one day. It falls into the category of what might be called letters to the dead, he explained. This appears to be written by a widower to his deceased wife. 
to the excellent equipped spirit Bakataman, what have I done to you that you have caused evil to come to me? I took you as wife, I did not put you away. I brought many good things to you, and when you sickened, I caused the chief physician to come to you. I wrapped you in fine linen and gave you a good burial, and since that time I have not known another woman, though it is right that a man like myself should do so. Yet you torment me and bring evil upon me. Does he say what sort of evil? Nefret inquired, her arms clasped round her raised knees. No, presumably he had a streak of bad luck. And blamed it on her, Leah said with a little laugh. Don't say it, Aunt Amelia. Just like a man, you mean? Persons of both genders and all cultures fall into that error, I admitted generously. It is comforting to ascribe misfortune to demonic influence, since one may hope to avert it by magical means, instead of being forced to accept it as inevitable. Or as one's own fault, Leah said. It does seem to me that he wouldn't have picked on her, poor dead woman, unless he knew he had done something to deserve her anger. Not that he would admit it. He couldn't, Ramses said, placing the fragment carefully in a padded tray. He says he's going to file a complaint against her in the Tribunal of the Gods. This is a formal appeal, a legal document, in a sense. Like taking the Fifth Amendment in American law, Bertie said with a grin. One wouldn't expect him to testify against himself. Emerson, who had listened with only half an ear, ordered everyone back to work. Sifting rubbish does not require one's full attention, if one is as experienced as I. The reader will no doubt anticipate the tenor of my wandering thoughts. Less perceptive individuals might have been reassured by the relative peace of those days without a single incident that could be viewed as hostile. To me, it was highly suspicious, the calm before the storm, the lull before the battle. Something was brewing. I felt it in my very bones, but... Though I had gone over and over the facts we knew, the pattern yet eluded me. Having been left one evening with no one to talk to, I went to my own little study. The weary workers had dispersed, Walter and Evelyn to the castle, and the others to their rooms, and Emerson to his own office. My desk was piled high with work in progress, including my own excavation notes, but I was diverted by three sheets of paper, covered with Ramsay's emphatic scrawl. It was the translation of the part of Walter's horoscope papyrus he had promised me. I hadn't had a chance to look at it before. It began with that memorable entry concerning the children of the storm. Memorable and seemingly significant, but as I glanced through the remainder of the pages I found nothing of interest. It is the day of Horus fighting with Set, was followed by... It is the day of peace between Horus and Set. Not surprisingly, the first was designated as very unfavourable and the second as very favourable. Neither could reasonably be said to have any bearing on our situation. After all, what had I expected? Deciphering Ramsay's handwriting always gave me a headache. I put the pages aside. Under them was one of my lists, the names of the women with whom Ramsay's had been involved. Guiltily, I wondered if he had seen it. He had. At the bottom of the page was another entry in that same emphatic scrawl. Shame on you, mother. I began idly sketching on a blank sheet of paper. I do not draw well, but I had learnt the rudiments, as all archaeologists must, and I had found this mechanical operation to be conducive to thought. When the hands are busy, the mind is free to wander at will. Never before had I been at such a loss to find a solution to a criminal case. I drew a rather nice little jar and added a few elements of decoration, lotus blooms, a hieroglyphic bird or two, a winged scarab. They reminded me of the jewellery with which we had bedecked ourselves. Vanity is a sin, but I had enjoyed it as much as the others. I tried, without great success, to sketch the horned ram of Amun, which had rested with such heavy import on my breast. It was one of the simpler ornaments, despite the complexity of the beautifully sculpted animal. Much Egyptian jewellery is made up of many different elements, like the pectoral that had been stolen, 
with its central scarab and row of lotus blossoms below and the two flanking cobras. I drew them and added nice little white crowns to their heads. And as my pencil moved randomly across the paper, my mind moved as randomly, mentally fingering the disparate elements of the pattern we had attempted to establish, arranging them and rearranging them. Had not Abdullah assured me the pattern was there? I was inclined to believe I had really heard his voice that day, for it was like Abdullah to throw out a tantalizing, equivocal statement instead of giving me a direct answer. You are at the beginning. My fingers clenched so tightly on the pencil that the point broke off. That too is part of the pattern, he had said once before, when we talked of his elevation to the road of Sheikh, and his tomb was the beginning. I stared at the uncompleted sketch of the pectoral, and I knew there was one pattern we hadn't considered, and one avenue of information we hadn't explored. Inspired and revived, I sprang to my feet and hastened out of the house. My peremptory knocking went unanswered for some time, but I persevered. Not until Ramses himself opened the door did I realize how late was the hour. No, oh dear, I said. Did I wake you? I wasn't asleep. He tied the belt of his robe and ran his hand over his tumbled curls. What's wrong? Come in and tell me. No, no, I'm sorry to have disturbed you. I have only a single question. When I asked it, his drowsy eyes opened wide and his jaw dropped. I don't remember. Why on earth? You had heard the name of the place, though. I may have done. Father might know. Have you asked him? I prefer not to mention the subject to your father. Try to remember. I could telegraph Thomas Russell, but time is of the essence. He shook his head. It's been several years, and I don't understand why... Oh, well, perhaps it'll come to you in the night, when your mind is on something else, I said helpfully. That is how memory works. Do not hesitate to come to me immediately, whatever the hour. He was wide awake now, but he'd learned not to persist in questions I had no intention of answering. His lips curved in an expression that might have betokened amusement, though I rather doubted it. I wouldn't want to wake you, mother, or disturb you when your mind is on something else. Don't worry about that, my dear. I am a light sleeper. If you say so. Come, I'll walk you back to the house, Ramsay said, stifling a yawn. No, thank you, my dear. You ought not go out of doors barefoot. And by the time you found your shoes, you might wake Nefret. She's awake. Am I to take it that you don't want me to mention the subject to her either? See here, mother. Until later, then, I said, and got away before he could object. Most of the lanterns along the path had burned out. The area seemed much darker now than it had when, sped by the wings of discovery, I had traversed it earlier. Something larger than a mouse or a shrew rustled in the shrubbery, I knew it was probably one of the cats, but I'm not ashamed to confess that I moved as fast as I dared. It was somewhere around three in the morning when I was aroused by a scratching at the window. Emerson did not stir. He can sleep through a thunderstorm. I made sure my nightdress was modestly buttoned before I went to the window and leaned out. We always kept a lamp burning in the courtyard. By its light, I recognized the tall form of my son. His posture and the tilt of his head indicated a certain degree of vexation. "'You have remembered?' I whispered. "'Yes, it came to me,' Ramses added in an expressionless murmur. "'When I was thinking of something else. "'The place is about thirty miles south of here, on the West Bank. "'I presume there's no point in asking you why. "'You will learn the answer tomorrow. "'I want you to come with me. "'And don't tell your father.' "'Oh, no, Fred, no.' "'I glanced over my shoulder. "'Emerson had turned over and was muttering to himself.' When he reaches for me and I'm not there, he becomes agitated. I will make the necessary arrangements, I hissed. Go now, your father is stirring. Emerson sat up. Peabody, he shouted. Ramses vanished into the darkness. Getting away without Emerson's knowledge was not easy, but I managed it by telling him he could have Leah and David with him that day. Emerson said, Ramses... And I said, he promised to finish a translation for me this morning. We'll be along later. Emerson wisely decided to take what he could get and swept Leah and David out of the house as soon as they had finished breakfast. For fear I would change my mind. 
The Fred and Mariam were not at the breakfast table. I assumed the former was with a patient, and at that moment I didn't care where Mariam had got to. As long as she was not in my way. Like me, Ramses was attired as he would have been for a day at the excavation, so we didn't have to delay to change. As we left the house, I selected a particularly sturdy parasol. I hadn't seen the train station since the explosion, and was surprised to find so little damage. Business was going on as usual. We were recognised, of course, and had to answer a number of friendly questions and listen to the latest gossip. The train was an hour late, which was not unusual. It was a local, with only second and third class carriages. As Ramses helped me into one of the former, I saw a familiar form on the platform. Catching my eye, Dr. Khatab swept off his fez, placed a fat hand on his embroidered waistcoat, and bowed. I concluded he must be meeting someone, since he didn't board the train. The aged carriage jolted and clanked along the rails, and a fine sandy dust blew in through the open window. Ramses put a steadying arm round me and offered me a handkerchief. You didn't bring your knife, I said. Are you expecting trouble? You might have mentioned it. I do not expect it, but I believe in being prepared. Never mind, I have my belt of tools and my parasol. That should suffice, Ramses agreed. You told everyone who asked where we were going. I also left a message for your father, should we fail to return. Damn it, mother! The train hit a bump. I bounced, and he tightened his grip. I beg your pardon? Are you going to confide in me now? In the cold light of morning, my brilliant inspiration did not shine as brightly. I rather regretted wasting an entire day on a far-fetched idea, and bouncing up and down on the hard seat was cursed uncomfortable. It will all be made clear to you at the proper time, I said, hoping it would be made clear to me as well. Ramsay said another bad word. This time, he did not apologise. From a distance, the village looked quite picturesque, set in a grove of palm trees, with a pretty little minaret poking up through the branches. Experience had taught me that close up, the effect was less picturesque than nasty, and as we approached, the village looked no different from dozens of others I'd seen. The same flat-roofed, plastered, mud-brick houses, the same chickens and pigeons pecking at the dirt under the trees, the same pack of children dashing toward us with outstretched hands asking for bakshish, the same black-clad women pausing in their work of grinding grain or kneading bread to stare curiously at us. However... As the small predators gathered round, I noticed that their half-clad or unclad bodies were healthily rounded and their eyes free of infection. Even the dogs skulking behind us were not so lean as most. There were other signs of prosperity, rows of gracefully shaped water jars baking in the sun outside the potter's house, several webs of wolf threads stretched between the trunks of palm trees with busy weavers at work, I left Ramses to deal with the predators, which he did by promising bakshish, much bakshish, if they would take us to the house of the man we sought. Before we had gone far along the narrow lane, we saw a man hurrying toward us, his hands outstretched, his face wearing a happy smile, as if he were coming to greet old friends. He was young and well set up, though running a trifle to fat. "'God's blessing be upon you, brother of demons!' he cried, and threw his arms around Ramses. "'Welcome! How good it is to greet you again!' "'Greetings to you, Musa,' said Ramses, freeing himself with a rather peremptory shove. "'This is... Ah, but who would not know this is Akim?' The fellow flopped down onto the ground and kissed my dusty boots. "'It is an honour! My lord has heard of your coming. He eagerly awaits you!' He dismissed our youthful entourage with a few words, and, to my surprise, they dispersed without argument. The house to which he led us was built of stone, probably pilfered from ancient monuments, and surrounded by trees and a nice little garden. In the Mandara, the principal reception room, a pleasant chamber furnished with low tables and a cushioned divan, El Garbi was waiting. I had heard of him many times, but this was the first time I had set eyes on him. Instead of the women's robes and jewels he had once affected, he wore a simple caftan of blue silk and a matching turban, but his round black face was carefully painted. 
Cole outlined his eyes, and lips and cheeks were reddened with henna. A sweet, pervasive aura of perfume wafted round him. "'Don't get up,' I said, watching in some alarm as he writhed and wriggled. "'I had spoken English. He understood, but he replied in Arabic. "'This is how Kim is gracious. Alas, I am old and even fetter than I once was.' He clapped his hands, and Musa trotted off. "'Be seated, please,' the procurer went on. "'We will drink tea together.' You honor me by your presence, you and your illustrious son. Beautiful as ever, I see. He leered amiably, not at me, but at Ramses, who replied equably, And you are flourishing as ever? The village seems prosperous. El Gabi rolled his eyes and looked pious. I cannot see children go hungry, and the old and sick left to die. I have helped. Yes, I have helped a little. One must make one's peace with God before the end and atone for one's sins. Neither of us was rude enough to say that he had quite a list for which to atone, but he must have known what we were both thinking. His black eyes twinkled and his large body shook with silent laughter. Is it not written, whoever performs good works and believes, man or woman, "'Shall enter into paradise?' "'The quotation was correct, "'and his was not the only faith that implies "'there is salvation for a repentant sinner. "'At least the Quran demanded good works "'instead of a desperate last-second mumble of belief. "'Musa returned with several servants carrying trays. "'They were all men, all young and all quite handsome. "'Tea was handed round and fresh-baked bread offered.' while El Gabi carried on a polite conversation. "'And your lovely wife is well? May God protect her, and the father of curses. Ah, how kind he was to me. The motor car I uh, procured for him several years ago was satisfactory, I presume? And the forged papers. I was so happy to do those small services for him. May God protect him.' The whole performance had a certain element of parody, but it wouldn't have been courteous to interrupt. Finally, he gave me my opening by asking us to stay and dine that evening. Musa will show you the village. You will admire it, I think. You're most kind, but I fear we cannot stay, I said. We must be back in Luxor tonight. I came only to ask you a question. One question? All this way? For a single question? He put his fat hands on his knees and nodded benignly. I live only to serve you, Sitakim. What would you ask? Now that the moment had come, I had to force myself to speak. Ramses was watching me intently, and so was the procurer. You sent us a warning once, I said. You said, if I remember correctly, that the young serpent... Um, also had poisoned fangs. I remember, Sit. I hope the warning came in time. That remains to be seen, I said, avoiding the astonished gaze of my son. She is staying with us now. I have no reason to believe she means us harm, but I must know what prompted your words. Her marriage to the American gentleman ended badly, and she is... Marriage? American? His eyes widened until the coal rimming them cracked. "'You must have known it,' I said. "'You are reputed to know everything.' "'I knew, but, Sitakim, it was not that one I meant. "'It was the other one.' "'Chapter 12 "'The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. "'Nefret did not learn of her husband's deception,' as she viewed it, until midday, when her father-in-law burst into the surgery. The patient was a woman whom Nefret was treating for a breast lesion. She let out a squawk of offended modesty, and Emerson backed out as quickly as he had entered. "'How much longer will you be?' he shouted from the next room. "'Not long.' She sent the woman away with a little pot of ointment and went into the waiting room. Emerson was stamping up and down, swearing. "'Read this!' He thrust a crumpled paper at her. None of the chairs in the waiting room was occupied. 
If there had been other patients, they had beat a hasty retreat. No man dares face the wrath of the father of curses. Wrathful he was, blue eyes snapping, teeth bared. Well, he demanded, do you know anything about this? Nefret's own anger rose as she read the brief message. Ramses and I have gone off on a little expedition. We will be back this evening. In the event that we have not returned by tomorrow morning, you may look for us at a village called El Hile, approximately three miles south of Esna, on the west bank. I consider this contingency highly unlikely, however. Abianto, my dear Emerson. Damn him, Nefret said, closing her fist over the paper. Ah, said Emerson, in a less accusatory voice. They didn't tell you either? No. She considers it highly unlikely that they will fail to return, does she? What is this village? The name means nothing to me. Emerson took out his pipe, remembered that she didn't allow it in the clinic, and started for the door. Let us ask Selim. No. Nefret whipped off her gown and tossed it onto a chair. I won't have Selim worried. Come outside, father. A feathery tamarisk tree gave partial shade to a wooden bench which had been placed there for the accommodation of patients when the waiting room was full. Emerson sat down and filled his pipe. Now, now, my dear, don't be upset. She does this sort of thing all the time, you know. He doesn't. He swore to me he would never go off on his own again. Nefret tucked a stray lock of hair under her cap. Her fingers were shaking. He's not alone, Emerson pointed out. Don't blame Ramses. If I know my wife, and I believe I do, she insisted he keep it a secret. He could have refused. There are other loyalties. The knowledge that Ramses was with his mother did not give her the comfort Emerson had intended. She's as bad as he is, Nefret burst out. The two of them together? Hmm, well... Hmm. Unable to refute this, Emerson smoked in silence for a few moments. They must have caught the southbound train. There isn't another until this evening. We could take the horses. How far is this place? Over thirty miles. It sounds as if they expect to catch the afternoon train back to Luxor. Hmm. That would give them only a few hours in the cursed place. I wonder what... He shook his head in exasperation. There is no sense in speculating or in following them. If the northbound train is on time, they will be on their way back by the time we get there. How can you be so complacent? Aren't you angry? I was briefly put out, Emerson admitted. However, I should be accustomed to Peabody's little tricks. We've played this game for years, each trying to be the first to solve a case. She cheats, you know. Then there's nothing we can do but wait, Nefret muttered. That's how I see it. I may as well go back to work for a few hours. Let me know if they turn up. Nizreen put a cautious head out the door. Emerson, who hadn't noticed her before, gave her an affable smile. Emboldened, she ventured out. No, monsieur, there is a sick one who has come back. And this message. From Ramses? Emerson asked expectantly. No. The curving, ornate handwriting was unfamiliar. Nefret ripped the envelope open. It's from Dr. Hattab, Mrs. Fitzroy's physician. Justin is ill. He asks if I will have a look at the boy. I'll go with you. That's silly, Nefret said impatiently. What possible harm could come to me in broad daylight, with hundreds of people around? I'll deal with my patient. It's probably that old hypochondriac Abdul Hamid wanting more sugar water and be back in a few hours. By the time she set out for Luxor, she was in a calmer frame of mind. Ramses couldn't be in serious trouble. She would know, as she had always known, if danger threatened him. She would have a few words to say to him when he got back, though, on the subject of promises broken and trust betrayed. But in a way, she didn't blame him. His mother was an elemental force, as hard to resist as a sandstorm. As Nefret approached the Isis, she saw signs of unusual activity and deduced that the Dahabiya was preparing to get underway. The doctor was waiting for her at the head of the gangplank, his hat in his hand. His waistcoat was particularly resplendent, glittering with gold threads. My dear lady, how good of you to come. He grasped her hand and would have kissed it if she had not pulled it away. What's wrong with him? she asked. Uh, fever. The broad smile 
with which he had greeted her, was replaced by a worried frown. "'I have tried without result to bring it down. Our departure is imminent, as you have no doubt observed, but it will take several days to reach Cairo, and my mistress wants to be sure all possible ways of relieving the boy are taken before she cut him off. Then let's not waste time talking. Take me to him. To be sure. Follow me. He indicated the shadowy passage that led between the cabins to the saloon. The doors lining it were closed, so that the only light came from the open entrance through which they had come. After you, said the doctor, bowing, it is the last door on the right. His vast shadow enveloped her, and her hand took her by the elbow as if to guide her steps. He was close behind her. She could hear his quick breathing, and she stopped, resisting the pressure on her arm, seized with sudden panic. Too late. His arm gripped her, pinning her arms, and his hand clamped over her mouth. She struggled, but he had her in a hold that was impossible to break, the great bulk of his body as impervious to blows as a feather bed, the big fat hand covering half her face. She kicked back. Pain shot up her ankle as her heel slammed into his shin, and with a grunt of annoyance, he pinched her nose shut, cutting off the last of her breath. A darkening vision swam with purple and green lights as her legs gave way. When he took his hand from her face, she could only gasp, sucking in air, while he opened one of the doors and pushed her into the room beyond. She felt her hands and knees. The door slammed, leaving her in total darkness. Nefret rolled over onto her back and lay still for a time, getting her breath back and trying, not so successfully, to get her thoughts in order. She had made a bad mistake, but that didn't matter now. What mattered was what they meant to do with her and how she could prevent it. A wry smile touched her bruised lips. She had found her mother-in-law's gang, and by the method favoured by that estimable lady... How many of them were involved? The entire crew, almost certainly. The doctor couldn't take her captive without their knowledge. It was possible that the boy and his grandmother were unwitting dupes used by a group of criminals for their own purpose. Neither of them was mentally competent. Mariam was not incompetent, though, and she was her mother's daughter. The floor under her vibrated more strongly as the beat of the engines increased. Khatab hadn't lied about that. The boat was getting under way. She started to stand up and then made herself remain on her knees. She had no idea how large the room was, how high the ceiling. The blackness was palpable. She could almost feel it pressing against her eyeballs, her face, her body. The air was hot and close, with a strange metallic tang. Fighting the temptation to close her eyes and curl up into a fetal position, she edged forward, arms extended. She had found a wall and was following it, trying to get some idea of the dimensions of her prison, when the door was flung open. Even that much light was welcome after the claustrophobic darkness, but she couldn't see much, for the opening was blocked by several bodies. The doctor's familiar, hateful voice said, A companion for you, my dear lady, and a patient as well. Justin was her first thought, but there were two men carrying the limp body. They dropped it unceremoniously onto the floor, and backed away as Nefret flung herself down beside Emerson. Sinking her teeth into her lower lip to keep from crying out, his eyes were closed and one side of his face was smeared with blood. Bastards, she gasped. What have you done to him? Such language from a lady, the doctor said with a high-pitched giggle. I regret the necessity, but he is as hard to stop as a charging elephant. I don't believe he is seriously injured. Take care of him. Wait, Nefret said desperately. The door was closing. I need light, water, my medical bag. You surely don't expect me to hand over that bag with its nice little collection of scalpels and probes. Another giggle. God, she thought, the man is as mad as Justin. Madder, he's reveling in this. Please, she whispered. I suppose I could leave you a lamp, the doctor conceded. There is water here. You'll have to manage with that until we can make other arrangements. We weren't expecting him, you see. He issued a low-voiced order in Arabic. One of the men put the lamp down on the floor. The door closed. Nefret looked wildly round the room. 
There was a jar, presumably containing water, in one of the corners she hadn't reached in her blind exploration, and a crude clay cup next to it. She didn't look for anything else. Splashing water into the cup, she wet her handkerchief and went back to Emerson. Father, father, please say something, she whispered. The blood came from a single cut, which had bled profusely, as scalp wounds do. Her fingers probed the spot, finding only a rising lump. Anxiety hardened her touch, and Emerson stirred. Hell and damnation, he remarked. It's me, father, she heard herself laugh, as insane a sound as the doctor's. Oh, father, are you all right? I am, said Emerson, flat on his back, scowling like a gargoyle, a bloody fool, rushing in where angels fear to tread. Peabody will never let me hear the end of this. Fret, my dear, are you crying? Don't cry. I can't stand it when you cry. Did they hurt you? No. I'm sorry, Father. I'm just so relieved that you aren't. Takes more than a bump on the head to kill me, said Emerson with satisfaction. I am the one who should apologise. I walked right into it, like a rabbit into a snare, and now they've got both of us. What sort of place is this? Let's have a look. Don't move yet. Her handkerchief was saturated. She threw it aside and began unbuttoning her blouse. Time to tear up some extraneous garment or other, said Emerson coolly. Not your garments, though. Your mother would not approve. My shirt. It's too cursed hot in here anyhow. She bandaged the cut, but Emerson refused a drink. Better not. It may be drugged. Let's see what we have here. He got to his feet, steadying himself with a hand on the wall as the boat dipped. They were prepared for you, he said, looking round. Or for someone. This isn't a stateroom, it's a prison. The small room had been stripped of all furnishings except a piece of matting, six feet long and several feet wide, the water jar and another larger vessel. The windows were covered with heavy boards, the nail heads fresh and unrusted, shone in the light. They might have left an air hole, said Emerson, running his hands over the boards. Have you anything we could use to prise up these nails? Nefret shook her head. Emerson unfastened his belt. Not strong enough, he said, examining the buckle. We may as well give it a try. Tell me what happened. Did you see the boy or the old lady? No. She knew what he was doing, keeping her mind active and her hopes up, and at the same time searching for some clue that would help them. The damned doctor met me and brought me straight here. Justin and Mrs. Fitzroyce may not know what is going on, but Maria must. The attacks on her are the extraneous parts of the pattern. They were staged. She stabbed poor Melusine herself with a heavy needle or a nail. Hmm... The metal rasped like a file as he dug away the wood around one of the nail heads. What about the second appearance of Hathor? Perhaps she hired some local girl to play the part. That incident was designed to provide her with an unbreakable alibi. Nefret sat down, cross-legged on the mat. There was nothing she could do but watch, and as her eyes moved over the impressive form of her father-in-law, her spirits lifted. It did take more than a knock on the head to kill Emerson, or discompose him for long. He began to hum under his breath. She recognized the melody, though it was horribly off-key. She never saw the streets of Cairo. She never saw the coochie-coochie. Oh, curse it, said Emerson. He tossed the broken buckle aside and sat down beside her. Nefret wrapped both hands around his upper arm and laid her cheek against his shoulder. I'm not glad you're here, father. "'but there's only one other man on earth I'd rather have with me.' "'Well, now,' said Emerson, self-consciously. "'Not my ingenious brother.' "'He's good,' Nefret conceded. "'But he's not you. "'Or Ramses.' "'He's charming, though,' Emerson said gloomily. "'I'm not.' "'I think you are.' "'Your mother doesn't.' "'Father, that's not true.' "'She squeezed his arm.' "'comforted by the feel of the hard muscles under her hands "'and by his monumental calm. "'I've been behaving like a boor,' Emerson muttered. "'Ever since he arrived, 
He brings out the worst in me and rouses the direst of suspicions. At first she thought he was referring to his long-held jealousy of his brother. Then she let out a gasp. He can't be a party to this. I wish I could be sure enough, Rhett. That little girl cannot have planned this business. It's too devilish and too complex. There's someone else behind it, and some motive stronger than revenge for a long-past death. What? It is a fatal error, said Emerson, obviously quoting, to speculate without sufficient data. We've quite a bit of data, though. Speculation helps pass the time. Is that what you and Mother do when you're shut up in a place like this? Generally, we argue about whose fault it was. Emerson chuckled as if he didn't have a care in the world. Come, my dear girl, think. What motive leaps to mind where Sethos is concerned? What was he doing in Jerusalem? Not working for the war office, Smith made that clear. Someone gave him a beating, which I do not doubt he well deserved, because he had tried to interfere with their business arrangements. Since the war, Palestine and Syria have become a paradise for looters and tomb robbers. What is in that room at the castle, neatly packed and ready to be transported? It hit her like a blow in the stomach. The treasure! Good Lord, no, I don't believe it! That call will arrive tomorrow and load the cases onto the steamer, Emerson said, inexorably logical. It won't take him long. He'll go straight back to Cairo. The Isis is a modern vessel with a large crew, easily large enough to overpower the guards on the government steamer and unload the cargo. There is unrest in Egypt because of the arrival of the Milner Commission. The theft of the treasure will be put down to radicals. They'll have to kill the witnesses, she said numbly, and sink the steamer. Not necessarily. Sethos is not a violent man, but there is no one better equipped to get a load like that into the marketplace. The lamplight flickered. Their shadows rushed back and forth as if frantic to escape. She felt his lips brush her hair, and then he gently detached his hands and got to his feet. If Sethos is the ringleader, you've nothing to fear. He wouldn't harm you. Better get hold of that lamp before it falls over. We're picking up speed. The motion of the ship was more pronounced. Emerson began going through his pockets. Went off without my coat, he said, removing a handful of motley objects and inspecting them. No pipe, no tobacco, no matches. No gun, no knife, said Nefret, trying to emulate his coolness. They overlooked these. Emerson picked half a dozen nails out of the mess and shoved the rest of it back in his trouser pocket. Do they search you? It came back to her then, the sensation of hands moving over her body. Big, fat hands. She grimaced. Superficially. He was looking for a weapon. I didn't have one. Take these. Emerson handed her three of the nails. And hide them, not in your pocket. They may decide to search you again. He went back to the window and began scraping. That fellow spoke of other arrangements, he said over his shoulder. If they separate us... Oh, no, Nefret whispered. If that happens... Well, my dear, a nail isn't much of a weapon, but a sharp jab in the region of a man's kidneys or elsewhere will certainly give him pause. Not to worry. I'll get you out of this somehow. It's my fault. If I hadn't been such a bloody idiot, there would be help on the way now. Nefret took a deep breath and steadied herself and her voice. If you're a bloody idiot, so am I. I ought to have suspected something when he brought me here. Could you have done anything if you had? Emerson inquired reasonably. Maybe not. He's as strong as a bull, and even if I could have overpowered him, I'd have had to evade the crewmen. They must be in on this. No doubt about that. Three of the bastards jumped me as soon as I was on board. Admittedly, my demeanour was not that of a gentleman paying a social call. Nefret hugged her knees and laughed, picturing him charging up the gangplank, fists clenched, shouting out accusations. Stop blaming yourself. If you had delayed to get help, the boat would probably have sailed. Why did you come after me? Emerson went on chipping. Well, you see, it suddenly came to me when I was thinking of something else. I remembered who it was who lived in El Hile. And why it... Damnation! Shove those things out of sight and come here. 
there was only time to push the nails into the tops of her shoes before the key turned in the lock and the door opened a crack. Stand back, the doctor said. He sounded nervous. I have a gun. Very nice, Emerson said. He stood in front of Nefret, seemingly relaxed, but she had seen him and his son in that pose before. They could both move with the speed of a charging lion. We all have guns. Someone pulled the door back. The opening looked like the entrance to the infernal regions, blocked by hulking bodies and redly lit. Don't risk it, father, Nefret whispered, taking hold of his arm. She knew Emerson's temper only too well, and as her eyes adjusted to the light, she saw that there were at least three of them in addition to the doctor. <laughs> Emerson settled back on his heels. They're bound to hit something in this confined space. Might be you. The doctor took a step forward, and then thought better of it. Obeying his curt order, two of the men edged cautiously into the room. Both held pistols, and one carried a lantern. The doctor remained where he was. Leading your regiment from behind, I see, remarked Emerson. Now what? Move forward, slowly, one step at a time. Hold out your hands. No, madame, not you. Remain where you are. His voice shook and so did the hand that held the pistol. There was nothing for it but to obey. The odds were too great and they were both weaponless. Emerson shrugged. You should have done this before you tossed me in here, he pointed out, as one of the men fastened a pair of handcuffs over his wrists. Saved yourself all this fuss and worry. Poor planning. Who's in charge here, anyhow? I hate talk like that. The doctor's voice rose into falsetto. His lips drew back. I hate you damned British with your supercilious sneers and your superior airs. How dare you condescend to me? How dare you look at me that way? Don't look at me that way. His hand lashed out. The barrel of the gun caught Emerson across the face. He fell back against the wall, his knees buckling. Please, Lefret said, please don't hurt him again. Her hands were clenched, her nails digging into her palms. But if the man wanted her to beg, she would. You have better sense than he, the doctor muttered. You too, get him out of here. The men he indicated exchanged dubious looks. Coming within arm's reach of an angry father of curses, even when he was barely able to stay on his feet, was not a job a sensible man relished. One of them got up sufficient nerve to grip Emerson's left arm. The other jabbed the gun into his ribs. Go with them, father, Nefret said. There's no use resisting. Emerson raised his hands and wiped blood off his chin. I wasn't resisting, he said in an injured voice. Meek as a lamb. Out, the doctor shrieked. Take him out of here. Emerson submitted without further comment to being led toward the door. I can't let him go like this without a word, Nefret thought. I may never see him again. To hell with stiff upper lips. Father, I... Yes, my dear, I know. He gave her a quick glance over his shoulder and smiled. A bianto. That said it all, really. Not goodbye. See you soon. A bianto, Nefret said. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. El Gabi bade us farewell with unconcealed glee. We were deeply in his debt now, and I knew it was only a matter of time before we received a demand, couched as an obsequious request for recompense. We cut his courtesies short and hurried away. I didn't want to miss the train. Trains are always late when one is on time, and on time when one is late. I kept telling myself there was no need for haste, but I failed to convince myself. Our discovery had altered the entire picture. We arrived at the station at Esna in ample time. The train was late. There were only a few English persons on the platform. Students, to judge by their youth and their casual clothing, the vendors of fake antiquities identified us at a glance. Those who did not know Ramses personally recognized my parasol and my belt of tools and left us alone. Other merchants were selling water, fruit and vegetables. 
I took a seat on the single bench next to a grey-bearded gentleman holding a rooster. The gentleman bared a mouthful of brown teeth and greeted me effusively. The rooster cocked its head and gave me a hot, mad glare. Ramses paced up and down, circling groups of squatting Egyptians who were accustomed to such delays, and who whiled away the time nibbling on sweetmeats and gossiping. I, too, was accustomed to such delays, but as the sun sank into the west and the shadows lengthened, the knowledge we had gained that day lay more and more heavily on my shoulders. The rooster stretched out its neck and gave me a sharp peck on the arm. I accepted the apologies of its owner, but I could no longer sit still. Rising, I joined Ramses, who had stopped to chat with a small party, consisting of a man and a woman and a babe in arms. The young mother was unconcernedly suckling her infant, while her husband talked with Ramses and scratched his stomach. "'Are you hungry, mother?' he asked. "'They have kindly offered to share their dinner.' The man fished a chunk of grey bread out of the basket beside him and offered it to me. His hand and the bread were both extremely dirty, and I felt sure he was covered with fleas. But his generosity and his smile were so gracious that I would have taken the bread and my chances with fleas and disease, had I not suspected that there was not much food in the basket. They were very young, and their garments were threadbare. I explained in my best Arabic that I thanked them for their kindness, but that I had just eaten and drew Ramses away. "'Can you give them some money?' I whispered, without offending them. "'Poverty does not allow a man the luxury of pride,' said Ramses, with a twist of his lips. "'I'll take care of it. But if I start handing out Bakshish openly, everyone else will ask.' The train track stretched emptily into the distance, shining in the sunset. "'Cuss it!' I burst out. Where does the cursed train? We are going to be very late and your father will be fuming. So will Nefret. But they will forgive us, inshallah, when they hear. Mother, we are within a few hours of ending this business. Be patient. Emerson will be knocked into a cocked hat, I agreed, not without a certain relish. Ramsay's face relaxed. I don't think you mean that, mother. It is the wrong expression? I am endeavouring to improve my command of current idiom, I explained. Some of the new slang words are extremely expressive. Never mind, you know what I meant. Quite. A pigeon flapped between my feet, and he took my arm. I was knocked for a loop, too. Who could have suspected that Bertha had two children? The children of the storm, I mused. Is it only an odd coincidence that set was the god of storm and chaos? Yes, Ramses said curtly. Quite. I believe you have never known me to succumb to... Oh, thank heaven, there's the train at last. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Nefret had wrapped a bit of cloth round the head of the nail... It served as some protection, but her fingers kept cramping. The wood was soft. She had scraped away enough to expose a half-inch length of the shaft. It moved a bit when she tried to wriggle it, but it was too deeply sunk to be pulled out with her fingers, and she had nothing to use as a lever. The lamp had long since expired. It seemed long, but there was no way of measuring time in the stifling darkness. Her throat was dry, and the slosh of water in the invisible jar was a constant temptation. She knew now that she wouldn't break down. Being with one of the Emerson men, and at least one of the women, even briefly, was like a shot of adrenaline for a faltering heart. She couldn't imagine what Emerson could do, but he had promised he would get her out of this, and against all reason, she believed him. The others wouldn't be idle, but it might take them a while to put two and two together, her absence and that of Emerson, the departure of the Isis. At least they knew where she had gone, Nizreen would tell them. Emerson might not have bothered to inform anyone. He had come after her as soon as that mysterious memory returned, on the road to Dear El Medina, since he had been only a few minutes behind her. If they hadn't been interrupted, she would know what it was he had remembered and why it had sent him rushing after her. If the village of El Hile was the key, Ramses and or his mother must know too— and if the knowledge was so important, they might also be in danger. She thought of her husband, 
picturing him in her mind, the tall strength of him, the curling black hair he kept trying to flatten, the smile that warmed his lean brown face, reaching out, stretching the mental sense that bound them together. She'd always known when he was threatened with death or injury. There was no such feeling now. She wiped her stinging eyes on her sleeve. Perspiration, not tears, she told herself. Mariam. It all came back to Mariam. Emerson refused to believe the girl was the one primarily responsible. But that was only because he was soft-hearted and sentimental. Lafrette dug viciously into the wood. The nail slipped, digging a long, ineffectual gouge, and her numbed fingers lost their grip. She heard the nail hit the floor and bounce. She knelt and felt round for it. No luck. I'll just rest a little, she thought, slumping against the wall. Rest and try to think. Emerson, soft-hearted and sentimental, and jealous. Jealousy was responsible for the case he had constructed against Sethos. It had sounded convincing when he stated it, but the case against Mariam was even stronger. She knew something about disguise, enough to fool a vague old woman and seduce a vain man. Her mother had been deeply involved with the criminal underworld. Bertha had even formed her own group, a criminal organization of women. Enlisting prostitutes had been one of Bertha's brighter ideas. Exploited and mistreated, they had unique opportunities to gather information that could be used for blackmail or murder. What had become of those women? Women like Layla, who had in the end turned against her leader and saved Ramsay's life. Women like the formidable female, strong and sturdy as a man, who had been Bertha's aide-de-camp in several of the latter's crimes. The stories had become part of family legendary, told and retold, wild as any romance and embroidered with the passage of time. There had been equally preposterous stories about Sethos in his unregenerate days, and about Bertha, who had been Sethos's mistress after she left the man known as Schlanger, Another of the innumerable enemies the parents had encountered. What a long list it was. Her head dropped with a jerk, bringing her back to consciousness. Breathing was an effort. Swallowing was impossible. There was no air in the room, only darkness and heat and thirst. She knew she would have to risk a drink soon or fall into a stupor that could end in death. Perhaps that was what they intended. No marks on the body. No signs of violence. It was impossible to think of oneself as a body, a thing, the thinking mind, the laughter and loving obliterated forever, to imagine the world going on without one. She thought of her children, and anguish wrenched her. But they were so young, so surrounded by loving care. In a few years, she would be nothing more to them than a face in a faded photograph. Ramses wouldn't forget any more than she could ever forget him. But there would be other women. She couldn't expect him to remain celibate forever. Not Ramses. He'd marry again. If only for the sake of the children. The thought of him holding another woman in his arms, kissing her upturned face, gave her energy to pull herself to her knees. If he does, I'll come back and haunt him, she thought like that woman whose husband wrote, asking what he'd done to offend her, that she continued to torment him after death. Maybe she only wanted to make sure he wouldn't forget her. She crawled along the wall, feeling for the water jar. Her fumbling hands found it at last, lying on its side in a pool of water. It had cracked when it fell. She was lying flat, sucking up the tepid liquid, grit and all, when suddenly there was light. She raised herself on her elbows and turned her head. Even those few drops of water had helped, and so did the air, cool and fresh as a night wind, by comparison to the noxious mixture she'd been breathing. The light was dazzling to eyes long accustomed to darkness. She could see only an outline, standing motionless in the doorway. Then the glow behind it strengthened, "'shining on a halo of golden curls. "'She tried to speak, but could only croak like a frog. "'Hello, pretty Mrs. Emerson,' said the clear, sweet voice. "'Would you like to come out now?' 
Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Darkness had fallen before the train arrived in Luxor with a series of self-satisfied chugs and congratulatory blasts on the whistle. So they sounded to me, at any rate. I had taken a strong personal dislike to the train, as if it were deliberately dawdling in order to annoy me. I could hardly wait to tell Emerson that I had solved the case. As the car slowed and the platform came into sight, I peered out the window, braving the smoke and dust. I fully expected I would see Emerson in the forefront of the waiting passengers, arms akimbo and brow threatening. In vain did I seek that unmistakable form. Someone else had come to meet us, though. Catching sight of me, he waved and began running alongside the car. "'It's David,' I said. "'I wonder why Emerson sent him instead of coming himself.' Ramsay's glanced out the window. "'He's got something on his mind. "'I don't like the look of this, Mother. "'Stay with me.' "'I followed close on his heels as he shoved and pushed toward the end of the car "'so that we were first in line to exit. "'The train stopped with a shudder. "'Ramsay swung himself out without waiting for the steps to be put in place "'and reached up to lift me down. "'Thank God!' David exclaimed. "'We hoped you would take this train. "'I've been waiting for over an hour.' I did not have to ask if something was wrong. The deep lines of anxiety on his face, the hard grip of his hand as he seized mine, were signs anyone could read. The children, I cried, remembering Abdullah's warning, has something? No, they're all right, and will be. I've taken precautions. He didn't stop moving, but went on almost at a run toward a waiting cab. I had to trot to keep up, which you may well believe, reader, I did. Ramsay said softly, Lufret? David knew better than to try to spare him. Gone. So are the Professor and Mariam. The Isis sailed six hours ago. Without haste, but with a tighter grip than was strictly necessary, Ramses helped me into the cab. Six hours ago? What have you done about it? David collapsed onto the seat opposite us and waved the driver on. We didn't realize they were missing until a few hours ago. The Professor had gone back to the house, or so we assumed, but he wasn't there, and... The lights of Luxor flashed past, and the carriage jolted alarmingly. "'Take it slowly, David,' I said. "'You are becoming incoherent. "'And tell the driver to slow down. "'I believe he is whipping the horse. "'You know we never permit that.' "'Ramsay said, "'Go on, David. "'Take it in order. "'Father wasn't at the house.' "'David's voice rose. "'None of you were there. "'When nobody turned up for tea, "'I thought you might be at the castle, "'so I sent Ali to inquire. "'So much time wasted.' He covered his face with his hands. I jogged his elbow. Self-recrimination is fruitless, David. I cannot see that you acted irresponsibly. Go on. David pushed his hat to the back of his head, took a deep breath, and resumed in a calmer voice. The Vandergelts came with mother and father. They were concerned, said none of you had been there. We started counting heads. That was when we realized Mariam hadn't been seen since last night, nor no fret since midday. We found the note, your note, in the surgery, so at least we knew where you two had got off to. We had to track Nizreen down. She'd closed the clinic and gone home. It was she who told us Nefret had been sent for by the doctor on the Isis. The boy was ill, he said. Still at full gallop, the horse turned onto the corniche, and I fell heavily against Ramsay's. He put me back onto my seat with hands as cold and hard as ice. David shouted at the driver, and our headlong pace slackened. There was enough traffic on the road to make this expedient. It was still early by Luxor standards, and the tourists who sought pleasure rather than edification, and those who catered to them, were out in full force. The cold white light of electricity shone from the hotels, the mellower glow of candles and lanterns from shops and houses. As soon as we learned where Nefret had gone, we crossed to Luxor, Bertie and I, that's when we found out the Isis was gone. The vendors and shopkeepers along the street had seen Nefret go on board. She didn't come off. And Emerson? I inquired, straightening my hat. You told me to take it in order, David replied. Are you all right, Aunt Emilia? Perfectly. There was a lump the size of a cannonball in my stomach, and I wanted to scream at him. Almost there, David said, glancing out the window. Well... Shortly after Nefret boarded, along came the professor at a dead run. 
He went pelting up the gangplank, and that was the last anyone saw of him or Nifret. A short time later, the gangplank was hauled in, and the boat sailed. We'd been seen visiting the Isis, I mused. The watchers would have no reason to suppose anything was wrong. Which way did it go? We're working on that. The carriage stopped. David jumped out and handed me down. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Sabir is waiting with his new boat. Tourist steamers lined the bank, all a twinkle with lights. There was no gap in the line. The Isis's berth had been taken by another boat. When Sabir saw us coming, he stood ready to cast off. What then is the current situation? I asked, stepping into the boat. We decided Bertie should go back to the house to tell the others while I waited for the train. The ice is headed downstream. We learned that much. Bertie said he'd telegraphed the police at Hamadi and Kina to watch out for her. Motionless as a statue, his hands clasped, Ramsey said, Useless. All she has to do is pull into a landing somewhere, douse her running lights, and make a few alterations under cover of darkness. And you name another flag at the stern, and she'd be difficult to spot. David was no more deceived by that cool voice than I was. Ramses, I'm sorry. I should have done what? It wasn't your fault. It wasn't anyone's fault. When we reached the house, it was buzzing like a beehive and shining like a Christmas tree. Every lamp alight, and, as it appeared, a goodly portion of the population of Guna mounting guard. Some were pacing up and down, all were talking, and a few brandished rifles. It was illegal for Egyptians to own them, but the authorities tended to turn a blind eye when the owner was a responsible individual. Though I do not generally approve of firearms, I found the sight comforting. Evelyn was the first to burst out of the house. She flung her arms around me. "'Thank God you are safe, Amelia.' "'I was never in danger, my dear,' I replied, putting her gently away. "'There is no time for that sort of thing now. "'We must have... "'Ramses, where are you going? "'I won't be long.' "'I watched him move away with long-measured strides "'and hadn't the heart to call him back. "'No assurances are as convincing "'as the evidence of one's own eyes. "'He was going to the children.' The others were in the sitting room. Cyrus and Catherine and Bertie, Walter and Leah, Gargery, Daoud and Khadija and Fatima and... Sell him, I cried. Go back to bed at once. His brown face was a little paler than usual, but he was fully dressed and his neatly wound turban concealed the bandages. Lie in bed while Emerson and Nur Mesur are in danger? My honoured father would rise up from his tomb. It is true, Daoud nodded. Now you are here, Sitakim. God be thanked. You will tell us what to do. The hard knot in my interior softened a little as I looked round the room. No woman could have had more valiant allies than these. I did not protest, for I knew I would have to have Selim tied to his bed to keep him there. He had a knife at his belt, and so did Daoud. Cyrus, too, was armed with a holstered pistol— I didn't know whether to laugh or cry when I saw that Evelyn was gripping my sword parasol. They would obey my slightest command. If only I knew what command to give. I had preserved my outward calm, but inwardly I was in such a confusion of rage and worry I couldn't think sensibly. Stalling for time, I took a chair and asked, Where is Sethos? Somewhere around, Cyrus replied. Said he couldn't sit still and darned if I blame him. Ramses and Sethos must have met outside, for they came in together. Ah, there you are, said the latter, nodding at me. Hasn't anyone offered you a whiskey and soda? Cyrus let out a multi-syllabled American exclamation. Jump and Jehoshaphat, I should have thought of that. How about you, Ramses? Ramses shook his head. What we need is one of Mother's famous councils of war. Everyone looked expectantly at me. First, I said, taking the glass from Cyrus, tell us what steps you have taken. You telegraphed, Bertie? Bertie nodded. He looked absolutely miserable. Sethos had helped himself to a whiskey. I suspected it was not his first. That step was necessary, but it may not be of much use. I've taken the liberty of dispatching a number of your fellows to alert the villages between here and Nag Hammadi and upstream as far as Esna, in case she changes course. The word will be passed on. 
A regular Pony Express, Cyrus said with an approving nod. Donkey Express, Sethos corrected. And a few camels. That's all very well and good, said Walter peevishly. But I do not understand why we're sitting round drinking whiskey and not acting. What else can we do? I asked. Walter banged his fist on the table. His mild countenance was no longer mild. His eyes glittered. Go in pursuit. We have the Amelia, have we not? Sethos put his empty glass on the table, and the rest of us gaped at Walter. I wondered if you would think of that. You had, I suppose, Walter demanded. Selim had. That's why he's here. We will need him. There's only a skeleton crew on board, and it would take too long to get Rice Hassan and his engineer back. Hmm, said Walter, only slightly appeased and sounding as warlike as Emerson. Then why haven't we started? Because, said Sethos in his most irritating drawl, we cannot start before morning. Aside from the danger of navigation at night, we could go right past the Isis in the dark, and because we were waiting for Amelia and Ramses. And most importantly, because we'd need to gather all the facts and plan our strategy before we charge ahead. Suppose we do catch her up. Then what? Board her, swords in hand? Walter jumped to his feet. He looked twice the man he had been when he arrived in Cairo, and for the first time I saw the resemblance between him and the man he confronted. He snatched his eyeglasses off and threw them across the room. Damn you, uh, Sethos! Are you making fun of me? If swords are required, I will use one, Sethos said in quite a different tone. I beg your pardon, brother. I know you would. We'd better pray it won't come to that. Sit down, I beg, and let us discuss the situation calmly. Amelia, would you like to take charge of the discussion? Before I could begin, Selim rose carefully to his feet. I am going to the Amelia to begin overhauling the engines. I will have her ready to sail at daybreak. I'll go with you, Walter declared. What the devil did I do with my glasses? Here, Evelyn handed them to him. Walter, dear. He knew what she was about to say. Adjusting the eyeglasses, he took her by the shoulders and smiled at her. Perhaps I can be Selim's hands or run errands for him, if I can do nothing more. I too, said Bertie. I know a little something about engines. Selim, I strictly forbid you to let that horse gallop, I called after them. Walter, make sure he obeys. Losing control of your subalterns? Sethos inquired. I am your willing slave, as always. What orders have you for me? Another whiskey, perhaps? I am in no mood for humour, I informed him, only trying to relieve the tension, my dear. The fact is, I believe we have matters under control here. The children are all in the main house, and it is surrounded, men every ten feet, all aroused and looking for trouble. The women and children will be safe. A united outcry from every female in the room silenced him. If you think I'm staying here, Leah began, or me, Evelyn cried, brandishing the parasol. You will both do what you are told, I said, by me. We must decide how our forces can best be employed. Someone must remain to deal with Monsieur Lacour. He is due tomorrow. He's here, Cyrus said. Gone in this evening. How can you worry about him at such a time as this? For one thing, he may be persuaded to join in the hunt for Isis. Not very likely, Cyrus said. He'll be too worried about his consarn treasure. What about the other tourist boats? I could not in conscience ask a party of innocents to take an active part... We could ask the cruise boats to keep an eye out for the Isis, but I expect by morning she will have altered her appearance. Since our enemies have departed en masse, I doubt there is danger to anyone here. An assumption we dare not make, said Sethos. We believed the immediate family hadn't been targeted. That is what we were meant to believe. Now they've taken a fret. They didn't plan on Emerson, but now they've got him, they aren't likely to let him go. We know the motive now. It applies equally strongly to the rest of you, and to me. He went to the sideboard again and splashed whiskey into his glass. I could have used another myself. We had skirted round the subject, but it could no longer be avoided. I am sorry, I said, haltingly. I had hoped she was innocent. Sethos swung round to face me. 
She looks so innocent, doesn't she? Those childish freckles and wide hazel eyes. She took me in, too, Amelia, if that's any consolation. I saw the pain his controlled countenance endeavoured to conceal, and so did my dear Evelyn. Going to him, she embraced him like a sister. She may be a prisoner, dear. Uh, the tenderness of her manner and the stumble over his name were too much for him. Affection and laughter choked his voice. Dear Evelyn, would you like me to tell you my real name? You needn't tell me if you'd rather not. Seth. What? I cried. Not Gawain or George or Milton or... Visibly amused, Sethos lifted his glass to me. What an imagination you have, Amelia. Where do you suppose I got my nom de guerre? My parents gave me a perfectly respectable biblical name. But when I realized how close it was to that of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, I couldn't resist. And how appropriate. Sethos, the follower of Set, god of storm and chaos, deadly enemy of his noble brother... He broke off with a snap of his teeth. Ramses, will you, for God's sake, have a drink or say something, or at least sit down? You make me nervous, planted there like a bloody granite statue. We'll get her back. It might have been the thought of the other young woman, the loving daughter Sethos would never get back, that broke Ramses' stony control. I'm sorry, he began. Sethos snarled at him. I don't want your pity. I want information. There's nothing we can do for several more hours, so we may as well talk. I don't suppose anyone intends to sleep. Is there any longer the slightest doubt as to what has motivated this string of extraordinary occurrences? No, I said. Once I realised that revenge for Bertha's death was the motive, every incident fits snugly into the pattern. The first, which I flat-out missed until recently, was the death of Hassan, or rather his sudden turn to religion. What had he done that he should feel the need of forgiveness? Ramses nodded. That's what Selim said. In almost those precise words. I missed it, too. Hassan was one of the men who was with us that day at Gurna, when Abdullah died and Bertha... Are you suggesting that it was Hassan who struck the blow that killed her? I think that if he didn't, he believed he had, or claimed the credit, for creditable it would have seemed to those who revered Abdullah and held the old tribal beliefs, an eye for an eye, a death for a death. Do you remember the letter Ramses read us from a man to his deceased wife? I wouldn't be surprised if Hassan did not hold the same view about ill fortune, that it must be due to a malevolent spirit. Hassan had lost his own wife and he had begun to suffer the effects of old age. Guilt and the hope of forgiveness made him seek the protection of a holy man, even if he had to invent one himself. Most of the other men are dead, except for... Selim and Daud, David breathed. Good God! She would have no trouble murdering her son, poison in one of the dishes of food he was brought. But I can't believe... Selim and Daud... Sethos said, in a hard, flat voice, were next. She played with them like a cat with a mouse. None of the incidents proved to be fatal, but any one of them might have been. She staged her own misadventures to allay your suspicions. Martinelli would seem to be an aberration. I don't know why she went after him. To the best of my knowledge, she never met him. There are a number of things you do not know, I said. El Garbi's revelations had been overshadowed by the magnitude of the catastrophe that had befallen us, but they were vital to the case. Evelyn and David had voiced a hope, a doubt, which must be present in the minds of the others. It was hard to picture that fresh-faced girl as capable of murder. "'It is important that all of us understand precisely what we are up against,' I went on. "'It is not a disturbed young woman with a crew of venal cutthroats,' There is at least one other individual involved, a hardened criminal with the same motive as Mariam's. Mariam is not Bertha's only child. For almost the first time since I'd known him, Sethos lost his composure. His face went white. No, he said hoarsely. No, not another of my... Who told you that? El Gabi. 
Ramsay said. That was where we went today, to his village, where he'd been exiled. Mother remembered something he had said about the young serpent also having poisoned fangs. Why she didn't see fit to mention this to anyone else. I forgot, I admitted. It was so vague, like one of those Nostradamus predictions that can be interpreted in many different ways. We were, at that time, involved with that vicious boy, Jamil, who could certainly have been described in those terms. Emerson also knew, but like myself, he forgot or dismissed the warning. Not until last night, when I finally began to see the pattern we'd been seeking, did I realize El Gabi might have information we did not. You ought to have told us, Evelyn said accusingly. It is easy to see what one ought to have done after the event, David said quietly. I want to know more about this second child. Leah let out a cry. Justin? Is it Justin? But he's even younger than Mariam. He can't be more than fourteen. He, he, I said, is a young woman. The short stature, the beardless face, the high-pitched voice should have alerted us. She was in her late teens when El Garbi knew her in Cairo, one of the more uh, exclusive, I suppose I should say, houses of prostitution was owned by an older woman, a European, who also had a hand in various illegal operations. She and El Garbi were never in competition. They operated, so to speak, on different levels, but he was familiar with her activities. Her customers included the highest officials and the wealthiest, most fastidious tourists. Justin was her protégé and her able assistant in every criminal activity from drugs to murder. Not mine, then, Sethos said in a ragged whisper. Not mine. I understood his feelings. If the information gave him any comfort, I was ready to give it. According to El Gabi's sources, her father was an Englishman named Vinci, the man with whom Bertha lived for several years before we exterminated Vinci and Bertha went to you. No, you are not her father. She and Mariam are half-sisters. How they met and when, I do not know, but Justin is unquestionably the ringleader. She is the elder, and unlike Mariam, she has lived all her life with criminals. That doesn't absolve Mariam, Sethos said. Except for the perspiration that beaded his forehead, he might have been talking about a stranger. She was a willing participant from the start. The attack on her was staged. The result was that Ramses rescued her and brought her to you, with well-feigned reluctance that gained your sympathy and support. She's been spying on you and reporting back to the others. She may be under duress, Evelyn said. Give it up, Evelyn, Sethos said. She is a true child of her mother, and, God help us, of me. Chapter 13 The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The boy wasn't ill. She ought to have known it had been a ruse. He stood lightly poised, swaying with the motion of the vessel, and his face was as pretty and bland as a wax doll's. "'Were you lapping the water like a dog?' Justin asked. There was a note in his voice that sent alarm bells jingling through Nefret's head. She tried to speak, but produced only a rusty croak. "'A nice cup of tea is what you need,' Justin said cheerfully. "'Can you walk, or shall Francois carry you?' The last hope faded when she saw he wasn't alone. What part he played in this she couldn't yet determine— but at best he was useless, incapable of understanding, and too frail to resist. Francois had to be one of them, though. He reached for her, grinning unpleasantly. The fret staggered to her feet, pushing his hand away. "'As you like,' Justin said. "'Come with me.' The fret followed him along the passageway and into the saloon, with Francois close behind her. Smiling sweetly, Justin indicated a chair and Nefret sank gratefully into it. Tea was set out on a table, a handsome service of silver, but there was no one in the room except herself and the boy and his attendant. Her eyes moved to the windows. It was dark outside, and the boat had stopped. "'Drink your tea,' said Justin, pouring. "'You must be very thirsty.' Something about the gesture, the turn of his wrist, 
caught Nefret's attention. She watched him as he lay back against the cushions of the divan, one hand behind his head, the other gracefully limp. Who are you? she demanded. The light peal of laughter, a tone higher than Justin's, was the final clue. My God, how could I have missed it? she wondered. His coat was open, and the thin shirt clung to the curves of a woman's breasts, now unconfined. My name, you mean? I've had a number of them. You may continue calling me Justin. It sounds a little like justice, and that is what I'm about to deal out. Nefret shook her head dazedly. Why are you doing this? What do you want of us? Justice? For a dead woman and her children? Come now, she said, impatiently, as Nefret stared open-mouthed. How stupid you are! Your family took my mother's life and would have left me to die unprotected and exploited had it not been for her friends and my own talents. Your mother? Nefret echoed. She picked up her cup and burnt her tongue on the scalding tea. Who? It shouldn't be that difficult. How many women have met their deaths at the hands of your virtuous family? None. Not even... Oh, good Lord, Nefret gasped. Bertha, you are her child? But that's not fair. We didn't even know you existed. Mother and father would have helped you. They would help you now. I don't want help. What I want, I will take as my due, not as charity. Nefret couldn't think what to say. In all their theorizing, they had never anticipated this. She sipped the tea, stalling for time until she could get her wits back. What have you done to the professor? Not as much as he deserves. Francois had taken up a position beside his mistress. His scarred face twisted. He's only chained and locked into that room. She wouldn't let me. I did not give you leave to speak. The light voice pierced like a sword blade. Francois recoiled and then dropped to his knees and began mumbling apologies. It really would serve him right, Justin said, ignoring her groveling servant. He's thrown all our plans into disarray. Would you like to know what they were? And now they've changed. Francois, where are your manners? Offer our guest a biscuit. I'm not hungry, Nefret said. Tell me. Justin lay back against the cushions, her hands under her head, breasts lifted. Hathor, Nefret said in stunned disbelief. On both occasions, yes. You suspected Mariam, didn't you? I... Did it for her. She wants your husband. If the professor hadn't interfered today, she'd have got him. Never, Nefret said steadily. Oh, I think her chances were excellent. You see, our original intention was to get you aboard, and then, wearing your clothing and hat, I'd have gone ashore and strode briskly off into the alleys of Luxor. When I returned, it would have been as myself. By the time your friends came looking for you, the Isis would have sailed, and a dozen gaping witnesses would have reported you had left the boat. Watching her, Nefret was reminded of something Ramses had once said about the art of disguise. It wasn't so much a matter of physical change as of demeanor and gesture, speech and movement. She'd played a boy's role well, but she couldn't have pulled it off if they hadn't thought of Justin as not quite normal. No wonder she had reacted so vehemently to being touched. She might bind her breasts and wear loose boy's clothing, but her body was a woman's. But now that's out of the question, Justin went on briskly. Those same gaping witnesses saw both you and the professor board the boat. They told him you were here, and he was prepared to tear the place apart to find you. We had no choice but to move up the time of our departure and take both of you along, she sighed. Poor Mariam, she can't go back and pretend innocence now. Where is she? Nefret asked. Sulking in her cabin. She's been complaining all day, Justin added contemptuously. 
Nefret's eyes wandered to the window. It opened onto the deck. The shutters had been thrown back. She could see stars and the dark outline of land not far away. Her heart sank at the idea of abandoning Emerson. But if she could get onto the deck... Nefret made a dash for the window. Her legs were still shaky, so it wasn't so much a dash as a series of stumbles. Francois was after her the moment she moved. He twisted her arms behind her and held her. Nefret shook the straggling hair out of her eyes. Knowing you look like a fright, dirty and sweaty and disheveled, has a demoralizing effect on any female. The woman lounging on the couch knew that. Smiling, she ran her hands caressingly over her body. She made a very pretty woman with that head of crisp curls, bright as gold shavings, and that slender young body. Nefret tried to stop herself, but it was no use. She had to know. Why did you take Ramsay's prisoner? What would you have done to him if he hadn't got away? It was a test of sorts, to see how well my people had performed, Justin said, stretching like a cat. I was curious about what Mariam saw in him. Then, well, I saw. I thought it would be fun to have him make love to me. You're insane, Nefret said. You couldn't have made him do that. Oh, yes, I could. If I'd had a little more time, I quite looked forward to it. I enjoy men, and he's a particularly handsome specimen in every way. Mariam doesn't appreciate that sort of thing. She only married that vulgar American because she wanted his money. She thinks she's in love. The tone was one of pure disgust. You've never been in love? Nefret asked. She was following one of the family's basic rules. Keep the other person talking. Watch for a slip of the tongue or a moment of carelessness. One never knew what might turn up. And there was a horrible fascination in the conversation. She had never encountered a woman like this. But then, she reminded herself, I never knew Bertha. In love? The pretty mouth curled. I wanted him, though. And I'd have had him if he hadn't got away from me. I may succeed yet. I generally get what I want. And I expect he'd be willing to do anything to keep me from hurting you. Not anything, Nefret said. And you'd be a fool to let him get close to you when he's angry. What an innocent you are, Justin murmured. There are ways. I know most of them. She was baiting her prisoner, only too successfully. Nefret swallowed the sickness rising in her throat. What are you going to do with us? she demanded. Nothing just yet, was the careless reply. We may need you. What for? Wait and see. Laughing, Justin sat up and clasped her hands. Wouldn't you like to freshen up before dinner? The room to which Francois took her was a distinct improvement over the other. The shutters over the windows were closed and barred from the outside, but the gaps between the wooden slats admitted air. There were a bed and a wash basin and even a lamp hanging on a bracket by the wash basin. An impromptu prison, this, not as formidable as the other, but they had left nothing that could be used as a weapon or a tool. Bed and basin were bolted to the floor. They had even removed the stout wooden bar on the inside of the shutters. Nefret moved purposefully around the room, looking into the cupboard over the wash basin and under the bed. The water pitcher was not a heavy earthenware vessel, but a delicate bit of china painted with pansies. It was part of the usual set. The other vessels were just as dainty. Hitting someone over the head with one would only irritate him. The soap dish held a bar of scented soap. Apparently, that diabolical woman really did want it to tidy up before dinner... A towel and a washcloth had been provided, too. Why not? She could at least wash face and arms. The tepid water felt wonderful against her hot cheeks. It would have been heavenly to take off her clothes and sponge the dried sweat off her body, but there was no way of locking the door from the inside. She compromised by removing her filthy shirt and washing her upper arms and throat. The chemise that had been so fresh and white that morning was just as grimy as the rest of her clothing. The thin cotton stuck to her breasts and ribs. 
in a moment of purely illogical, utterly feminine weakness, she compared her body to the graceful form on the divan and snatched up her shirt. How old was the damned woman? Younger than she by a good ten years. Mariam was even younger. Neither of them had borne two children. And neither of them had Ramses, she reminded herself. She began taking the pins out of her tangled hair, remembering how his hands had stroked it over her shoulders. She'd been a fool to let jealousy sour her mind and sharpen her tongue. He wouldn't rest until he had found her, and her formidable mother-in-law would be hot on Emerson's trail by now. She thought of Emerson, sweltering in the dark hold of her former prison, manacled and injured, and her jaw set. I'll ask if I can see him, she thought. I'll beg, on my knees if the bitch wants that. She looked for a comb without success. They were taking no chances. Sharp teeth, even of celluloid, could rake painfully across her face. Philosophically, she began running her hands through her long locks, smoothing them as best she could. She stood up and tucked her shirt in. When the door opened, she was behind it, the dainty pitcher raised. One must do one's best, whatever the odds. The door was flung back, flattening her painfully against the wall. The pitcher fell and shattered. A hand reached round, gripped her wrist, and pulled her out of concealment. "'You have spoiled the set,' the doctor said, studying the pink and blue shards. His fingers squeezed like pincers. He maintained the painful grip as he led her along the passageway to the saloon. A table had been drawn into the center of the room, covered with white damask and spread with china and crystal. Flowers filled an apern in the center. There were four places set, but only two of the chairs were occupied. Nefret stopped, rubbing her aching wrist. The men who stood at attention behind the chairs didn't look much like waiters. Francois was one of them. She realized now what had been wrong with the room. It was as contrived and unreal as a stage setting, a recreation of stuffy respectability. Its artificiality was emphasized by the bizarre occupants, the heavily muscled, hard-eyed attendants, and the woman she knew only as Justin. The name was particularly inappropriate now. She wore the robes of Hathor, complete with black wig and artificial cow's ears. Mariam sat at her right. Her eyes were fixed on her plate. One of the companion's loose black dresses made her look almost as shabby as Nefret felt. But the stolen pectoral gleamed on her breast, deep lapis blue framed by the gold curves of the two serpents. "'Where are the bracelets?' Nefret asked steadily. "'My, my, what admirable sang froid Justin murmured. "'Show her, Mariam. Mariam raised her hands, but not her eyes. The bracelets were clasped round her wrists. "'Sit there,' Justin directed. "'At my left. "'That will be all, Khatab. "'The good doctor isn't dining?' Nefret asked, settling into the chair the waiter held for her. "'He's no... Doctor, he's a cheap abortionist who worked for me in Cairo, Justin replied with careless contempt. Hardly a social equal. Hatab's shoulder blades twitched. He left the room without replying and slammed the door. Not that you are a suitable dinner companion, Justin went on, inspecting the fret critically. Was that the best you could do? Under the circumstances, yes. Nefret was past caring about the woman's taunts. If you find my presence so offensive, why am I here? Two reasons. We hadn't finished our little chat. I enjoyed watching your reactions. You have such an open, uncontrolled face. And there is still such a lot you don't know. And the other reason? She didn't turn her head to look at the windows. The draperies had been drawn, but she could hear sounds of activity outside on the deck. "'Do join us in our celebration,' Justin said. "'She pulled off the heavy wig and tossed it to Francois. "'Tomorrow, or the next day, at the latest, "'we will complete our mission. "'It's been a year in the making, but it'll be worth the wait.' "'The only thing the fret could think of was the family, "'her children, Ramses, her mother-in-law, "'all the others, friends and kin,' caught up in the same web that had entangled Emerson and her. She told herself it was impossible to strike at all of them at once. Some of them, then. Which? And how? Involuntarily, she looked toward the windows. 
Some heavy object had fallen, thudding onto the deck. A round Arabic curse burst out, followed by a hissing adjuration to silence. Justin laughed gleefully and clapped her hands. Plain as print, that face of yours. Why don't you just ask what they're doing? I don't mind telling you. What? Lefret asked. By morning, the Isis will be a different boat. Fresh paint, a new name, the stars and stripes waving bravely at the stern. Lefret nodded. Clever, but not good enough. Where are we? I don't mind telling you that either. We're at anchor near an island just south of Kina. Only a few hours downstream from Luxor. He was only a few hours away. She tried to imagine what he and the others might be doing, how long it had taken them to realize what had happened to her and Emerson. Then she remembered her mother-in-law's complacent statement. I do not expect that such an eventuality will occur and icy fingers traced a path down her spine. If they'd been detained by force or accident at that obscure village, Ramses might not yet know she was missing. You are thinking of him, aren't you? Justin cooed. I can tell. So far as I know, he's in no danger, dear, and I feel certain he'll rush nobly to your rescue. But don't get your hopes up. They'll have to follow my water. "'And they can't have put two and two together before dark. "'We are far ahead, and they'll have to be very clever to find us "'before we've accomplished our aim. "'Even if they do, they won't dare interfere, "'so long as we hold two hostages. "'You are also hostages for each other. "'If you don't behave yourself, the punishment will fall on him.' "'Is he hurt?' Nefret asked. "'May I see him?' Justin's lips curled into a tight-lipped smile, as enigmatic as that of an archaic statue. Say please. Please. Later, perhaps. He's not seriously injured, but he isn't very comfortable. Mariam hadn't moved a muscle or uttered a sound until then. The movement was slight, only a jerk of her slim shoulders. Then I take it he won't be joining us, Lefret said. She, too, had flinched at the gloating malice in Justin's voice, but she was trying to live up to Emerson's standards. Who's the fourth? Someone I know? Yes and no, Justin said. I wonder what's keeping her. Waiting to make a grand entrance, I suppose. Francois, go and tell... Ah, finally. The woman who entered was tall and thin. Her wrinkled face and white hair bore the uncompromising marks of time. "'but her step was firm and her shoulders were straight. "'She had abandoned her veils and widow's weeds. "'Her black dress was severely practical, "'with no concession to vanity, not even a ruffle of lace. "'Justin pushed her chair back and rose, "'followed more slowly by Mariam. "'Lefret had been taught to stand up "'when an older woman entered the room. "'She remained seated. "'A criminal organization of women,' she said. At least you're not another of Bertha's get. The old woman, whose name was almost certainly not Fitzroyce, passed a caressing hand over Justin's bright curls. Then the same withered hand administered a sharp slap across Nefret's face, the sort of slap a governess might give an impertinent pupil. Your manners are not so pretty as your face. Stand up in the presence of your elders. With a slight shrug, Nefret obeyed. The old woman went to the head of the table and seated herself. "'Thank you for waiting, my dear,' she said to Justin. "'Francois, you may open the wine now.' "'What took you so long?' Justin asked. A cork popped and foam bubbled up over the bottle. "'Clumsy oaf!' the old lady snapped. "'Pour it and don't spill any more. "'Where was I? "'Paying a little call on the professor. "'It was hard to tear myself away.' Is he all right? Nefret asked. Champagne slopped into her glass. No, he isn't all right. He has a vile temper and the strength of an ox, and I'm taking no chances on his getting away. Now, join me in a toast to our success. She raised her glass. You can hardly expect me to drink to that, Nefret said. She expected a reprimand, if not another slap, but the old woman only smiled. Her collection of wrinkles looked like a map of Cairo, with its curving lanes and intersecting alleys. 
They were the result, Nefret thought, of weight loss in a woman who had once been stout and strong. She was by no means feeble, though. Her hand was all bones and sinew. I could have Francois pinch your nose and pour it down your throat, her hostess said, but that would spoil the effect. Mariam, Justin. Ceremoniously, they raised their glasses and drank. The first course was soup of some kind. It was tepid and over-flavoured with onion. Even the cook must be one of the gang, Nefret thought. The wine was excellent, a pale hock, and Nefret allowed herself a sip. The sounds of activity outside were more muted now. What was it I didn't drink to? she asked. And who the hell are you? Bertha's Avenger. Do you suppose I would go to so much trouble for the sake of revenge? The old woman leaned forward, withered hands planted on the table. Sentimentality is a weakness of the young. I had no objection to Justin arranging her cunning little accidents and epiphanies. She only succeeded in killing one of the men who had murdered Bertha, but some of the others were seriously inconvenienced, and she enjoyed your fear and confusion. I stopped caring about such things a long time ago. If it's money you want, Nefret began. I want it, and I intend to get it. This is an expensive operation, she went on, in a voice as practical as a banker's. I took every penny I had saved, and all the money Mariam inherited from her doting old husband. I believe it'll prove a worthwhile investment. The waiters removed the soup plates and replaced them with fish, white-eyed and dry as a mummy. The fret was glad she'd forced herself to finish the soup. She didn't think she could deal with that dead fish, and she definitely needed to keep her wits about her. She said in the same matter-of-fact voice as the old woman's, "'Perhaps we can come to an agreement. "'I can match. "'Perhaps you could, though I doubt it.' "'Mrs. Fitzroyce glared at the fish. "'Disgusting. Take it away. "'Money isn't all I want. "'I am not, it appears, "'as impervious to emotion as I had believed. Three of you were primarily responsible "'for the death of the woman I loved like a daughter "'and admired as my leader.' not the poor fool who struck the actual blow, the ones who had tormented and foiled her. The satisfaction I felt when I beheld one of them in my power at last, helpless and suffering as she had suffered, took me by surprise. It would give me even greater pleasure to lay my hands on the others. A calloused brown hand slapped a plate of beef down in front of Nefret. Blood formed a repulsive puddle around it. You were one of Bertha's aides. Nefret said slowly, a member of her notorious organization of women. You took it over after she died. You must be... I've forgotten your name. It was a nom de guerre. We never met formally, but you may remember the nurse who was in attendance on a pregnant lady. Pregnant with that one, she added, frowning at Mariam. Her eyebrows squirmed like blind white caterpillars, Sit up straight, girl. What are you sulking about? The failure of your romantic fantasy? I trust you aren't having second thoughts. It wasn't a fantasy, Mariam said sullenly. It would have worked. Her wide hazel eyes moved from the old woman to Nefret and back. Nonsense. In any case, it's too late now. Matilda, Nefret breathed. That was the name. Mother told us about you. It's she you want. Mother and... The man who abandoned my girl for her. Her lover. They were not lovers, Nefret said indignantly. The old woman cackled with laughter. No? The more fool she, then. I took rather a fancy to him myself, but of course he never gave me a second look. I wonder, would he be willing to exchange himself for you, little Mariam? Then you can have your precious Ramses, supposing you are woman enough to win him. Mariam's mouth tightened. He wouldn't agree. They must know now I'm as guilty as you. We can think of something, Justin said eagerly. I'd like to know him better, much better. Control yourself, Matilda said severely. Revenge is all very well, but it must not interfere with our primary aim. Nefret didn't have to ask what that was. Emerson had been right. 
there was only one way they could recoup their investment, by seizing the princess's treasure. How are you planning to capture the steamer? she asked casually. Matilda grinned at her. Clever girl. Since you're so clever, you figure it out. It'll give you something to occupy your mind for the remainder of your stay with us. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. We were on board before daybreak. I do not believe anyone had slept, despite my admonitions. I know Ramses hadn't. The dark stains under his eyes looked like smears of charcoal, waiting with forced patience for that moment when there was enough light to distinguish a black thread from a white. I stood at the railing, looking toward the outline of the western mountains and reviewing our preparations to make sure nothing had been overlooked. The messengers were on their way to villages down and upstream. Signals had been arranged so that any news could be immediately relayed to us. We had a crew of twenty, all thirsting for blood. We might have had fifty, had there been room for so many. Cyrus had brought his entire arsenal of pistols and rifles. The greatest difficulty had been persuading some members of the family to remain behind. My orders had less effect than Ramsay's appeal. If something goes wrong, the children mustn't be left without all their parents and grandparents. Leah, Aunt Evelyn, promise you will look after them. At this point, Gargery burst into tears. You too, Gargery, Ramsay said resignedly. With my life, sir, with my life, Gargery sobbed. But, sir, don't talk so discouraged like. You'll come back. Not without her, Ramsay said. He turned away. I loved Nefret like a daughter, but it was of Emerson, I thought, in those last dark moments before sunrise. If I knew my spouse, and I did, they couldn't have taken him without a struggle. Did he lie even now, wounded and suffering, in some hastily contrived and horribly uncomfortable prison? Or had they already... No. I would not think that. Our force consisted of Cyrus and Bertie, both of whom were good shots. Ramses, who was even better when he overcame his dislike of firearms. David, Selim and Daoud, Sethos, our twenty loyal men and, of course, myself. I was fully armed with pistol, knife, belt of tools and the sword parasol I had retrieved from Evelyn. My blood was up and I hoped I would have a chance to use the last item. Only hand-to-hand -hand combat would satisfy my righteous wrath. Ramses joined me at the rail. You're grinding your teeth, he remarked. My blood is up, I explained. I'm going to tell Selim we are ready to push off. You don't have to tell Selim anything. The breeze freshened, blowing the hair back from his brow. We were in motion, gliding gently away from the dock. I only wish we had a helmsman. Bertie and David know a bit, and... So do I, but you'd better pray we don't go aground. The sun peeped over the eastern hills, blood red, as suited my mood. Gradually, the temples of Luxor faded into the morning mist. If the reader has a map before her, or as it may be him, she will see that the Nile does not run directly northward from Luxor, but in a gentle curve to the northeast. After approximately sixty miles, it swings westward in a sharper curve. What the reader may not see are the innumerable smaller bends, curves and bays, or the islands and sandbanks that interrupt the smooth flow of the river. A feature that looks small on a map occupies hundreds of yards on the ground. The vessel we sought might be concealed anywhere, or it might be miles ahead, steaming at full speed towards some unknown destination. The wind tugged at my garments. The Amelia was capable of a fair turn of speed, especially downstream. How satisfying it would have been to race in pursuit. The rapidity of our progress keeping pace with our raging anxiety. It was a luxury we could not afford. We had to watch for signals for our scouts along the bank and for the missing de Habia. After a time, Sethos came to stand beside me. Nasera's made coffee. Shall he bring you a cup? Yes, no, Nasir should not be here. He is no fighter. He is only a steward, and not a very good one. Fatima sent him, along with enough food to nourish a regiment for a week. Each of us serves in her own way, I murmured gratefully. 
Quite. Now, Amelia, gripping the rail in that white-knuckled fashion isn't going to help. I'll be right back. When he returned, Nasir was with him, trying to balance a tray. I rescued the cup before it slid off and thanked him, and observed with alarm that the boy had strapped to his narrow waist a knife as long as my forearm. Oh, dear, I said to Sethos as Nasir staggered off. We must keep him from engaging in combat. Be honest, Amelia. Sethos leaned forward, arms resting on the rail. You would sacrifice Nasir or anyone else if it were necessary to save Emerson. Yes, I said. Neither of us looked at the other. Our eyes were fixed on the shoreline. Nestled in the shelter of palm groves, amid the green of growing crops, were the whitewashed houses of a village. Above the rooftops rose the minaret of the mosque. Two black-robed women bearing jars on their heads descended the bank toward the river. Why are we slowing down? I demanded. Looking for our first signal, Sethos replied. That insignificant hamlet is too... The channel is close to the west bank here, and when a vessel is spotted, all the local entrepreneurs take to their boats, hoping to sell some piece of junk to the tourists. We all crowded to the left side of the boat. It is properly termed starboard, I believe, or perhaps port. A water buffalo wallowed in the shallows, and above it, on the bank, were several figures capering up and down, waving a banner. It was bright green. They saw her, I cried. She passed this way, but when? Green means yesterday, Sethos said coolly. Not much help, I muttered, waving away the platter of bread Nasir shoved under my nose. We're two hours down from Luxor, Sethos said. That means she passed here late in the afternoon, and we know we're going in the right direction. There was always a chance she'd turn and go upstream. But they are at least six hours ahead of us, even if they stopped last night. We must have done, Sethos said impatiently. Don't be such a pessimist, Amelia. It isn't like you. No captain would risk his boat trying to navigate this river after dark. Then she would have to put in last night. Where? Somewhere around Kena, Ramses replied. Three hours away, at our present speed. We don't go faster. None of us knows the river well enough. Eat something, mother. I took a piece of bread, since Nasir would not leave me alone, and went back to my post on the other side of the boat. Sunlight sparkled on the water. Our speed had increased once we were in mid-channel. I could not take my eyes from the passing scene, and I wished I had another pair of them in the back of my head. We had men stationed at the prow and the stern, and along both sides, watching as keenly as I, but that wasn't enough for me. I felt I could trust no eyes but my own. The water, which looked so clear and sparkling at a distance, was a muddy brown and as littered as a Cairo alley. The river constantly shifts, eating away at one bank or the other. We passed a once flourishing grove of palm trees, some precariously balanced on less than half their root base, others already fallen, their leaves trailing in the water. Withered palm fronds and dead branches floated past, with an occasional dead animal for interest. I am sure I need not tell the reader that my eyes followed each such object with morbid dread, and each time I held my breath until I had identified it. The river was not the populous thoroughfare it had been during my early years in Egypt, when it had been the only means of travel and transport. The railway was cheaper and quicker, except for short distances. In Middle Egypt, one would still see barges carrying sugar cane to the factories, but below Asyut, only small local boats and an occasional tourist steamer used the river. We came up on one of the latter, flying the British flag, and I recognised one of Cook's vessels, the Amasis. We passed her so close I could see the pale staring faces of the passengers standing at the rail, too close for the captain's taste, apparently, since he waved his fists and yelled at us. Ramses came to me. He had lost his hat and his hair blew wildly about his face. I'll let David take over he said. I hope he can do better than I. We are going too fast. That was a good-sized island we passed. Shouldn't we have investigated the other side of it? Ramses turned to face me, one arm resting on the rail. But his eyes, like mine, continued to scan the banks. We cannot circle every island and sandbank. There are too many of them. 
with an inexperienced hand at the tiller, there's a good chance we would run aground. That would slow us even more. What is the point of this pursuit, then? I demanded. Could you have remained in Luxor, knowing that every minute, every hour, was taking them farther away? A flush of shame warmed my face. He and I were the ones most deeply affected, and he was taking it better than I, externally. I was not deceived by his impassive countenance and cool voice. No more than you, I said. His expression did not change. There's relatively little traffic on this part of the river, and it's possible, even probable, that a conspicuous vessel like the Isis would have been observed. What I'm praying for is that she ran aground, though it's more likely that we will. Mother, you will wear yourself out standing here. Come to the saloon and have something to eat. Nasir keeps cooking. I can't stop him. I will wait until we reach Kina. How is Selim? I can't stop him either, Ramses admitted. He won't leave his engines. He seems to be all right. Another hour passed. I counted off every minute, willing the hands of my watch to move faster. There might be news at Kina. A rotten log floating by had the exact shape and size of a human body. Cyrus was the next to approach me. Come and have luncheon, Amelia, he said, covering my clenched hand with his. We've got a dozen people keeping watch. Can't do any good here. Soon. We are nearing Kina, I believe. That is Balas on the West Bank. Kina is a prosperous town, set in a well-cultivated countryside and noted for the quality of clay in the area. All along the bank lay row upon row of pottery vessels, round-bellied pots and tall water jars, ready for transport. Beyond the rows of pots, a banner was raised, held high on long poles by two men. It was white. The Isis had not been seen. The other men had gathered round. Bertie let out a muffled oath, and Daoud invoked his god. Does this mean the boat did not come this far? he asked. Not necessarily, Ramsay said. He leaned out over the rail, squinting against the sunlight. Water traffic was heavier here, vessels coming in to load and departing with their cargoes of pots, a steamer slowing for the landing ahead, where tourists would disembark for a visit to the Temple of Dendera. Falakas glided like large white butterflies around the larger boats. One of them appeared to be heading straight for us. Ramses let out a shout. Stop! Tell Selim to stop the engines! The boat was heading straight for us, Standing upright, one hand on the mast, the other arm waving in emphatic gestures, was a man whose face and sturdy frame were oddly familiar. His bearded face split in a grin when the Amelia began to slow. The little craft came neatly alongside. The man grasped one of the hands that reached down for him and scrambled nimbly on board. "'Rise, Hassan!' I cried. "'How did you—' The wet has gone down the river with the speed of a flying bird. We have been watching for you. What have you done to my boat? Nothing yet, but we've had a few close calls, Ramsay said, with the first genuine smile I'd seen on his face for hours. Marhaba, Raisa, son, welcome and thrice welcome. Something told me we might see you here. Nothing told me, I admitted. Yet I ought to have known. Thank you, my friend, worthy son of your father. He shrugged my thanks away. This is not the time for talk. What is the plan? Where do you want to go? And who? His voice cracked. Who is steering my boat? The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Nefret had asked for more oil for the lamp. She hadn't got it. They had also refused her request to see Emerson, but she knew where he was, in the room next to hers. As they led her along the passageway, she had raised her voice in a string of swear words and got an immediate, equally profane response. The doctor added a few curses of his own before he pushed her into her room. At least she knew he was still alive and conscious, and she had been able to reassure him about herself. The lamp was burning low. It wouldn't last much longer. She examined the wall that separated the two rooms, inch by inch, and could have laughed aloud when she heard a steady scraping sound at the base of the partition. Lying flat on the floor, she retrieved the last of the hoarded nails from her shoe. 
At the first sound from her, the scraping stopped. Three soft knocks sounded. She knocked back three times, wondering what system of communication he had in mind. Tapping through the alphabet would take forever. Apparently, Emerson came to the same conclusion. The scraping resumed, her ear against the panel. Nefret located the source of the sound and began digging with her nail. The wood of the partition was thin, but neither of them had a proper tool. It seemed like, and probably was, hours before a sharp point jabbed into her hand. She pulled it back and heard splinters snap as Emerson enlarged the hole. When she heard his voice, she lay flat and pressed her ear to the small opening. Nufret, my dear, can you hear me? Yes, father. Are you hurt? Perfectly fit, my dear. Pay attention. Time is running out on us. It will be light before long. They had me in that room for a bit earlier on. I believe you can lift the bar on the outside of the shutters. I haven't anything to use as a lever. I tried to steal a knife at dinner, but... Pay attention, I said. There's a lamp bracket next to the wash basin. I managed to loosen it a trifle. If you keep bending it back and forth, it ought to come off. Do it now. Yes, sir. The last of the oil flickered out as she wrenched at the metal strip. It came away from the wall so suddenly she staggered. She had to feel her way back to the hole. I've got it, she reported. As soon as I get out of here, I'll come to your window and... As soon as you get out of there, you will go over the side. I don't know how far we are from land. Are you willing to risk it? Risk be damned. I won't leave you here. Their faces were close together. She felt his breath warm on her cheek. You can't get me out. Even if you could, I would find it a trifle difficult to swim with fifty pounds of ironmongery attached to me. Are you crying? Don't cry, curse it. Do you know what they're planning? Yes, that horrible old woman told me at dinner. But I can't... She knew he was right, though. She couldn't free him, and she was no good to him as a fellow prisoner. She told me to, or rather, said Emerson complacently, she confirmed my deductions. I could have dropped if I hadn't already been recumbent when she told me who she was. It just goes to show that one should never leave old enemies lying carelessly about. Go on now. Um, I bianto, father. Uh, yes, my dear. She was afraid to speak again, for she knew her voice would betray her. The faint slits of light at the shutters guided her. It took all her strength to force the blunt end of the bracket into the crack between shutter and window frame, and for a while she didn't think she could exert enough pressure to force the bar up. It gave all at once, and Nefret's heart stopped as it swung free, striking the shutter with a sound that seemed to her as loud as a pistol shot. Emerson heard it. He began to yell and bang on the door, making enough racket to drown out louder sounds than the ones she made, climbing out the window. There was no one in sight on the narrow stretch of deck. She felt as if some other entity had taken control of her body, blocking off emotions she couldn't afford to feel. Smoothly and quickly, she closed the shutters and replaced the bar before she climbed over the rail and lowered herself into the water. The shock of immersion took her breath away. Clinging to the side, she looked round, trying to get her bearings. The moon was on the wane, a thin sliver of silver, but the stars were the bright stars of Egypt. Behind her, not far away, a low, dark bulk blotted out a section of sky, an island, and not a very big one, just long enough to hide the Isis from one direction. Bare feet thumped on the deck, only a few inches over her head. Emerson's outburst must have drawn some of them away from their posts temporarily. They had silenced him now. Nefret drew in a deep breath and pushed herself away from the boat in a long glide. When she was forced to come up for air, she turned onto her back and paddled gently with her hands. Now she could see the ghostly outlines of the cliffs of the high plateau. They looked awfully far away. West bank or east? She floated, letting the current carry her for a few yards downstream. The cliffs were those of the west bank then. Maybe the eastern shore was closer. Something bumped into her. Something squashy and vile-smelling. 
Nefret fended it off, fighting revulsion. There were always dead animals in the Nile. She didn't want to see what this one was. Turning over again, onto her front, she started swimming toward the island. It was only a sandbank, less than sixty feet long and a few yards wide, but reeds had rooted themselves and weedy plants struggled for sustenance. Nefret pulled herself out of the water and looked round. The eastern shore looked just as far distant. If there was a village on either bank, it showed no lights. The villagers couldn't afford to waste oil. She looked in vain for a familiar landmark. Emerson would have found one. He knew every foot of the river. But to her, the cliffs looked all alike. To her left, north, downstream, she could see what appeared to be other small islands. One thing was certain, she couldn't stay here. Once her absence was discovered, they would look for her, and the reeds offered no concealment. She sat down and began struggling with the wet laces of her boots. It cost her a fingernail before she got them off. Hastily, she stripped off her wet shirt and trousers, flattened them into a bundle, and used her belt to strap them onto her back. Silly, perhaps. But if she was fortunate enough to reach shore, she didn't relish the idea of showing herself to a group of conservative villagers in wet, skimpy underclothing. The sky over the eastern cliffs had paled. Dawn was near. She waded through the weeds, slid into the water, and started swimming toward the eastern shore, downstream, with the current and across it. She had known everyone used the Nile as a trash depository, but it was one thing to know, and quite another to be in the middle of the mess, nose to nose with rotting vegetation and dead branches and other things she preferred not to think about. Organic objects that had sunk rose when the gases of decomposition swelled them, she had heard her first lecture on that interesting subject from her mother-in-law, years ago. Emerson had been absolutely scandalized. The thing came at her from behind, floating downstream. It struck her upraised arm a numbing blow and caught her again on the shin as she went under, her mouth filling with water. She fought her way back to the surface, her lungs heaving. The thing was beside her, turning idly in a little eddy, a section of palm trunk with a few fronds still attached. Dizzy with pain and half-drowned, Nefret caught hold of a handful and with the last of her strength pulled herself far enough forward to throw one arm over the rounded trunk. Swimming was out of the question. Her right arm hurt and her stomach was in knots and she was tired. So tired. She hung on, letting the impromptu raft draw her along with it, saving what was left of her strength, expending only as much energy as was necessary to keep her head above water. The sky began to brighten. Her left arm ached. Everything ached. Ankle, leg, right arm, back. A sudden jar broke her numbed hold. Her head went under water, and her feet jolted against a solid surface. She stood up, wobbling on one leg, and pushed the streaming hair out of her eyes. The log that had been both disaster and saviour had run up against a muddy bank. It was not either of the river banks, just another damned island. A wave lapped her ankles. The log dipped, as if nodding a courteous farewell, and floated away. Nefret leaned over and threw up. Once she had rid herself of the rest of the water she had swallowed, and all of the meals she had eaten... She realized she was ravenous. A brief, hobbling survey of her current position offered no hope of relieving her hunger or her thirst. This island was a little larger than the other, but not much. And she was still in the middle of the river, no closer to either shore than she'd been, though she was some distance downstream. The only other inhabitants were birds, snowy white egrets, and a few kingfishers. She startled a nesting goose, which rose flapping and honking. In the strengthening light, Nefret considered the clutch. No, she wasn't that hungry. Not yet. She sat down and examined her bare leg. It hurt like the devil, but there was no break, just a bruise the size of her closed fist. Swearing and wincing, Nefret probed the injured arm and diagnosed a bruised bicep. She wouldn't be using that arm for a while. But there would be boats on the river soon, 
she ought to be able to hail one of them, making damn good and sure before she did so that it was not a dahabia the size of the Isis. It did not take her long to discover that the main channel was too far away for her faint calls to carry. She grew hoarse from shouting. Against the grey-green reeds, her body was essentially invisible. She had nothing bright to wave, no way of starting a fire. When the sun was high overhead, she saw the Amelia go past. She went on waving and calling until it was out of sight, and then sank down and hid her face in her folded arms. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I decided I could abandon my post for a short time and summon the others to the saloon. No one was hungry, but it is necessary to keep up one's strength when strenuous endeavour may lie ahead. You mean a fight? Cyrus asked. I sure would like one, but has anybody figured out what we're actually going to do if, when, we catch up with them? Run them aground. Selim said. It had taken a direct order from me to remove him from his engines. He allowed me to take his pulse and feel his brow for signs of fever, but refused to let me do more. And, indeed, there was not much more I could do. Black smears of oil stained his clothes, from his turban to the hem of his galabia. But so far as I could tell, he was holding up well. Dowd scooped up a portion of chicken and vegetables with a bit of folded bread and popped the whole thing neatly into his mouth. He nodded in agreement. Let's see where we stand, Sethos said. He had finished eating. Now he had reached for the map Nasir had pushed aside when he served us. The Isis was seen at Toh yesterday afternoon. Rais Hassan swears she didn't pass Kina today. If we take his word, and I gather you're all inclined to do so, there are only two possibilities. She has changed her name and her appearance, or she is lying low somewhere between here and Toh. Why? The question came from Ramses, who was standing at the window, looking out, his hands clasped behind him. He swung round. Why should they delay? What are they after? Would they have collected all of us, one by one, if father hadn't spoiled their plans? Or did he? God damn it, we're sitting here studying maps and timetables, and Cyrus is the only one who's asked a sensible question. Supposing we do catch her up, then what? Fired a cannon across her bows? That would be entertaining, if we had a cannon. Board her with cutlasses between our teeth? He broke off, breathing hard. I went to him and slipped my arm through his. That has always struck me as an impractical procedure, I said. One would have to have extremely hard teeth and strong jaw muscles, and even then an involuntary movement might easily result in the loss of teeth and jaw. For a moment, I feared my attempt at a little joke had been misplaced. His black eyes blazed with anger. I said, I too am very worried. The hard lines round his mouth softened. He bowed his head. I'm sorry, Mother. It's selfish of me to be glad that Father is with her, but I am also glad of it, I said. It was partly true. I don't know what it was that made Emerson realise Nefret might be in trouble— but it is just like him to go rushing to the rescue all by himself. One good thing has come of his impetuosity. The villains know we will be hot on their trail. Whether it was their original intention or not, they will not. They will keep them as hostages. Walter coughed. I've been thinking, he said. Yes, Walter. I gave him an encouraging smile. He was so anxious to be of use, poor man but he had only succeeded in getting in everyone's way. Selim had politely but firmly rejected his further assistance after he burnt his arm on the heated metal of the engine, and his attempt to use the sounding stick had almost got us run on to an invisible sandbar. "'I'm not good for much else, you see,' Walter explained, matter-of-factly. He adjusted his eyeglasses. "'We've been operating on the assumption that revenge is the motive for this.' "'What other motive could there be?' I asked. "'The Isis is an expensive operation,' Walter said. "'And revenge loses its force after so many years. "'They are after something more rewarding. "'What else could it be but the princess's treasure? "'And if that is the case,' he went on, "'raising his voice a trifle to be heard over Cyrus's oaths, "'it alters our entire strategy. 
let us say that Monsieur Lacour finishes loading the artifacts today. If he is in sufficient haste, he will try to get a few miles downstream before nightfall. I think the Isis, under a new name, will intercept the steamer tonight, under cover of darkness. Suppose Lacour doesn't leave until tomorrow morning, David asked. Then they will strike tomorrow night. The point is, Walter raised an admonitory forefinger, that they don't know his schedule either. They will have to lie in wait for the steamer and follow it until it stops for the night, whichever night that may be. We must turn back. We may not be able to identify the Isis in her new guise, but we can't miss the government steamer. And if I am right, the Tahibia will be nearby. What if you're wrong? I asked, half convinced but reluctant to abandon the pursuit. We would never catch them up if they've gone on ahead. I think he's right, Sethos said. He gave Walter an approving nod. It is definitely a streak of larceny in the family. I'm ashamed I didn't think of it myself. I vote for heading back up river. No, Ramsay said. He went back to the window. I looked at David. He'd seen it too, the increase of tension to such a point that Ramsay's was beyond reason. The idea of retracing our route was unbearable. David took him by the shoulders and spun him round. Ramsay's eyes were dead black, without a spark of awareness. He swung at David. David dodged the blow and struck back, hard enough to set Ramsay's back on his heels. It takes a blunt instrument to stop him when he's in this frame of mind, David explained coolly. Ramsay's eyes came back into focus. He rubbed his cheek and blinked at David. Did you have to do that? My friend, you have been half out of your mind for hours. Stop and think. Father's theory provides the first rational motive we've found. Everything fits, don't you see? Even blowing up the railway station, an armed assault on the steamer will be attributed to terrorists. We have to gamble, but this is our best hope. If we start back straight away... We can reach Kina before dark. Ramses nodded. All right. I'll tell Rice, Hassan, Walter said happily, and trotted off. All right, Ramses repeated. My heart ached for him. What about a nice whiskey and soda? I suggested. If you would like one, mother. I was afraid I would have to administer another therapeutic smack on the face. However, Ramses is a true son of his father, and me. He passed his hand over his mouth, gave himself a little shake, and managed to smile. Everyone joined us except Selim, who could not be extracted from his engines. Rais Hassan got us turned round in a series of manoeuvres that inspired several breathtaking close calls and a lot of bad language from the persons thus inconvenienced. The white sail of a falaka passed so close it filled the entire window aperture. But finally we were headed south again. It was late in the afternoon and the sun was setting when Bertie came into the saloon to report that someone was hailing us. Looks like a local fishing boat. Probably hoped to sell us something, Cyrus grumbled. We'd better see what they want, I said. They may have news. We followed Bertie onto the deck. The sun was low in the west. A flotilla of small boats raced toward us, their white sails flapping like the wings of a flock of birds. The occupants were all shouting at once. It was impossible to make out words. Good heavens, I said. It is a miniature armada. Every boat in that small village, by the looks of it. Tell Selim to stop the engines. They must have news for us. In my understandable agitation, I caught the arm of Ramses, who stood next to me. He shook me off with absent-minded force and raised both hands to shield his eyes against the glare of the sunset. Then his rigid body sagged forward across the rail, and his breath came out in a long, shuddering sigh. My vision is not the equal of his, but I believe I was the next to see her, standing in the nearest boat, supported by one of the men. The coronet of golden hair was unmistakable, but so unbelievable and so welcome was the sight, I refused to credit the evidence of my own eyes until the little boat came alongside and the grinning crewman lifted her up into Ramsay's outstretched arms. It's a miracle, Walter said reverently. He removed his eyeglasses and wiped them on his shirt tail. 
miracle be damned, said my other brother-in-law. Nefret, I am unspeakably relieved to see you, but give them a minute, I said. Ramsay's arms held her close, and his face was hidden against her hair. Nefret raised her head and turned in the circle of his arm. She held out her hands to me. He is alive, mother. I spoke with him early this morning. I didn't want to leave him, but he... You did the right thing, my dear, I said. The situation was still grave, but I felt as if an enormous weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Now come and rest and eat something. I'm not hungry, Lefret said. They fed me and washed my clothes and dried them. They... David had been talking with the boatmen. They were so pleased with themselves. They were reluctant to go, but after we had showered them with praise and thanks and all the money we had in our pockets, they tore themselves away. Ahead, the lights of Kina shone through the gathering dusk. It took a little while for us to get under way, since every man on the Amelia had to see Nefret and touch her before they could believe she was safely back. Nasir burst into tears and flung himself at her feet. The sight of Selim, oily, weary and smiling, brought a cry of protest from his physician, but he would not let her examine him. "'Tell us,' he said, "'everything.' After Nasir had been restored, he stumbled round, lighting the lamps, and the rest of us crowded round Nefret, who was seated on the divan, with Ramsay's arm round her. "'I'm not ashamed to admit that the whisky flowed freely.' Nefret shook her head when Cyrus offered her a glass. "'My stomach is still a little queasy, and you know how the stuff affects me. "'I'll tell you everything in due time, but you must hear this first. "'They are planning to take the princess's treasure.' The announcement fell a little flat. "'Curse it,' Nefret said. "'You knew? How? I didn't find out until last night.' "'Walter figured it out,' said Zethos. "'Do you know when they plan to strike, and how?' "'No. Damnation. If Lacour has already left Luxor, they could seize the steamer tonight.' "'I've been thinking,' Walter said. "'This time his announcement got more attention.' "'Yes,' Sethos said respectfully. Certain of my initial assumptions may have been an error, Walter explained in his precise schoolmaster's voice. One takes it for granted that dastardly deeds are done under cover of darkness, but they cannot travel at night, can they? Surely they would want to get under way as soon as they are in possession of the treasure. It would take them a while to unload the cargo, Cyrus said, stroking his goatee. No, no, Walter said excitedly. Why should they do that? It would, as you say, take a great deal of time, and the Dahabia is certain to be seen. However, she changes her appearance. Every craft on the river would be on the lookout for her. The government steamer, on the other hand. Of course, I breathed. They will board the steamer, massacre the crew, sink the Isis. Oh, my, what will they do to poor Monsieur Lacour? No one seemed especially concerned about poor Monsieur Lacour. Sethos shook his head. I've been out of the business too long. Lost my touch. It's a pity Walter is an honest man. What a partner he would make. Walter beamed. You think I'm right, then? I know you're right. Sethos slammed his fist into his palm. That is exactly how I would have planned it. Supposing I were cold-blooded enough to murder a dozen innocent men... We've got until morning, then. Someone must go ashore at Kina and try to find out whether Lacour has left Luxor. And if so, when? I'll go, Ramsay said. It was the first time he'd spoken since he took his wife into his arms, and his face was still alight with joy and disbelief. We must hear Nefret's story first, I said, with a fond smile at the pair. She may have seen or heard something that will affect our plans. Start at the beginning, my dear, if you will be so good, and don't leave anything out. It was, to say the least, an absorbing tale. The faces of the listeners reflected their feelings, surprise, indignation, admiration. But no one interrupted until she described the transformation of Mrs. Fitzroyce. Good gad, I cried in chagrin. I never suspected her. No wonder she avoided me. Sethos said grimly. I knew the... I knew her well. That explains Martinelli. 
They were bitter enemies. That isn't good news. She was one of Bertha's most ruthless assistants. Justin is equally ruthless, Lefret said. He, she, isn't quite normal. She went on to describe her last conversation with Emerson and his insistence that she leave him. I would never have made it if he hadn't been there, she said simply. It was impossible not to live up to his faith in my abilities and my nerve, but I did come close to breaking down when I saw the Amelia pass by earlier today. It must have been horrible, I said sympathetically. Where were you? On one of the islands in midstream. I was trying to swim to shore when I was struck by a floating log. I managed to hang on to it until it came aground, but my shoulder was hit. Ramses took his arm away. Why didn't you tell me when I grabbed hold of you? Did I hurt you? She touched his cheek. I didn't even feel it. I never dared hope I would see you so soon, even after I finally managed to attract the attention of a fisherman from the village. Once I had identified myself, they couldn't do enough for me. Late in the afternoon they got word that the Amelia was heading back this way, and the whole village piled into their boats. They were so anxious to be the first to give you the news. Now tell me what happened after I left the clinic. Is everyone... are they... Oh, my dear, I said. I ought to have reassured you immediately. The children are safe. They are all safe, and the house is well guarded. So, said Daoud, who had been listening with interest, but with increasing signs of impatience... Now we must think how to rescue the father of curses. Chapter 14 After Ramses had gone ashore, accompanied by Rais Hassan, I persuaded Nefret to rest for a while. She declared she was too keyed up to sleep, but as soon as her head touched the pillow, her weary eyes closed. I stood looking down at her, watching the lines of pain and worry, smoothed by the benevolent hand of Hypnos, and thanking heaven for her preservation. She had made light of her own suffering and struggle, but I knew what she must have gone through. I dared not think of what Emerson was still enduring. The rest of us sat talking in low voices, so as not to awaken her. Dowd had, with the acumen that sometimes marked him, hit the nail square on the head. We might be able to find the Isis before she waylaid the steamer, but while Emerson was a prisoner, we were powerless to prevent an attack. "'I'd give up the whole golden treasure rather than see him come to harm,' Cyrus declared. "'That is very noble of you, Cyrus, considering that the treasure isn't yours to dispose of,' I retorted, and immediately repented my rudeness when I saw his hurt expression. "'Forgive me, Cyrus. I did not express myself well. What I meant to say was that Monsieur Lacour may not share your sentiments.' "'That's okay, Amelia. I understand.' We cannot allow them to take the steamer, I went on, and we cannot attack the Isis openly until Emerson has been freed. Attack? Bertie echoed. What with? A few rifles? When they're probably armed to the teeth? I don't like the odds, Mrs. Amelia. Cyrus is right. Let them take the confounded treasure. They won't get away with it. We'll track them down. It isn't the treasure I'm thinking of, but the lives of the men on the steamer. Bertie's brow furrowed. Oh, Lord! They wouldn't really kill all those people, would they? I am convinced of it. I remember Matilda well. She was a worthy disciple of her mistress. In my opinion, the young woman is even more dangerous. She has exhibited evidence of severe mental disturbance. Then there's my dear little daughter, said Sethos. He reached for a cigarette. His hand was steady. 
What a pretty trio they make. An uncomfortable silence followed. Cyrus looked away, and Bertie bit his lip. I had observed his increasing interest in Mariam. It is painful for a young fellow to think that a young lady's interest in him may have an ulterior motive. In fact, I considered the girl less culpable than the others, but to say so would not have comforted her father. Guilty she unquestionably was, and what we were to do with her if we succeeded in capturing her, I could not imagine. And at that moment, she was the least of my concerns. We will have to get on board the Isis, I said, unseen and undetected. That is right, said Daoud, nodding approvingly. The others reserved their commendations. What a good plan, said Sethos. How do you propose we go about it? I have a few ideas. Ramses did not return until close to midnight. He had had to wait at the telegraph office for replies to his urgent telegrams. He did not explain how he had persuaded the clerk to remain on duty past his usual hour, and I did not ask. Lacour was still in Luxor, but he had finished loading the treasure and was expected to depart in the morning. That was not all he and Rais Hassan had accomplished. Ramses had had a few ideas of his own. Runners, donkey riders to be more precise, had been dispatched south from Kina and northward from Luxor. Scouts would be in position by morning, and the same signal system would be used. Any private dahabia would be reported. You seem to have thought of everything, Sethos said grudgingly, except how we can get to Emerson without being seen. The Amelia is somewhat conspicuous. My warning shake of the head stopped Ramses on the verge of a hot retort. He swallowed and looked at Nefret. She had awoken instantly when he entered and was curled up on the divan, watching him as he paced to and fro. I have thought of that too, sir. We're taking a small boat in tow. She's a miserable-looking craft, so the crew of the Isis won't be surprised when we appear with our sail trailing. While the rest of you entertain the observers by screaming poignant appeals for rescue, which you are not likely to get, I'll swim to the Isis. And I with you, said Sethos. How far can you swim under water? Ramses inquired gently. Far enough. No, I, said Ramses in the same quiet voice, am running this show. Anyone who won't accept that can damn well stay here. The boat will hold four. It will be the job of the others to distract the crew while David and I get to the Dehabiya. After that, well, it'll depend on what transpires, and that is likely to be unpleasant. Naturally, they all wanted to go. Dowd rumbled, hopefully. Ramses smiled and shook his head. Impossible to disguise you, Dowd, or you, Cyrus. Selim isn't fit enough. The rest of us will wear the usual rags. Myself, David, Bertie, and you, Sethos if you promise to follow my orders. I sat very quietly in the corner, my hands folded in my lap. Ramsay said, without looking in my direction, No, mother, not a chance. Did you hear what I said? Certainly, my dear. I had every word. There she is, riding at anchor near the West Bank. Ramses raised one arm and gave the signal to Rais Hassan. The sun was still low over the eastern cliffs, and the lovely flush of sunrise hadn't completely faded. We were south of Kina, approaching the stretch where, according to Rais Hassan's deductions, the Isis was most likely to be lurking. There were only a few villages in that area, and traffic on the river was minimal. "'Has she seen us?' I asked. "'I don't think so. Thank God for Rais Hassan,' he added." as the Amelia came to a grinding halt and began to reverse. He could make the Amelia jump through hoops. Time to go. Our anchor went over the side, and the small boat was drawn up. It was a pitiful craft, the sails patched on patches, and we were an equally hapless-looking crew. Ramses and David wore a minimum of clothing in preparation for swimming. The rest of us were attired in ragged galabias. When I appeared on deck in my hastily assembled disguise, Ramses was rude enough to shout at me. Naturally, I forgave him, since I knew he was under something of a strain. Don't talk to her as if she were a woman, Ramses, Nefret said. She is a woman. She is my mother. I won't let her... 
I raised my voice just a trifle. You said back in Luxor that you would not return without Nefret. I will not go back without your father. You can't stop her, Nefret said. She stroked his bare arm as one gentles a restive stallion. You haven't the right. You're on her side, Ramses groaned. Of course. If it were you, I'd be in that boat myself. A compromise, I said helpfully. I won't take my parasol. On Ramsay's countenance, amusement struggled with anxiety and anger, and I knew I had won. All right, mother, but please, not the eye patch. It helps to hide my face, I explained. I neglected to bring a beard. The others had wisely refrained from joining in the discussion. Cyrus gave me a hearty embrace and helped me into the boat. We'll be waiting for your signal, he said. Good luck. David cast off and raised the sail. Sethos caught hold of me and pulled me down on the seat beside him. You're an infernal nuisance, Amelia. Do you know that? I believe I can be of some use, I replied modestly. I was the recipient of an extremely ambiguous glance from my son, who was at the tiller. Get out the oars, he said. The prevailing wind swelled the sail, but the current was strong. With Bertie and Sethos rowing, we made good progress, and finally Ramsay said, They've seen us. David, start playing wounded duck, but get well upstream of her before you drop the sail. Bertie, if anyone makes a hostile move or points a rifle at you, make sure you shoot first. We had two rifles wrapped in oiled cloth and extra ammunition. We would have had three if anyone had listened to me, but Ramsay's would not let me have one. Now he went on, Mother, for God's sake, stop staring. You don't make a very convincing male Egyptian, even with an eye patch. I raised one arm so that my full sleeve covered my face. But I peered out from over it. We flapped on past, close enough to see the faces of the crewmen who had gathered to jeer at our erratic progress. Several of them were armed, among them Dr. Hatab, who appeared to be in charge. I ducked my head and heard him call, obviously in answer to a question. It is only a fishing boat, madame, about to capsize, if I am any judge. Then we were past. Here we go, Ramsay said, and fell overboard with a startled cry and an impressive splash. The boat rocked, the sail collapsed, and David slid into the water. The rest of us were making as much noise as possible. Sethos cupped his hands round his mouth. Throw us a rope, he shrieked. Help, we will all drown, for the mercy of God. There was no mercy on those hard faces. Laughing, one of them pointed at a pair of arms and a distorted face that rose above the water between us and the Dahabiya. The arms waved pathetically and disappeared. Bertie was paddling wildly in circles. The audience found this even more amusing. They began offering advice, all of it rude, some of it quite vulgar. My arms over my head, I swayed and whimpered. My breath came hard and my heart was pounding. Sethos's cries cut off abruptly. Peering round the hem of my sleeve, I saw two other people at the rail. Justin was wearing male clothing, but everything else about her, the way she stood, the gesture with which she pushed back her windblown curls, was so obviously female that I wondered how I could have been deluded. She had her arm round Mariam, who gripped the rail with both hands and stared fixedly at us. Justin's pretty face wore a frown. "'Bring them on board or sink them!' she called, in idiomatic and accented Arabic. The accent was that of a Kyrene. One of the men raised a rifle. Clearly he found the second alternative more interesting. Mariam whispered something to her sister. After a moment, Justin nodded. I suppose you're right. Gunfire might attract attention. She went on in Arabic. Do not fire. Throw them a rope. Bertie caught it on the second try. The men on the Dahabiya made no effort to help. One of them had fastened the other end of the rope to the rail, leaving it to us to pull ourselves in, if we could. Now what? Bertie whispered. Won't she recognize you? "'Me and the lady with the eye patch," said my brother-in-law, in an equally subdued voice. "'Pull us in. When we are within ten feet, 
grab the rifle and start shooting. Bertie's lips tightened. It went against the grain for him to fire first, but he knew there really was no sensible alternative. We had to disable as many of them as we could before we boarded. At least the lad wouldn't have it on his conscience that he had fired at a woman. Justin and Mariam had left the deck. Squatting in the bottom of the boat, Sethos unwrapped the rifles. I reached for the little pistol I had concealed under my rags. The next ten minutes would tell the tale. Victory or defeat. Life or death. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses came up on the far side of the Dahabia and hung on, gasping for breath. He looked wildly around for David and could have shouted with relief when David's head popped up a few feet away. He reached out a hand and pulled his wheezing friend to his side. David had lost his turban. His black head, sleek as a seal's, streamed water. Ramses removed his own dripping turban and pushed his hair back from his face. There was no need for discussion. They had it worked out beforehand, trying to cover all possible contingencies. Ramses gripped the rail and pulled himself up till he could see the deck. There were three windows on this side, all open or ajar. None was the window to his father's cell. According to the plan of fretted drawn, it was on the opposite side of the Dahabia. The deck was deserted. The show had drawn the crewmen to the other side. He could hear their yells and the agitated shrieks of his cohorts. Then he heard a voice he recognised, issuing orders that made him hurl himself up and over the rail. David was close behind him, fighting the instinct that demanded he go to his mother's help. Whatever the odds, he climbed in the nearest window. They hadn't started shooting. It was small comfort, but he had to stick to the plan. Their best and only hope was to take a hostage of their own. The cabin was a woman's. Various female garments were scattered about, and the hat his mother had given Mariam hung on a hook by the door. Without pausing, he went to the door and listened before easing it open. Then he heard the sound he'd been dreading, that of rapid rifle fire and abandoned caution, bolting straight down the corridor toward the saloon, with David close on his heels. They were there, all three of them, the old woman, Justin, and Mariam. And the doctor. Ramses left him to David, heard a grunt and a thump, and caught Justin by the throat. Order them to stop firing, he panted. Mariam, tell them I'll kill her if they don't surrender. Without a word or a look, Mariam darted out. After a moment, the firing stopped. Ramses loosened his hold, feeling like a brute. She stood quiet in his grasp. Her throat was soft and slender, and her blue eyes were reproachful. You wouldn't hurt me, would you? Your pretty little Hathor. You've lost, Ramses said. It's over. She laughed at him, showing even white teeth. David was standing by the old woman, who hadn't moved from her chair. She looked contemptuously at the knife David held to her throat. Put that away, boy. Neither of you would harm a woman. And we hold the ace in this little game. If you want the professor back in one piece, you will surrender to us. Once we have what we are after, we will set you ashore unharmed. You're lying, Ramsay said. Give me the keys to his room. They're in the drawer there. He started toward the bureau, and Justin laughed again. They won't do you any good. The professor's not alone, you see. "'Francois is with him, and if anyone opens that door without giving the agreed-upon signal, "'he will cut your father's throat. "'He can't defend himself,' she added brightly, "'because he is chained hand and foot.' "'Ramses couldn't think. "'The sounds on deck had subsided, but Mariam hadn't come back, "'and his mother might be torn in two by conflicting filial concerns. "'He was about to tell David to go out and see what had happened,' when the curtains at the window were pushed aside, and his mother poked her head in. She had lost her turban, her hair was straggling round her shoulders, and there was blood on her face. But the eye patch was still firmly in place. "'Ah, there you are,' she said, brandishing her pistol. "'I presume everything is under control?' "'Well, no, not exactly,' Ramses said, struggling for breath. 
Mother, are you... Sethos and Bertie? Both wounded, but not seriously. They have subdued the crew. His mother climbed nimbly through the window. This isn't my blood, she added. My dear boy, you're as white as a sheet. You weren't worried about me, were you? Worried about you? He ran out of breath again. Thank God, David exclaimed. But the professor is... The pound of feet along the passageway stopped him. Emerson burst through the door. I heard gunfire. Where, damnation, Peabody, I knew it was you. Why are you wearing that idiotic eye patch? She dropped the pistol, and Ramses, dizzy with relief, was treated to the spectacle of his eminent parents, both of whom resembled survivors of a small war, rushing into each other's arms. Their incoherent remarks were, he realised, completely in character. How dare you do this to me, Peabody? Ramses, why did you... Never mind. You couldn't have stopped her. My darling Peabody, are you injured? Interspersed were her own comments. Another shirt? Oh, my dearest Emerson, what have they done to you? And what has happened to Francois? Ramses asked. They told us you were shut in with him. Well, I had to kill the bastard, didn't I? Emerson detached himself from his wife's embrace and ran a bloodshot eye over the room. Unconquerably Emerson, he gave the old woman a stiff bow. Good morning, um, Matilda. The old woman sat with a face like death. So, you have won the last battle. Have we won, Ramses? Emerson inquired. Yes, sir, I believe so, Ramses said. But how? You were chained and locked in, weaponless. I didn't need a weapon for a piece of scum like that, his father said magnificently. I did have one, though, and she had freed me early this morning. When they put Francois in with me, I had to... She? Who? Little Mariam, of course. I told you the child was. But where is she? She was following me. And where, said his wife, is Justin? She had taken advantage of their distraction to slip away. And so had Khatab. They found Mariam lying in the corridor. She had been struck unconscious. It wasn't hard to guess by whom. But she was beginning to come round. And when Emerson lifted her, she caught hold of him and tried to speak. Quick, you must go. She has lit the fuse. Thus ends this excerpt. From Manuscript H. Matilda jumped up and ran for the door. She was quite agile for an elderly person. The prospect of imminent death, I have observed, lends wings to the feet. Ramses was quicker. He took her by the shoulders and shook her, none too gently. Where's she gone? She tried to twist away from him. It's in her room. She loves dynamite. You can waste time trying to break the door down if you like, but let me go. God knows how much time we have. If she has shortened the fuse. She's right, I cried. This is no time for bravado or chivalry. Hurry. Bertie and Sethos were holding the disgruntled thugs at gunpoint. Several bodies lay sprawled on the deck. Sethos's eyes moved from Emerson to Mariam, but before he could speak, Emerson bellowed, Abandon ship, everyone. She's about to blow. Thugs rained into the river like beetles shaken from a branch. Sethos limped toward us. He had taken a bullet in the leg and a trail of blood spots followed him. The boat, he said. Get the women into it. The little craft was tied to the side. Matilda was the first to reach it. She scrambled into it and started to untie the rope. Hands off, Matilda, or I will shoot you where you sit, Sethos said. She backed off, cursing him. Emerson shoved me in and handed Mariam down to me. Now you, said Emerson, turning to his brother, and Bertie, get in and row like hell. Ramses, David, over the side with you. I will say this for the members of my family, that they know when argument is inexpedient. Everyone moved as quickly as if they had rehearsed the procedure. Bertie was grinning, oblivious of the spreading blood stain on his side. He'd always wanted to take part in one of our little adventures. I sincerely hoped that he would survive this one. 
I pushed Matilda out of my way and sat down, holding Mariam, who appeared to be in a state of shock. Her eyes were blank and unfocused, her body limp. Bertie and Sethos snatched up the oars, and Emerson untied the rope. As we moved away from the doomed vessel, aided by the current, I saw Ramses and David treading water and looking back at Emerson, who was leaning over the rail. "'Who the devil do you think you are, the captain?' I shrieked. "'Get off there this minute!' Emerson climbed up on the rail and dived. The boys converged on him, but he was not in need of their assistance, as his vigorous strokes made evident. Ten feet. Twenty. My eyes were glued on the Isis. She looked so peaceful riding there at anchor, her decks deserted. Thirty feet. Swimming strongly, the men had almost caught us. Bertie held out an oar and was royally cursed by both Sethos and Emerson. "'Keep rowing!' the latter bellowed. Forty feet. "'The Isis blew. "'The roar of the explosion deafened me. "'Bits of wood and rail, metal fittings and miscellaneous debris "'were hurled into the air. "'The boat rocked wildly as the shock waves reached us. "'When they finally subsided, I realised we were still afloat "'and that the Dahabia was ablaze. "'She burned quietly and beautifully.' the bright flames swaying above her like a curtain. We sat transfixed, and, in my case at least, filled with profound and humbling thoughts. I believe I was the only one to have seen, among the floating debris, a mutilated but recognisable shape. If she had meant to escape the boat before the dynamite exploded, she had waited too long. I bowed my head and murmured a little prayer, for our faith offers hope of redemption for even the worst of sinners. I added a brief prayer of thanks for our survival, and then looked up to make sure I hadn't been premature. Yes, they were all there, safe and more or less sound, and beyond them, coming toward us at full speed, was the Amelia. They took us on board, and even Rais Hassan abandoned his post to join in the congratulations and questions. Cyrus clasped his son in an impetuous embrace, to Bertie's great embarrassment. Nefret ran to Ramses, and Selim embraced everyone in turn. I was about to suggest that we defer further celebration until the wounded had been attended to, when I saw something that caused me to call out and point. Bruised and battered, dripping with water and blood, the survivors of that incredible adventure stood gazing in silence, as the government steamer sailed sublimely past on its way to Cairo and safety. Our unexpected and, need I say, welcome arrival in Luxor several hours later evoked considerable excitement. No one had known precisely where we were, and everyone was in a fever of anxiety about us. A triumphal procession gathered as we made our way from the dock to the house, where we underwent another round of embraces. Having allowed Evelyn and Leah and Gargery to vent their emotions, I put an end to the flood of questions. We will tell you all about it at tea time. We are all in need of a bath and change of clothing, and some of us are in need of medical attention. Cyrus, go home and bring Catherine back with you for tea. Dow, take that woman to the storage shed and lock her in, with the necessary comforts, of course. Selim, Bertie, off to the clinic with Nefret. Sethos, too, said Nefret. I want to get that bullet out of him. He hadn't let go his hold on his daughter since Emerson told him that he owed his survival to her, and, in fact, the success of the entire enterprise, since we could not have prevailed while he was in danger. What she had told her father after they went off together for a long private conversation, I did not know, but, of course, I expected to find out in due course. It had been sufficient to bring about the long-delayed and total reconciliation. Now, he said, with almost his old irony, I would rather leave it there. I've been the subject of Nefret's medical attentions before. Naturally, I overruled him. He and Mariam followed Nefret. Her arm supported him, and his was round her shoulders. "'As for you, Emerson,' I began. "'Nefret had cleaned him up as best she could, "'but he was still a horrible sight. 
The only one whose clothing would fit him was Daoud, who had no extra, so he was still attired, more or less, in the garments he had worn when he rushed in pursuit of Nefret. There were bits of bandage all over him, and quite a number of bruises. His breezy dismissal of Francois's attempt to murder him deprecated the magnitude of that struggle against an opponent without scruple or mercy. "'And as for you, Peabody,' said Emerson, folding his arms, "'I've not finished telling you what I think of your reckless, inconsiderate behaviour. "'Come along with me.' "'Yes, my dear,' I said. "'We were, in my opinion, entitled to a celebration. "'Fatima, whose sentiments were usually expressed with food, "'piled the tea-tables high. "'Dawood was there, and Khadija, and even Selim, who had refused to go back to bed. The family, including the Vandergelts, Senia and Gargery, both cats, who were completely indifferent to our misadventures, but who knew Fatima had prepared fish sandwiches, and the dear children, all of them. They were making enough racket to wake the dead, but I felt that they were entitled to be with their parents. The only ones not present were Sethos and Mariam. Some of us had preferred whiskey and soda to tea. Let us drink to another resounding success, I remarked, raising my glass. I'm not sure how many more of these resounding successes we can afford, Peabody, said Emerson, shifting uncomfortably in his chair. I don't mind admitting that I feel a trifle fatigued, and Sethos and Bertie were... Deuced lucky, said Bertie, with a broad smile. The brave lad was so pleased with himself that he had actually ventured to interrupt Emerson. My injury was only a scratch, nothing to speak of, and Nefret said Sethos would be back to normal in a few days. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It did have its moments, didn't it? I said, returning his smile. I've always wanted to hear someone say, She has lit the fuse, or, as the case may be, He has lit the fuse. "'You couldn't resist the eye-patch either, I suppose,' said Emerson, grinning. "'Another of my great ambitions in life is to have boarded a pirate vessel,' I confessed. "'Too bad about the cutlass in your teeth, mother,' said my son. "'Ah, well, one can't have everything. "'Davy, have you quite finished kissing everyone's wounds? "'Thank you, dear boy. Now go and draw pictures with Evie and Charla. "'They're about to have words over that purple crayon, I believe.' "'Now, for pity's sake, Amelia, tell us,' Catherine begged. "'Cyrus and Bertie refused to talk about it. "'They said they would leave it to you. "'We are only waiting for Sethos and Mariam,' I said. "'When Sethos joined us, he was alone. "'I persuaded her to rest,' he said. "'He looked us over and smiled slightly. "'She hasn't yet acquired the family resilience. "'Perhaps that's just as well,' I said. "'Sit down and put that leg up, Emerson, will you?' "'Oh, thank you, Walter.' "'He had already pressed a glass into his half-brother's hand. "'We're waiting, Amelia,' Evelyn said. "'Where to begin?' I took another sip. "'It is a complicated story.' "'Like most of them,' Cyrus said. "'I suppose that's true. "'Perhaps I should begin by going over my list of extraordinary incidents, "'which I happen to have with me.' and explain how each event fits inexorably into the pattern our adversaries attempted to establish in order to deceive us as to their true motive. I think we've all worked that out, Mother, Nefret said. Confirmation came in the form of nods from the others. Oh, I said, including Justin's masquerade as Hathor? The second incident was designed to clear Mariam of suspicion, and it was rather cleverly arranged. Justin was wearing her boy's clothing under that clumsy robe. All she had to do was slip out of it while Mariam and the others distracted you four. The scrap of fabric Emerson found was planted, Ramses interrupted. Excuse me, mother, but we've worked that out too. Oh. Hmm. The plot began to take shape when Matilda learned of the princess's treasure. She was, at that time, running a house of, uh, in Cairo, and engaging in various other illicit activities. 
It was Matilda who had, several years earlier, told Mariam a pack of lies about her mother and induced her to run away. Mariam was young and rebellious. The two are practically synonymous. And she was thrilled to discover that she had a sister and a motherly protector. Matilda arranged Mariam's marriage to a wealthy man and, I suspect, disposed of poor Mr. Throgmorton once he had made a will leaving everything to Mariam. I am sure Mariam had no hand in his demise. He was good to her, Sethos said. She was fond of him. Not until some time after his death, when she had returned to Matilda, did she begin to suspect foul play. What I don't understand, Cyrus said, is how they intended to get the artifacts unloaded. They couldn't have gone on to Cairo with them. All eyes, even those of Emerson, turned to none other than Walter. A modest but pleased smile illumined his scholarly countenance. I have been thinking about that, Cyrus, he said. I believe, and this can easily be confirmed, that they planned to tie up somewhere between Kina and Hamadi. They might have had to wait at Hamadi for the bridge to be raised, which would have placed them under close scrutiny and unload under cover of darkness. The heavier objects could be temporarily concealed in an empty tomb or cave to be retrieved later when the... Uh, I believe the expression is... Uh, when the heat was off. A few of them would have taken the steamer on downstream next day and abandoned or destroyed her. I am sure you have the right of it, Walter, I said. But if you will forgive me, we are getting off the track here. My fault, said Cyrus, grinning. Sorry, Amelia. Go on. The story of our visit to El Garbi was new to some of them, and if I may say so, I told it well. I saw Daoud, lips moving and eyes abstracted, and knew he was memorizing everything I said, to be repeated with embellishments. It came as a complete shock to me, I admitted handsomely, I went to El Garbi because I had deduced that Mariam's misadventures were, so to speak, the pieces that did not fit into the puzzle. But all I expected to learn was more about her past history. She overheard me talking to Ramses. She had got in the habit of walking in the garden at night. Her reasons do not concern us, I added, with a little cough. Nefret glanced at Ramses, who was studiously not looking at anyone, and moved closer to him. She looked weary but very beautiful, her face shining with a new contentment. She had learned one important lesson, that the marriage of true hearts does not alter when it alteration finds, and that love is not time's fool, as Shakespeare so nicely puts it. I nodded affectionately at her and went on. Mariam realized when she heard me mention El Garbi's village that he would tell me about Justin and that that information would put the entire party on the Dahabia under suspicion. I believe I may confidently assert that my explanation of the true facts surrounding her mother's death, as well as the kindly reception she received, had altered her feelings for us. At first light, she went to Luxor and attempted to dissuade Justin and Matilda from carrying out their plans, at least the part of those plans that depended on the abduction of Nefret. She swore she would not betray them, but apparently her agitation was so great that they decided they could not trust her. So they locked her in her room and sent Khatab to the railway station to see whether Ramses and I actually took the train. Exposure was imminent. However, they knew we could not return before evening, so they had only to move up the time of their departure by a few hours, when Mariam was forced to attend that incredible dinner party at which Nefret was also an unwilling guest. She put on a show of submission and acquiescence. She certainly deceived me, Nefret admitted. It was necessary that she deceive them so that she might remain at liberty. Upon hearing of Emerson's capture and Matilda's vindictive intentions, she realized that she was the only one who could save him. With great courage and at considerable risk to herself, she stole the keys last night, crept into his room, and freed him from his shackles. She tried to persuade him to escape that same night, but he refused. Like the confounded fool he is, I added. 
I had some hope of preventing the attack on the steamer, said Emerson, smoking placidly. Single-handedly, I inquired with raised brows. I rather expected Matilda to pay me another call, Emerson explained. She so enjoyed the first. Then, you see, I would have taken her hostage and forced the others to surrender to me. An excellent plan, said Sethos, with excessive politeness. Well, curse it. I didn't expect them to shove Francois in with me. When I heard them at the door, I rearranged my shackles so that I appeared to be still confined and put on a show of weakness. I hoped to get more specific information from him about the timing and method, but all the bast the fellow did was sit glowering at me and fingering his knife. I had about decided there was no point in waiting any longer when I heard gunfire. I had just finished dealing with Francois when Mariam came back to let me out. She is a brave little girl and risked a great deal for us. More than you know, Sethos said. He rose stiffly to his feet. Look after her, will you, Amelia? I must catch the night train to Cairo. Out of the question, I exclaimed. You should not be using that leg... And anyhow, your first duty is to your daughter. Tell Mr. Smith to go to Blazes. I am perfectly fit, said Sethos, sounding alarmingly like Emerson. And this duty takes precedence over all others. You are on the wrong track, Amelia. Evelyn had the right idea after all. She was under duress, Evelyn exclaimed. I knew it. What hold did they have over her? The most powerful hold you can possibly imagine. He smiled at me with something of his old mockery, but there was a light in his eyes. Some might declare there are enough small children in this adventure already. Could never have enough of them, declared Emerson sentimentally. Then his jaw dropped. What do you mean? Oh, good gad! Do you mean? I have just been informed that I am a grandfather, said Sethos. The child is a boy. He is a year old, and Matilda has had him in her hands since shortly after he was born. Good heavens, I cried, leaping to my feet. In the hands of that vicious, unprincipled, we must go at once. Uh, where? I know where, Sethos said. I had a little chat with Matilda just now. Sit down, Amelia, and have another whiskey. You won't be needed. I must catch that train, though. I promised I would bring him back to her as soon as is humanly possible. Of course, I murmured. How she must have suffered. Emerson knocked out his pipe. I'm going with you. You aren't fit to travel. Neither was he. Ramses looked from him to Nefret, whose hand rested in his. No, sir. I'll go. What about me? Bertie asked. You've done enough, I said affectionately. No, ma'am, not really. Uh, the rest of you chaps. His kind brown eyes moved from Ramses to David to Emerson to Walter. The rest of you want to be with your wives. I, I'd like to go, if Sethos will have me. Just to uh, lean on now and then, you know. They had formed a bond, I believe, during those last desperate minutes, when Bertie, firing as coolly and accurately as Sethos, had eliminated four of the armed men who stood at the rail before they realised what was happening. While he and Sethos fought their way onto the deck, I paused only long enough to tie the rope to our little boat before joining them. The struggle did not last long. As I always say, hired thugs are not reliable. Sethos said, Thank you. Which was, for Sethos, a remarkable concession. We saw them off with hearty good wishes and packets of sandwiches forced on them by Fatima. Dusk softened the dying light and the stars shone in the sky over Luxor. That reminds me, I said. It is high time I started my Christmas shopping. What a celebration we will have this year. Hmm, <laughs> said Emerson. It was a soft humph, though, and he offered no further objections. Did you catch the lady? For a moment I thought the childish treble was Evie's. 
but Evie never abused her diphthongs in that fashion. I had only known one other child who did. We turned as one. Peering at us over the barricade of boxes was Charla. I don't want her to come to the window any more, she said. Ramses made a leap for his daughter and snatched her up. What did you say? I don't want the lady with the yellow hair to... You're talking. She's talking, Ramses shouted. I told you she would when she was ready, I said, anticipating with resignation several years of mutilated diphthongs, just like her father. At least her vocabulary appeared to be that of a normal child, unlike her father. Ramses collapsed into a chair and put his arm round his daughter. What did the lady do to frighten you? She whispered things. Charlotte's eyes were round and fearful. Things that happened to bad children. She said I was bad. Once she tried to put a snake in the window, but you came and she ran away. Oh, my God, Ramses whispered, holding her close and bowing his head over hers. You aren't bad, sweetheart. You're good and wonderful and brave. The, the lady is gone. She'll never come back. Shala was pleased, but not entirely convinced. Is she dead? Yes, I said firmly. She is dead. The dead do not come back. It was Justin, wasn't it? Nefret said, her voice unsteady. Another of her little games. To torment a child like that. Your premonitions were correct, you see, I said. She was a threat to them. Nefret ran her hand caressingly over the two curly black heads. Then she sauntered, with seeming casualness, toward the barricade. Davy, she said tentatively. The little boy looked up and showed his four teeth. Nefret held out her arms. Will you come and talk to Mamma? If you don't mind, Mamma, I would prefer to be called by my full name from now on said David John, articulating with hideous precision. What subject would you like to discuss? I sank into the nearest chair. Emerson, I said faintly. Emerson, another whiskey, please. You've been listening to Children of the Storm by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. 